Paradise Lost. John Milton's epic poem, adapted by Adrian Mitchell, in 41 episodes. With Dennis Quilly as the poet, and Ian McDermott as Satan. Episode 1, in which the fallen angel Satan plots with his henchman Beelzebub. But first, the poet states the aim of his poem. Of man's first disobedience, and the fruit of that forbidden tree, whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe, with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Or if Sion Hill delight thee more, and Siloah's brook that flowed fast by the oracle of God, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song, that with no middle flight intends to soar above the Aeonian mount, while it pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. And chiefly thou, O spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me. For thou knowest, thou from the first wast present, and with mighty wings outspread, dove-like satst brooding on the vast abyss, and madest it pregnant. What in me is dark, illumine, what is low, raise and support, that to the height of this great argument I may assert eternal providence, and justify the ways of God to men." Say first, for heaven hides nothing from thy view, nor the deep tract of hell, say first what cause moved our grand parents in that happy state, favoured of heaven so highly, to fall off from their creator, and transgress his will for one restraint, lords of the world besides. Who first seduced them to that foul revolt? The infernal serpent. He it was whose guile, stirred up with envy and revenge, deceived the mother of mankind, what time his pride had cast him out from heaven with all his host of rebel angels, by whose aid, aspiring to set himself in glory above his peers, he trusted to have equaled the Most High if he opposed, and with ambitious aim against the throne and monarchy of God raised impious war in heaven and battle proud with vain attempt. Him the almighty power hurled headlong flaming from the ethereal sky with hideous ruin and combustion down to bottomless perdition, there to dwell in adamantine chains and penal fire who durst defy the omnipotent to arms. Nine times the space that measures day and night to mortal men, he with his horrid crew lay vanquished, rolling in the fiery gulf, confounded though immortal. But his doom reserved him to more wrath, for now the thought both of lost happiness and lasting pain torments him. Round he throws his baleful eyes that witnessed huge affliction and dismay, mixed with obdurate pride and steadfast hate. At once, as far as angels ken, he views the dismal situation, waste and wild. A dungeon horrible on all sides round, as one great furnace flamed. Yet from those flames, no light, but rather darkness visible, served only to discover sights of woe, regions of sorrow, doleful shades, where peace and rest can never dwell. Hope never comes that comes to all, but torture without end still urges, and a fiery deluge fed with ever-burning sulphur unconsumed. Such place eternal justice had prepared for those rebellious. Here their prison ordained in utter darkness, and their portion set as far removed from God and light of heaven as from the centre thrice to the utmost pole. Oh, how unlike the place from whence they fell! There the companions of his fall, o'erwhelmed with floods and whirlwinds of tempestuous fire, he soon discerns, and weltering by his side, one next himself in power and next in crime, long after known in Palestine and named Beelzebub, 
to whom the arch-enemy, and thence in heaven called Satan, with bold words breaking the horrid silence, thus began. If thou beest he, but oh how fallen, how changed from him who in the happy realms of light, clothed with transcendent brightness, didst outshine myriads though bright, if he, who mutual league, united thoughts and counsels, equal hope and hazard in the glorious enterprise, joined with me once. Now misery hath joined in equal ruin. Into what pit thou seest, from what height fallen, so much the stronger proved he with his thunder. Until then, who knew the force of those dire arms? Yet not for those, nor what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict, do I repent or change. Though changed in outward luster, that fixed mind and high disdain from sense of injured merit, that with the mightiest raised me to contend, and to the fierce contention brought along innumerable force of spirits armed, that durst dislike his reign and me preferring, his utmost power with adverse power opposed in dubious battle on the plains of heaven and shook his throne. What though the field be lost, all is not lost. The unconquerable will and study of revenge immortal hate and courage never to submit or yield and what is else not to be overcome that glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me to bow and sue for grace with suppliant knee and deify his power who from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire that were low indeed that were an ignominy and shame beneath this downfall since by fate the strength of gods and this imperial substance cannot fail, since through experience of this great event, in arms not worse, in foresight much advanced, we may with more successful hope resolve to wage by force or guile eternal war, irreconcilable to our grand foe who now triumphs and in the excess of joy, so reigning holds the tyranny of heaven. So spake the apostate angel, though in pain, vaunting aloud, but racked with deep despair. And him thus answered soon Beelzebub. Satan, thou chief of many throned powers, that led the embattled seraphim to war under thy conduct, and in dreadful deeds, fearless, endangered heaven's perpetual king, and put to proof his high supremacy, whether upheld by strength, or chance, or fate. Too well I see and rue the dire event, that with sad overthrow and foul defeat hath lost us heaven, and all this mighty host in horrible destruction laid thus low, as far as gods and heavenly essences can perish. For the mind and spirit remains invincible, and vigor soon returns, though all our glory extinct, and happy state here swallowed up in endless misery. But what if he, our conqueror, whom I now of force believe almighty, since no less than such could have o'erpowered such force as ours, have left us this our spirit and strength entire, strongly to suffer and support our pains, that we may so suffice his vengeful ire, or do him mightier service as his thralls by right of war, whate'er his business be here in the heart of hell to work in fire, or do his errands in the gloomy deep, what can it then avail, though yet we feel strength undiminished, or eternal being, to undergo eternal punishment? Fallen cherub, to be weak is miserable, doing or suffering. But of this be sure, to do aught good never will be our task, but ever to do ill our sole delight, as being the contrary to his high will whom we resist. If then his providence out of our evil seek to bring forth good, our labor must be to pervert that end, and out of good still to find means of evil, which oft times may succeed, so as perhaps shall grieve him, if I fail not, and disturb his inmost counsels from their destined aim. But see, 
The angry victor hath recalled his ministers of vengeance and pursuit back to the gates of heaven. The sulphurous hail shot after us in storm, or blown hath laid the fiery surge that from the precipice of heaven received us falling, and the thunder, winged with red lightning and impetuous rage, perhaps hath spent his shafts, and ceases now to bellow through the vast and boundless deep. Let us not slip the occasion, whether scorn or satiate fury yield it from our foe. Cease thou yon dreary plain, forlorn and wild, the seat of desolation, void of light, save what the glimmering of these livid flames casts pale and dreadful. Thither let us tend, from off the tossing of these fiery waves. There rest, if any rest can harbor there, and, reassembling our afflicted powers, consult how we may henceforth most offend our enemy, our own loss, how repair, how overcome this dire calamity, what reinforcement we may gain from hope, if not, what resolution from despair. Thus Satan, talking to his nearest mate, with head uplift above the wave, and eyes that sparkling blazed. His other parts besides, prone on the flood, extended long and large, lay floating many a rood, in bulk as huge as whom the fables name of monstrous size, the giants that warred on Jove, or that sea-beast Leviathan, which God of all his works created hugest that swim the ocean stream, him, happily slumbering on the Norway foam, the pilot of some small night-founded skiff, deeming some island, oft, as seamen tell, with fixed anchor in his scaly rind, moors by his side under the lee, while night invests the sea and wished morn delays. So, stretched out huge in length, the arch-fiend lay chained on the burning lake, nor ever thence had risen or heaved his head, but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs, that with reiterated crimes he might heap on himself damnation while he sought evil to others, and enraged might see how all his malice served but to bring forth infinite goodness, grace, and mercy shown on man by him seduced, but on himself treble confusion, wrath, and vengeance poured. Forthwith, upright, he rears from off the pool his mighty stature. On each hand, the flames, driven backward, slope their pointing spires, and, rolled in billows, leave in the midst a horrid veil. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 2 In which the fallen angel Satan awakens in hell and summons up his legions. Forthwith upright he rears from off the pool his mighty stature. On each hand the flames driven backward slope their pointing spires and rolled in billows leave in the midst a horrid veil. Then... With expanded wings he steers his flight aloft, incumbent on the dusky air that felt unusual weight, till on dry land he lights, if it were land that ever burned with solid as the lake with liquid fire. Him followed his next mate, Beelzebub, both glorying to have escaped the Stygian flood as gods, and by their own recovered strength, not by the sufferance of supernal power. The lost archangel Satan then thus spake. Is this the region, this the soil, the clime that we must change for heaven, this mournful gloom for that celestial light? Be it so, since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right, farthest from him is best, whom reason hath equaled, force hath made supreme above his equals. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. 
Hail horrors, hail infernal world, and thou profoundest hell, receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. What matter where, if I be still the same, and what I should be, all but less than he whom thunder hath made greater, here at least we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here for his envy, will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure, and in my choice to reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. But wherefore let we then, our faithful friends, the associates and co-partners of our loss, lie thus astonished on the oblivious pool, and call them not to share with us their part in this unhappy mansion, or once more with rallied arms to try what may be yet regained in heaven, or what more lost in hell. O oh, Satan, leader of those armies bright, which but the omnipotent none could have foiled, if once they hear that voice, their liveliest pledge of hope in fears and dangers, heard so oft in worst extremes and on the perilous edge of battle when it raged, in all assaults their surest signal, they will soon resume new courage and revive though now they lie groveling and prostrate on yon lake of fire, as we erewhile, astounded and amazed, no wonder fallen such a pernicious height. He scarce had ceased when the superior fiend was moving toward the shore. His ponderous shield, ethereal temper, massy, large and round, behind him cast. The broad circumference hung on his shoulders like the moon, whose orb through optic glass the Tuscan artist views at evening from the top of Fesole. His spear, to equal which the tallest pine hewn on Norwegian hills to be the mast of some great admiral, were but a wand he walked with, to support uneasy steps over the burning marl, not like those steps on heaven's azure. And the torrid climb smote on him sore besides, vaulted with fire. Nathless he so endured, till on the beach of that inflamed sea he stood and called his legions, angel forms, who lay entranced thick as autumnal leaves that strew the brooks in Vallombrosa, where the Etrurian shades high overarched in bower. So thick bestrown, abject and lost lay these, covering the flood under amazement of their hideous change. He called so loud that all the hollow deep of hell resounded. Princes, potentates, warriors, the flower of heaven once yours, now lost, if such astonishment as this can seize eternal spirits. Or have ye chosen this place after the toil of battle to repose your wearied virtue for the ease you find to slumber here as in the vales of heaven? Or in this abject posture have ye sworn to adore the conqueror who now beholds cherub and seraph rolling in the flood with scattered arms and ensigns till anon his swift pursuers from heaven gates discern the advantage and descending tread us down thus drooping or with linked thunderbolts transfix us to the bottom of this gulf? Awake, arise, or be forever fallen. They heard, and were abashed, and up they sprung upon the wing, as when men wont to watch on duty, sleeping found by whom they dread, rouse and bestir themselves ere well awake. Nor did they not perceive the evil plight in which they were, or the fierce pains not feel. Yet to their general's voice they soon obeyed innumerable. As when the potent rod of Amram's son in Egypt's evil day waved round the coast, up called a pitchy cloud of locusts warping on the eastern wind that o'er the realm of impious Pharaoh hung like night and darkened all the land of Nile. 
So numberless were those bad angels seen, hovering on wing under the cope of hell, twixt upper, nether, and surrounding fires, till, as a signal given, the uplifted spear of their great sultan waving to direct their course, in even balance down they light on the firm brimstone and fill all the plain, a multitude like which the populous north poured never from her frozen loins to pass Rhine or the Danube, when her barbarous sons came like a deluge on the south and spread beneath Gibraltar to the Libyan sands. Forthwith, from every squadron and each band, the heads and leaders thither haste where stood their great commander, godlike shapes and forms excelling human, princely dignities and powers that erst in heaven sat on thrones, though of their names in heavenly records now be no memorial, blotted out and raised by their rebellion from the books of life. Nor had they yet among the sons of Eve got them new names, till wandering o'er the earth through God's high sufferance for the trial of man, by falsities and lies, the greatest part of mankind they corrupted to forsake God their creator and the invisible glory of him that made them to transform oft to the image of a brute adorned with gay religions full of pomp and gold and devils to adore for deities. Then were they known to men by various names and various idols through the heathen world. Say, muse, their names then known, who first, who last, roused from the slumber on that fiery couch at their great emperor's call, as next in worth came singly where he stood on the bare strand, while the promiscuous crowd stood yet aloof? The chief were those who from the pit of hell, roaming to seek their prey on earth, durst fix their seats long after next the seat of God, their altars by his altar, gods adored among the nations round, and durst abide Jehovah thundering out of Sion, throned between the cherubim, yea, often placed within his sanctuary itself their shrines, abominations and with cursed things his holy rites and solemn feasts profaned, and with their darkness durst affront his light. First Moloch, horrid king, besmeared with blood of human sacrifice and parents' tears, though for the noise of drums and timbrels loud their children's cries unheard that passed through fire to his grim idol. Next, Chemos, the obscene dread of Moab's sons, Peor, his other name, when he enticed Israel in Sittim on their march from Nile to do him wanton rites, which cost them woe. Yet thence his lustful orgies he enlarged even to that hill of scandal by the grove of Moloch homicide, lust hard by hate, till good Josiah drove them thence to hell. With these came they who from the bordering flood of old Euphrates to the brook that parts Egypt from Syrian ground had general names of Baalim and Ashtaroth, those male, these feminine. For spirits, when they please, can either sex assume, or both. So soft and uncompounded is their essence pure, not tied or manacled with joint or limb, nor founded on the brittle strength of bones like cumbrous flesh, but in what shape they choose, dilated or condensed, bright or obscure, can execute their airy purposes and works of love or enmity fulfil. For those the race of Israel oft forsook their living strength, and unfrequented left his righteous altar, bowing lowly down to bestial gods, for which their heads as low bowed down in battle, sunk before the spear of despicable foes. With these in troop came Astoreth, whom the Phoenicians called Astarte, queen of heaven, with crescent horns, to whose bright image nightly by the moon Sidonian virgins paid their vows and songs. Thamuz came next behind, whose annual wound in Lebanon allured the Syrian damsels to lament his fate in amorous ditties all a summer's day, while smooth Adonis from his native rock ran purple to the sea, supposed with blood of Thamuz yearly wounded. Next came one who mourned in earnest, 
when the captive Ark maimed his brute image, head and hands lopped off in his own temple on the groundsel edge, where he fell flat and shamed his worshippers. Dagon his name, sea monster, upward man, and downward fish. After these appeared a crew who under names of old renown, Osiris, Isis, Horus, and their train, with monstrous shapes and sorceries, abused fanatic Egypt and her priests to seek their wandering gods disguised in brutish forms rather than human. Belial came last, than whom a spirit more lewd fell not from heaven, or more gross to love vice for itself. To him no temple stood or altar smoked, yet who more oft than he in temples and at altars, when the priest turns atheist, as did Eli's sons, who filled with lust and violence the house of God? In courts and palaces he also reigns, and in luxurious cities, where the noise of riot ascends above their loftiest towers and injury and outrage. And when night darkens the streets, then wander forth the sons of Belial, flown with insolence and wine. Witness the streets of Sodom, and that night in Gibeah, when the hospitable door exposed a matron to prevent worse rape. These were the prime, in order and in might. All these and more came flocking. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 3, in which Satan rallies his forces who build for him the mighty palace of Pandemonium. Satan, the fallen angel, called his troops into one great assembly in the depths, and all of them came flocking, but with looks downcast and damp, yet such wherein appeared obscure some glimpse of joy, to have found their chief not in despair, to have found themselves not lost in loss itself, which on his countenance cast like doubtful hue. But he, his wonted pride soon recollecting, with high words that bore semblance of worth, not substance, gently raised their fainted courage and dispelled their fears. Then straight commands that at the warlike sound of trumpets loud and clarions be upreared his mighty standard. That proud honour claimed Azazel as his right, a cherub tall, who forthwith from the glittering staff unfurled the imperial ensign, which full high advanced shone like a meteor streaming to the wind, with gems and gold and luster rich emblazed, seraphic arms and trophies, all the while sonorous metal blowing martial sounds at which the universal host upsent a shout that tore hell's concave, and beyond frighted the reign of chaos and old night. All in a moment, through the gloom were seen ten thousand banners rise into the air, with orient colours waving. With them rose a forest huge of spears, and thronging helms appeared, and serried shields in thick array of depth immeasurable. And on they move in perfect phalanx to the Dorian mood of flutes and soft recorders, such as raised to height of noblest temper heroes old arming to battle. And instead of rage, deliberate valour breathed, firm and unmoved with dread of death to flight or foul retreat, nor wanting power to mitigate and swage with solemn touches troubled thoughts, and chase anguish and doubt and fear and sorrow and pain from mortal or immortal minds. Thus they, breathing united force with fixed thought, moved on in silence to soft pipes that charmed their painful steps o'er the burnt soil. And now, advanced in view they stand, a horrid front of dreadful length and dazzling arms, in guise of warriors old with ordered spear and shield, awaiting what command their mighty chief had to impose. He, through the armoured files, darts his experienced eye, and soon traverse the whole battalion views their order due, their visages, and stature as of gods. Their number last he sums. 
and now his heart distends with pride, and hardening in his strength, glories, for never since created man met such embodied force. Their dread commander, high above the rest in shape and gesture proudly eminent, stood like a tower. His form had yet not lost all her original brightness, nor appeared less than archangel ruined, and the excess of glory obscured. As when the sun new-risen looks through the horizontal misty air shorn of his beams, or from behind the moon in dim eclipse disastrous, twilight sheds on half the nations, and with fear of change perplexes monarchs. Darkened so, yet shone above them all the archangel, but his face deep scars of thunder had entrenched, and care sat on his faded cheek, but under brows of dauntless courage and deliberate pride waiting revenge. Cruel his eye, but cast signs of remorse and passion to behold the fellows of his crime, the followers rather, far other once beheld in bliss, condemned for ever now to have their lot in pain, millions of spirits for his fault immersed of heaven, and from eternal splendors flung for his revolt. Yet faithful how they stood, their glory withered as when heaven's fire hath scathed the forest oaks or mountain pines, with singed top their stately growth, though bare, stands on the blasted heath. He now prepared to speak, whereat their doubled ranks they bend from wing to wing, and half enclose him round with all his peers. Attention held them mute. Thrice he assayed, and thrice, in spite of scorn, tears such as angels weep burst forth. At last, words interwove with sighs found out their way. O myriads of immortal spirits, O powers matchless but with the Almighty, and that strife was not inglorious, though the event was dire, as this place testifies, and this dire change hateful to utter. But what power of mind, foreseeing or presaging from the depth of knowledge past or present, could have feared how such united force of gods, how such as stood like these, could ever know repulse? For who can yet believe, though after loss, that all these puissant legions whose exile have emptied heaven shall fail to reascend, self-raised, and repossess their native seat? For me be witness, all the host of heaven, if counsels different or danger shunned by me hath lost our hopes. But he who reigns monarch in heaven, till then, as one secure, sat on his throne, upheld by old repute, consent, or custom, and his regal state put forth at full, but still his strength concealed, which tempted our attempt and wrought our fall. Henceforth his might we know, and know our own, so as not either to provoke or dread new war provoked. Our better part remains to work in close design by fraud or guile, what force effected not. That he no less at length from us may find who overcomes by force hath overcome but half his foe. Space may produce new worlds, Whereof so rife there went a fame in heaven that he ere long intended to create, and therein plant a generation whom his choice regard should favor equal to the sons of heaven. Thither, if but to pry, shall be perhaps our first eruption. Thither or elsewhere, for this infernal pit shall never hold celestial spirits in bondage, nor the abyss long under darkness cover. But these thoughts, full counsel must mature. Peace is despaired, for who can think submission? War, then, war open or understood, must be resolved. He spake, 
and to confirm his words, out flew millions of flaming swords drawn from the thighs of mighty cherubim. The sudden blaze far round illumined hell. Highly they raged against the highest, and fierce with grasped arms clashed on their sounding shields the din of war, hurling defiance toward the vault of heaven. There stood a hill not far, whose grisly top belched fire and rolling smoke. The rest entire shone with a glossy scurf, undoubted sign that in his womb was hid metallic ore, the work of sulphur. Thither, winged with speed, a numerous brigade hastened, as when bands of pioneers with spade and pickaxe armed forerun the royal camp to trench a field or cast a rampart. Mammon led them on. Mammon, the least erected spirit that fell from heaven. For even in heaven, his looks and thoughts were always downward bent, admiring more the riches of heaven's pavement, trodden gold, than aught divine or holy else enjoyed in vision beatific. By him first, men also, and by his suggestion taught, ransacked the centre, and with impious hands rifled the bowels of their mother earth for treasures better hid. Soon had his crew opened into the hill a spacious wound, and digged out ribs of gold. Let none admire that riches grow in hell. That soil may best deserve the precious bane. And here let those who boast in mortal things, and wondering tell of Babel and the works of Memphian kings, learn how their greatest monuments of fame and strength and art are easily outdone by spirits reprobate, and in an hour, what in an age they with incessant toil and hands innumerable scarce perform. Nigh on the plain, in many cells prepared, that underneath had veins of liquid fire sluiced from the lake, a second multitude with wondrous art founded the massy ore, severing each kind, and scummed the bullion dross. A third as soon had formed within the ground a various mould, and from the boiling cells by strange conveyance filled each hollow nook, as in an organ from one blast of wind to many a row of pipes the soundboard breathes. Anon out of the earth a fabric huge rose like an exhalation, with the sound of dulcet symphonies and voices sweet, built like a temple where pilasters round were set and doric pillars overlaid with golden architrave nor did there want cornice or frieze with bossy sculptures graven the roof was fretted gold not babylon nor great al cairo such magnificence equalled in all their glories such a work of wealth and luxury the ascending pile stood fixed her stately height and straight the doors opening their brazen folds discover wide within her ample spaces o'er the smooth and level pavement. From the arched roof, pendant by subtle magic, many a row of starry lamps and blazing cressets, fed with naphtha and asphaltus, yielded light as from a sky. The hasty multitude admiring entered, and the work some praise and some the architect, his hand was known in heaven by many a towered structure high, where sceptred angels held their residence, and sat as princes, whom the supreme king exalted to such power, and gave to rule, each in his hierarchy, the orders bright. Nor was his name unheard or unadored in ancient Greece, and in Orsonian land men called him Mulciber, and how he fell from heaven, they fabled, thrown by angry Jove, sheer o'er the crystal battlements. From morn to noon he fell, from noon to dewy eve, a summer's day, and with the setting sun dropped from the zenith like a falling star on Lemnos the Aegean Isle. Thus they relate, erring, for he with this rebellious rout fell long before. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 4, in which Satan asks his lieutenants whether a war on God in heaven should be carried out openly or secretly. 
Satan was not unheard or unadored in ancient Greece, and in Orsonian land men called him Mulciber. And how he fell from heaven, they fabled, thrown by angry Jove sheer o'er the crystal battlements. From morn to noon he fell, from noon to dewy eve, a summer's day, and with the setting sun dropped from the zenith like a falling star on Lemnos, the Aegean isle. Thus they relate. Erring, for he with this rebellious rout fell long before, nor aught availed him now to have built in heaven high towers, nor did he scape by all his engines, but was headlong sent with his industrious crew to build in hell. Meanwhile the winged heralds, by command of sovereign power, with awful ceremony and trumpet sound, throughout the host proclaim a solemn council, forthwith to be held at Pandemonium, the high capital of Satan and his peers. Their summons called from every band and squared regiment, by place or choice, the worthiest. They anon, with hundreds and with thousands trooping came, attended. All access was thronged, the gates and porches wide, but chief the spacious hall thick swarmed, both on the ground and in the air, brushed with the hiss of rustling wings. As bees in springtime, when the sun with Taurus rides, pour forth their populous youth about the hive in clusters, they among fresh dews and flowers fly to and fro, or on the smoothed plank, the suburb of their straw-built citadel, new rubbed with balm, expatiate and confer their state affairs. So thick the airy crowd swarmed and were straightened, till, the signal given, behold a wonder. They but now who seemed in bigness to surpass earth's giant sons, now less than smallest dwarfs, in narrow room throng numberless, like that Pygmean race beyond the Indian mount, but far within, and in their own dimensions like themselves, the great seraphic lords and cherubim, in close recess and secret conclave sat, a thousand demigods on golden seats, frequent and full. After short silence then, and summons read, the great consult began. High on a throne of royal state, which far outshone the wealth of Ormus and of Ind, or where the gorgeous east with richest hand showers on her king's barbaric pearl and gold, Satan exalted sat, by merit raised to that bad eminence, and from despair thus high uplifted beyond hope, aspires beyond thus high, insatiate to pursue vain war with heaven, and by success untaught his proud imaginations thus displayed. Powers and dominions, deities of heaven, for since no deep within her gulf can hold immortal vigor, though oppressed and fallen, I give not heaven for lost. From this descent, celestial virtues rising will appear more glorious and more dread than from no fall, and trust themselves to fear no second fate. Me, though, just right and the fixed laws of heaven did first create your leader. Next, free choice with what besides in counsel or in fight hath been achieved of merit. Yet this loss, thus far at least recovered, hath much more established in a safe unenvied throne, yielded with full consent. Where there is no good for which to strive, no strife can grow up there from faction. For none, sure, will claim in hell precedence, none whose portion is so small of present pain that with ambitious mind will covet more. With this advantage, then, to union and firm faith and firm accord, more than can be in heaven, we now return to claim our just inheritance of old. Surer to prosper than prosperity could have assured us, and by what best way, whether of open war or covered guile, we now debate. Who can advise may speak. He ceased. And next him, Moloch, sceptred king, stood up. 
the strongest and the fiercest spirit that fought in heaven, now fiercer by despair. His trust was with the Eternal to be deemed equal in strength, and rather than be less, cared not to be at all. With that care lost went all his fear. Of God or hell or worse he recked not. And these words thereafter spake. My sentence is for open war. Of wiles more unexpert I boast not. Them let those contrive who need, or when they need, not now. For while they sit contriving, shall the rest, millions that stand in arms and longing, wait the signal to ascend, sit lingering here, heaven's fugitives, and for their dwelling place, accept this dark, opprobrious den of shame, the prison of his tyranny who reigns by our delay. No, let us rather choose, armed with hell flames and fury all at once, or heaven's high towers to force resistless way, turning our torches into horrid arms against the torturer. When to meet the noise of his almighty engine, he shall hear infernal thunder, and for lightning see black fire and horror shot with equal rage among his angels, and his throne itself mixed with Tartarian sulphur and strange fire, his own invented torments. But perhaps the way seems difficult and steep to scale with upright wing against a higher foe. Let such bethink them, if the sleepy drench of that forgetful lake benumb not still, that in our proper motion we ascend up to our native seat. Descent and fall to us is adverse. Who but felt of late, when the fierce foe hung on our broken rear, insulting and pursued us through the deep, with what compulsion and laborious flight we sunk thus low. The ascent is easy then. The event is feared. Should we again provoke our stronger, some worse way his wrath may find to our destruction. If there be in hell fear to be worse destroyed, what can be worse than to dwell here, driven out from bliss, condemned in this abhorred deep to utter woe? What fear we then? What doubt we to incense his utmost ire, which to the height enraged will either quite consume us and reduce to nothing this essential, happier far than miserable to have eternal being, or if our substance be indeed divine and cannot cease to be, we are at worst on this side nothing, and by proof we feel our power sufficient to disturb his heaven and with perpetual inroads to alarm, though inaccessible, his fatal throne, which if not victory, is yet revenge. He ended frowning, and his look denounced desperate revenge and battle dangerous to less than gods. On the other side uprose Belial, in act more graceful and humane, a fairer person lost not heaven, he seemed for dignity composed and high exploit, but all was false and hollow, though his tongue dropped manner and could make the worse appear the better reason to perplex and dash maturest counsels, for his thoughts were low, to vice industrious, but to nobler deeds timorous and slothful. Yet he pleased the ear, and with persuasive accent thus began. I... Should be much for open war, O peers, as not behind in hate. If what was urged, main reason to persuade immediate war, did not dissuade me most, and seem to cast ominous conjecture on the whole success. When he, who most excels in fact of arms, in what he counsels and in what excels mistrustful, grounds his courage on despair, and utter dissolution as the scope of all his aim after some dire revenge. First, what revenge? 
The towers of heaven are filled with armored watch that render all access impregnable. Oh, could we break our way by force and at our heels all hell should rise with blackest insurrection to confound heaven's purest light? Yet our great enemy, all incorruptible, would on his throne sit unpolluted, and the ethereal mold, incapable of stain, would soon expel her mischief and purge off the base of fire victorious. Thus repulsed, our final hope is flat despair. We must exasperate the almighty victor to spend all his rage. And that must end us. That must be our cure to be no more. Sad cure. For who would lose, though full of pain, this intellectual being? Those thoughts that wander through eternity to perish, rather, swallowed up and lost in the wide womb of uncreated night, devoid of sense and motion. And who knows, let this be good, whether our angry foe can give it or will ever. How he can is doubtful. That he never will is sure. Will he, so wise, let loose at once his ire be like through impotence or unaware to give his enemies their wish and end them in his anger? Who his anger saves to punish endless. Paradise Lost by John Milton. Episode 5, in which the fallen angels continue their debate about war against heaven, but the devil Belial advises caution. They say who counsel war. We are decreed, reserved, and destined to eternal woe. Whatever do we? What can we suffer more? What can we suffer worse? Is this then worse? Thus sitting, thus consulting, thus in arms? What when we fled amain, pursued and struck with heaven's afflicting thunder, and besought the deep to shelter us? This hell then seemed a refuge from those wounds. Or when we lay chained on the burning lake, that sure was worse. What if the breath that kindled those grim fires awake should blow them into sevenfold rage and plunge us in the flames? While we, perhaps designing or exhorting glorious war, caught in a fiery tempest, shall be hurled, each on his rock transfixed, the sport and prey of racking whirlwinds. Or forever sunk under yon boiling ocean, wrapped in chains, there to converse with everlasting groans, unrespited, unpitted, unreprieved, ages of hopeless end, this would be worse. War, therefore, open or concealed, alike my voice dissuades. I laugh when those who at the spear are bold and venturous, if that fail them, shrink and fear what yet they know must follow, to endure exile or ignominy or bonds or pain, the sentence of their conqueror. This is now our doom, which if we can sustain and bear, our supreme foe in time may much remit his anger. And perhaps, 
thus far removed, not mind us not offending. Satisfied with what is punished, whence these raging fires will slacken, if his breath stir not their flames. Our purer essence then will overcome their noxious vapor, or inured not feel, or changed at length, and to the place conformed in temper and in nature will receive familiar the fierce heat and void of pain. This horror will grow mild. This darkness, light. Besides what hope the never-ending flight of future days may bring, what chance, what change worth waiting, since our present lot appears for happy, though but ill, for ill not worse, if we procure not to ourselves more woe. Thus Belial, with words clothed in reason's garb, counselled ignoble ease and peaceful sloth, not peace. And after him, thus Mammon spake. Either to disenthrone the king of heaven we war, if war be best, or to regain our own right lost. Him to unthrone we then may hope, when everlasting fate shall yield to fickle chance, and chaos judge the strife. The former, vain to hope, argues as vain the latter. For what place can be for us within heaven's bound, unless heaven's Lord supreme we overpower? Suppose he should relent and publish grace to all on promise made of new subjection. With what eyes could we stand in his presence, humble, and receive strict laws imposed? to celebrate his throne with warbled hymns and to his godhead sing forced alleluias while he lordly sits our envied sovereign and his altar breathes ambrosial odors and ambrosial flowers, our servile offerings. This must be our task in heaven, this our delight. How wearisome eternity so spent in worship paid to whom we hate. Let us not then pursue by force impossible, by leave obtained unacceptable, though in heaven, our state of splendid vassalage, but rather seek our own good from ourselves, and from our own live to ourselves, though in this vast recess, free, and to none accountable, preferring hard liberty before the easy yoke of servile pomp. This deep world of darkness do we dread? How oft, amidst thick clouds and dark, doth heaven's all-ruling sire choose to reside, his glory unobscured, and with the majesty of darkness round covers his throne, from whence deep thunders roar, mustering their rage. And heaven resembles hell. As he our darkness, cannot we his light imitate when we please? This desert soil wants not her hidden luster, gems and gold, nor want we skill or art from whence to raise magnificence. And what can heaven show more? Our torments also may, in length of time, become our elements. These piercing fires, as soft as now severe, our temper changed into their temper, which must needs remove the sensible of pain. All things invite to peaceful counsels, and the settled state of order, how in safety best we may compose our present evils with regard of what we are and where, dismissing quite all thoughts of war. Ye have what I advise. He scarce had finished when such murmur filled the assembly as when hollow rocks retain the sound of blustering winds, which all night long had roused the sea, now with hoarse cadence lull seafaring men o'erwatched, whose bark by chance or pinnace anchors in a craggy bay after the tempest. Such applause was heard as Mammon ended, and his sentence pleased, advising peace, for such another field they dreaded worse than hell, so much the fear of thunder and the sword of Michael wrought still within them, and no less desire to found this nether empire, which might rise by policy and long process of time in emulation opposite to heaven. 
which, when Beelzebub perceived, than whom Satan except none higher sat, with grave aspect he rose, and in his rising seemed a pillar of state. Deep on his front engraven, deliberation sat, and public care, and princely counsel in his face yet shone, majestic, though in ruin. Sage he stood, with Atlantean shoulders, fit to bear the weight of mightiest monarchies. His look drew audience, and attention still as night or summer's noontide air, while thus he spake. Thrones and imperial powers, offspring of heaven, ethereal virtues, all these titles now must we renounce. And changing style be called princes of hell? For so the popular vote inclines, here to continue and build up here a growing empire. Doubtless. While we dream and know not that the king of heaven hath doomed this place our dungeon, not our safe retreat beyond his potent arm, to live exempt from heaven's high jurisdiction, in new league banded against his throne, but to remain in strictest bondage, though thus far removed under the inevitable curb, reserved his captive multitude. For he, be sure, in height or depth, still first and last will reign sole king, and of his kingdom lose no part by our revolt. But over hell, extend his empire, and with iron scepter rule us here, as with his golden those in heaven. What sit we then projecting peace and war? War hath determined us, and foiled with loss irreparable. Terms of peace, yet none vouchsafed or sought. For what peace will be given to us enslaved, but custody severe? and stripes, and arbitrary punishment inflicted. And what peace can we return but to our power, hostility, and hate, untamed reluctance, and revenge though slow, yet ever plotting how the conqueror least may reap his conquest, and may least rejoice in doing what we most in suffering feel. Nor will occasion want nor shall we need with dangerous expedition to invade heaven, whose high walls fear no assault or siege or ambush from the deep. What if we find some easier enterprise? There is a place, if ancient and prophetic fame in heaven ere not, another world, the happy seat of some new race called man about this time to be created like to us, though less in power and excellence, but favoured more of him who rules above. So was his will pronounced among the gods, and by an oath that shook heaven's whole circumference confirmed. Thither let us bend all our thoughts, to learn what creatures there inhabit, of what mould or substance, how endued, and what their power, and where their weakness how attempted best by force or subtlety. Though heaven be shut, and heaven's high arbitrator sit secure in his own strength, this place may lie exposed, the utmost border of his kingdom, left to their defense who hold it. Here, perhaps, some advantageous act may be achieved by sudden onset, either with hell fire to waste his whole creation, or possess all as our own, and drive as we were driven the puny habitants, or if not drive, seduce them to our party, that their god may prove their foe, and with repenting hand abolish his own works. This would surpass common revenge, and interrupt his joy in our confusion, and our joy appraise in his disturbance when his darling sons hurled headlong to partake with us, shall curse their frail original, and faded bliss faded so soon. Advise if this be worth attempting, or to sit in darkness here, hatching vain empires.
Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode six, in which Beelzebub, having successfully proposed an attack on God's new-made creature, man, develops his theme. Well have ye judged, well ended long debate, Synod of Gods, and like to what ye are great things resolved, which from the lowest deep will once more lift us up in spite of fate, nearer our ancient seat. Perhaps in view of those bright confines, whence with neighboring arms and opportune excursion, we may chance re-enter heaven. But first, whom shall we send in search of this new world? Whom shall we find sufficient? Who shall tempt with wandering feet the dark, unbottomed, infinite abyss, and through the palpable obscure find out his uncouth way? Or spread his airy flight, upborne with indefatigable wings over the vast abrupt, ere he arrive the happy isle? What strength, what art can then suffice? Or what evasion bear him safe through the strict centuries and stations thick of angels watching round? Here he had need all circumspection, and we now no less choice in our suffrage. For on whom we send, the weight of all and our last hope relies. This said, he sat, and expectation held his look suspense, awaiting who appeared to second or oppose or undertake the perilous attempt. But all sat mute, pondering the danger with deep thoughts, and each in other's countenance read his own dismay, astonished. None among the choice and prime of those heaven-warring champions could be found so hardy as to proffer or accept alone the dreadful voyage. Till at last, Satan, whom now transcendent glory raised above his fellows, with monarchal pride, conscious of highest worth, unmoved, thus spake. O progeny of heaven, imperial thrones, with reason hath deep silence and demur seized us, though undismayed. Long is the way and hard that out of hell leads up to light. Our prison strong, this huge convex of fire, outrageous to devour, immures us round ninefold, and gates of burning adamant barred over us prohibit all egress. These past, if any pass, the void profound of unessential night receives him next, Wide gaping, and with utter loss of being, threatens him, plunged in that abortive gulf. If thence escape into whatever world or unknown region, what remains him less than unknown dangers and as hard escape? But I should ill become this throne, O peers, and this imperial sovereignty, adorned with splendor, armed with power, if aught proposed and judged of public moment in the shape of difficulty or danger could deter me from attempting. Wherefore do I assume these royalties and not refuse to reign, refusing to accept as great a share of hazard as of honor, due alike to him who reigns, and so much to him due of hazard more, as he above the rest high honored sits. Go therefore, mighty powers, terror of heaven though fallen, while I abroad through all the coasts of dark destruction seek deliverance for us all. This enterprise none shall partake with me. Thus saying, rose the monarch and prevented all reply. Prudent, lest from his resolution raised, others among the chief might offer now, certain to be refused, what erst they feared, and so refused might in opinion stand his rivals, winning cheap the high repute which he through hazard huge must earn. But they dreaded not more the adventure than his voice forbidding, and at once with him they rose. Their rising all at once was as the sound of thunder heard remote, Towards him they bend with awful reverence prone, and as a god extol him, equal to the highest in heaven. Nor failed they to express how much they praised that for the general safety he despised his own. For neither do the spirits damned lose all their virtue. Thus they their doubtful consultations dark ended, rejoicing in their matchless chief. 
as when from mountain tops the dusky clouds, ascending while the north wind sleeps, o'erspread heaven's cheerful face. The lowering element scowls o'er the darkened landscape, snow or shower. If chance the radiant sun with farewell sweet extend his evening beam, the fields revive. The birds their notes renew, and bleating herds attest their joy, that hill and valley rings. O oh, shame to men! Devil with devil damned firm concord holds. Men only disagree of creatures rational, though under hope of heavenly grace, and God proclaiming peace, yet live in hatred, enmity, and strife among themselves, and levy cruel wars, wasting the earth each other to destroy. As if, which might induce us to accord, man had not hellish foes enough besides that day and night for his destruction wait. The Stygian council thus dissolved, and forth in order came the grand infernal peers. Midst came their mighty paramount, and seemed alone the antagonist of heaven, nor less than hell's dread emperor, with pomp supreme and godlike imitated state. Him round, a globe of fiery seraphim enclosed, with bright emblazonry and horrent arms. Then, of their session ended, they bid cry, with trumpet's regal sound, the great result. Towards the four winds, four speedy cherubim put to their mouths a sounding alchemy, by herald's voice explained. The hollow abyss heard far and wide, and all the host of hell, with deafening shout, returned them loud acclaim. Thence, more at ease their minds, and somewhat raised by false presumptuous hope, the ranged powers disband, and wandering each his several way pursues, as inclination or sad choice leads him perplexed, where he may likeliest find truce to his restless thoughts, and entertain the irksome hours till this great chief return. Part on the plain, or in the air, sublime upon the wing, or in swift race contend as at the Olympian games or Pythian fields. Part curb their fiery steeds, or shun the goal with rapid wheels, or fronted brigades form. Others, with vast Typhian rage more fell, rend up both rocks and hills, and ride the air in whirlwind. Hell scarce holds the wild uproar. Others, more mild, retreated in a silent valley, sing with notes angelical to many a harp their own heroic deeds and hapless fall by doom of battle, and complain that fate, free virtue, should enthrall to force or chance. Their song was partial, but the harmony, what could it less when spirits immortal sing, suspended hell and took with ravishment the thronging audience. In discourse more sweet, for eloquence the soul, song charms the sense, others apart sat on a hill retired, in thoughts more elevate, and reasoned high of providence, foreknowledge, will, and fate. Fixed fate, free will, foreknowledge absolute, and found no end in wandering mazes lost. Of good and evil much they argued then, of happiness and final misery, passion and apathy and glory and shame, vain wisdom all, and false philosophy. Yet with a pleasing sorcery could charm pain for a while or anguish, and excite fallacious hope, or arm the obdured breast with stubborn patience as with triple steel. Another part in squadrons and gross bands, on bold adventure to discover wide that dismal world, if any climb perhaps might yield them easier habitation, bend four ways their flying march, along the banks of four infernal rivers that disgorge into the burning lake their baleful streams. Abhorred Styx, the flood of deadly hate, sad Acheron of sorrow, black and deep, Cositus, named of lamentation loud, heard on the rueful stream, fierce Phlegethon, whose waves of torrent fire inflame with rage. Far off from these, a slow and silent stream, Lethe, the river of oblivion, rolls her watery labyrinth, whereof who drinks, forthwith his former state and being forgets, 
forgets both joy and grief, pleasure and pain. Beyond this flood, a frozen continent lies dark and wild, beat with perpetual storms of whirlwind and dire hail, which on firm land thaws not, but gathers heap, and ruin seems of ancient pile. All else, deep snow and ice, a gulf profound as that Serbonian bog betwixt Damiata and Mount Cassius old, where armies whole have sunk. The parching air burns frore, and cold performs the effect of fire. Thither, by harpy-footed furies hailed, at certain revolutions, all the damned are brought, and feel by turns the bitter change of fierce extremes, extremes by change more fierce, from beds of raging fire to starve in ice their soft ethereal warmth, and there to pine immovable, infixed and frozen round periods of time, thence hurried back to fire. They ferry over this Lethean sound both to and fro, their sorrow to augment, and wish and struggle as they pass to reach the tempting stream with one small drop to lose in sweet forgetfulness all pain and woe, all in one moment, and so near the brink. But fate withstands, and to oppose the attempt, Medusa, with Gorgonian terror, guards the ford, and of itself the water flies all taste of living white, as once it fled the lip of Tantalus. Thus, roving on, in confused march forlorn, the adventurous bands, with shuddering horror pale and eyes aghast, viewed first their lamentable lot, and found no rest. Through many a dark and dreary vale they passed, and many a region dolorous, o'er many a frozen, many a fiery alp, rocks, caves, lakes, fens, bogs, dens, and shades of death, a universe of death, which God by curse created evil, for evil only good, where all life dies, Death lives, and nature breeds, perverse, all monstrous, all prodigious things, abominable, inutterable, and worse than fables yet have feigned or fear conceived, gorgons and hydras and chimeras dire. Paradise Lost by John Milton, with Dennis Quilly as the poet. Episode 7, in which Satan flies to Hell's Gate, where he encounters his daughter, Sin, and his son, Death. Meanwhile, the adversary of God and man, Satan, with thoughts inflamed of highest design, puts on swift wings and toward the gates of Hell explores his solitary flight. Sometimes he scours the right-hand coast, sometimes the left, now shaves with level wing the deep, then soars up to the fiery concave, towering high. At last appear hell bounds, high reaching to the horrid roof, and thrice threefold the gates. Three folds were brass, three iron, three of adamantine rock, impenetrable, impaled with circling fire, yet unconsumed. Before the gates there sat on either side a formidable shape. The one seemed woman to the waist and fair, but ended foul in many a scaly fold, voluminous and vast, a serpent armed with mortal sting. 
About her middle round, a cry of hellhounds, never ceasing, barked with wide Siberian mouths full loud, and rung a hideous peal. Yet, when they list, would creep, if aught disturbed their noise, into her womb and kennel there. Yet there still barked and howled within, unseen. Far less abhorred than these, vexed Scylla bathing in the sea that parts Calabria from the horse Trinacrian shore. Nor uglier follow the night hag, when called in secret, riding through the air she comes, lured with the smell of infant blood, to dance with Lapland witches, while the labouring moon eclipses at their charms. The other shape, if shape it might be called, that shape had none distinguishable in member, joint, or limb, or substance might be called, that shadow seemed, for each seemed either. Black it stood as night, fierce as ten furies, terrible as hell, and shook a dreadful dart. What seemed his head, the likeness of a kingly crown had on. Satan was now at hand. And from his seat the monster moving onward came as fast with horrid strides. Hell trembled as he strode. The undaunted fiend, what this might be, admired. Admired, not feared. God and his son except, created thing naught valued he, nor shunned. And with disdainful look, thus first began. Whence and what art thou, execrable shape, that darest, though grim and terrible, advance thy miscreated front athwart my way to yonder gates? Through them I mean to pass, that be assured, without leave asked of thee. Retire or taste thy folly, and learn by proof hell-born not to contend with spirits of heaven. Art thou that traitor, angel? Art thou he who first broke peace in heaven and faith till then unbroken? and in proud, rebellious arms drew after him the third part of heaven's sons, conjured against the highest, for which both thou and they, outcast from God, are here condemned to waste eternal days in woe and pain. And reckonst thou thyself with spirits of heaven, hell-doomed, and brief defiance here and scorn where I reign king? and to enrage thee more, thy king and lord. Back to thy punishment, false fugitive, and to thy speed add wings, lest with a whip of scorpions I pursue thy lingering, or with one stroke of this dart strange horror seize thee, and pangs unfelt before. So spake the grisly terror, and in shape, so speaking and so threatening, grew tenfold more dreadful and deform. On the other side, incensed with indignation, Satan stood unterrified, and like a comet burned that fires the length of Ophiuchus huge in the Arctic sky, and from his horrid hair shakes pestilence and war. Each at the head levelled his deadly aim, their fatal hands no second stroke intend, and such a frown each cast at the other, as when two black clouds with heaven's artillery fraught come rattling on over the Caspian, then stand front to front, hovering a space, till winds the signal blow to join their dark encounter in mid-air. So frowned the mighty combatants, that hell grew darker at their frown. So matched they stood, for never but once more was either like to meet so great a foe. And now great deeds had been achieved, whereof all hell had rung, had not the snaky sorceress that sat fast by hell gate and kept the fatal key risen and with hideous outcry rushed between. O oh, father, father, what intends thy hand against thy only son? What fury, O oh, son, possesses thee to bend that mortal dart against thy father's head. And knowest for whom? For him who sits above and laughs the while at thee ordained his drudge, to execute whate'er his wrath, which he calls justice, bids. 
His wrath which one day will destroy ye both. So strange thy outcry, and thy words so strange thou interposest that my sudden hand prevented, spares to tell thee yet by deeds what it intends, till first I know of thee what thing thou art, thus double formed, and why in this infernal veil first met thou callst me father, and that phantasm callst my son. I know thee not, not ever saw till now sight more detestable than him and thee. Hast thou forgot me then? And do I seem now in thine eyes so foul, once deemed so fair in heaven? When at the assembly, and in sight of all the seraphim with thee combined in bold conspiracy against heaven's king, all on a sudden miserable pain surprised thee, dim thine eyes, and dizzy swum in darkness, while thy head flames thick and fast threw forth, till on the left side opening wide, likest to thee in shape and countenance bright, then shining heavenly fair, a goddess armed out of thy head I sprung. Amazement seized all the host of heaven. Back they recoiled afraid at first and called me sin and for a sign portentous held me. But familiar groan, I pleased and with attractive graces won the most averse. Thee, chiefly, who full oft thyself in me, thy perfect image viewing, became enamoured, and such joy thou took'st with me in secret that my womb conceived a growing burden. Meanwhile, war arose, and fields were fought in heaven, wherein remained for what could else to our almighty foe clear victory. To our part, loss and rout through all the Empyrean. Down they fell, driven headlong from the pitch of heaven, down into this deep. And in the general fall I also. At which time, this powerful key into my hand was given, with charge to keep these gates forever shut, which none can pass without my opening. Pensive here I sat alone, but long I sat not, till my womb, pregnant by thee, and now excessive grown, prodigious motion felt and rueful throes. At last this odious offspring whom thou seest, thine own begotten, breaking violent way, tore through my entrails that with fear and pain distorted all my nether shape thus grew transformed. But he, my inbred enemy, forth issued, brandishing his fatal dart made to destroy. I fled and cried out death. Hell trembled at the hideous name and sighed from all her caves and back resounded death. I fled, but he pursued. The more it seems inflamed with lust than rage and swifter far me overtook his mother. All dismayed and in embraces forcible and foul, engendering with me. Of that rape begot these yelling monsters that with ceaseless cry surround me, as thou sawst. Hourly conceived and hourly born was sorrow infinite to me. For when they list, into the womb that bred them they return and howl and gnaw my bowels their repast. And then bursting forth afresh with conscious terrors, vex me round that rest or intermission none I find. Before mine eyes in opposition sits grim death, my son and foe, who sets them on. And me, his parent, would full soon devour for want of other prey, but that he knows his end with mine involved, and knows that I should prove a bitter morsel and his bane whenever that shall be. So fate pronounced. But thou, O oh father, I forewarn thee, shun his deadly arrow. Neither vainly hope to be invulnerable in those bright arms, though tempered heavenly. For that mortal dint, save he who reigns above, none can resist. Dear daughter, 
Since thou claimst me for thy sire, and my fair son here showst me the dear pledge of Darian's had with thee in heaven, and joys then sweet, now sad to mention, through dire change befallen us, unforeseen, unthought of, no, I come no enemy, but to set free from out this dark and dismal house of pain, both him and thee, and all the heavenly host of spirits that in our just pretenses armed fell with us from on high. From them I go, this uncouth errand, soul, and one for all myself expose, with lonely steps to tread the unfounded deep, and through the void immense to search with wandering quest a place foretold should be, and by concurring signs ere now created vast and round a place of bliss in the purlieus of heaven and therein placed a race of upstart creatures to supply perhaps our vacant room, though more removed, lest heaven, surcharged with potent multitude, might have to move new broils. Be this, or aught than this more secret, now designed, I haste to know, and this, once known, shall soon return and bring ye to the place where thou and death shall dwell at ease. And up and down unseen wing silently the buxom air, embalmed with odours. There ye shall be fed and filled immeasurably. All things shall be your prey. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 8 in which Satan passes through the great gulf between hell and heaven and approaches the new world God has made. Now Sin, the snaky sorceress that sat fast by hell gate and kept the fatal key, rejoiced and thus bespake her father, Satan. The key of this infernal pit by due and by command of heaven's all-powerful king, I keep, by him forbidden to unlock these adamantine gates. Against all force, death ready stands to interpose his dart, fearless to be o'ermatched by living might. But what owe I to his commands above who hates me? and hath hither thrust me down into this gloom of Tartarus profound. To sit in hateful office here confined, an inhabitant of heaven, and heavenly born, here in perpetual agony and pain, with terrors and with clamours compassed round of mine own brood that on my bowels feed. Thou art my father, Thou, my author, thou, my being, gavest me. Whom should I obey but thee? Whom follow? Thou wilt bring me soon to that new world of light and bliss among the gods who live at ease, where I shall reign at thy right hand, voluptuous, as beseems thy daughter and thy darling, without end. Thus saying... From her side the fatal key, sad instrument of all our woe, she took, and towards the gate rolling her bestial train, forthwith the huge portcullis high up drew, which but herself not all the Stygian powers could once have moved. Then in the keyhole turns the intricate wards, and every bolt and bar of massy iron or solid rock with ease unfastens. On a sudden... Open fly with impetuous recoil and jarring sound the infernal doors, and on their hinges great harsh thunder that the lowest bottom shook of Erebus. She opened, but to shut excelled her power. 
the gates wide open stood, that with extended wings a bannered host under spread ensigns marching might pass through with horse and chariots ranked in loose array. So wide they stood, and like a furnace mouth cast forth redounding smoke and ruddy flame. Before their eyes in sudden view appear the secrets of the hoary deep, a dark, illimitable ocean, without bound, without dimension, where length, breadth, and height, and time, and place are lost, where eldest night and chaos, ancestors of nature, hold eternal anarchy amidst the noise of endless wars, and by confusion stand. For hot Cold, moist, and dry, four champions fierce strive here for mastery, and to battle bring their embryon atoms. They, around the flag of each his faction, in their several clans, light-armed or heavy, sharp, smooth, swift or slow, swarm populous, unnumbered as the sands of Barker or Cyrene's torrid soil, levied to side with warring winds, and poise their lighter wings. To whom these most adhere, he rules a moment. Chaos umpire sits, and by decision more embroils the fray by which he reigns. Next him, high arbiter, chance governs all. Into this wild abyss, the womb of nature, and perhaps her grave, of neither sea, nor shore, nor air, nor fire, but all these in their pregnant causes mixed confusedly, and which thus must ever fight, unless the Almighty Maker them ordain his dark materials to create more worlds. Into this wild abyss the wary fiend stood on the brink of hell and looked a while, pondering his voyage, for no narrow firth he had to cross. Nor was his ear less peeled with noises loud and ruinous to compare great things with small than when Bellona storms with all her battering engines bent to raise some capital city, or less than if this frame of heaven were falling and these elements in mutiny had from her axle torn the steadfast earth. At last his sail-broad fans he spreads for flight, and in the surging smoke uplifted spurns the ground. Thence many a league, as in a cloudy chair ascending, rides audacious. But that seat soon failing meets a vast vacuity. All unawares, fluttering his pennons vain, plumb down he drops ten thousand fathoms deep. And to this hour down had been falling, had not by ill chance the strong rebuff of some tumultuous cloud, instinct with fire and nitre, hurried him as many miles aloft. That fury stayed quenched in a boggy surtis, neither sea nor good dry land. Nigh foundered, on he fares, treading the crude consistence, half on foot, half flying. Behoves him now both oar and sail. As when a griffon through the wilderness with winged course o'er hill or moory dale pursues the Arimaspian, who by stealth had from his wakeful custody purloined the guarded gold, so eagerly the fiend o'er bog or steep, through straight, rough, dense or rare, with head, hands, wings or feet pursues his way, and swims or sinks or wades or creeps or flies. At length, a universal hubbub wild of stunning sounds and voices, all confused, borne through the hollow dark, assaults his ear with loudest vehemence. Thither he plies, undaunted, to meet there whatever power or spirit of the nethermost abyss might in that noise reside, of whom to ask which way the nearest coast of darkness lies bordering on light, when straight behold the throne of chaos and his dark pavilion spread wide on the wasteful deep. With him enthroned sat sable-vested knight, eldest of things, the consort of his reign, and by them stood Orcus and Aedes, and the dreaded name of Demogorgon. Rumour next, and chance, and tumult, and confusion, all embroiled, and discord with a thousand various mouths, 
to whom Satan, turning boldly, thus... Ye powers and spirits of this nethermost abyss, chaos and ancient night, I come no spy, with purpose to explore or to disturb the secrets of your realm, but by constraint, wandering this darksome desert, as my way lies through your spacious empire up to light. Alone and without guide, half lost, I seek what readiest path leads where your gloomy bounds confine with heaven. Or if some other place from your dominion one, the ethereal king, possesses lately, thither to arrive, I travel this profound. Direct my course. Directed, no mean recompense it brings to your behoof. If I that region lost, all usurpation thence expelled, reduced to her original darkness and your sway, which is my present journey, and once more erect the standard there of ancient night. Yours be the advantage all. Mine, the revenge. I know thee, stranger, who thou art, that mighty leading angel who of late made head against heaven's king, though overthrown. I saw and heard, for such a numerous host fled not in silence through the frighted deep, with ruin upon ruin, rout on rout, confusion worse confounded. And heaven's gates poured out by millions her victorious bands pursuing. I, upon my frontiers here, keep residence. If all I can will serve that little which is left so to defend. Encroached on still through our intestine broils, weakening the scepter of old night. First hell, your dungeon stretching far and wide beneath. Now lately heaven and earth. Another world hung o'er my realm, linked in a golden chain to that side heaven from whence your legions fell. If that way be your walk, you have not far. So much the nearer danger go and speed. Havoc and spoil and ruin are my gain. He ceased, and Satan stayed not to reply. But glad that now his sea should find a shore, with fresh alacrity and force renewed, springs upward like a pyramid of fire into the wild expanse, and through the shock of fighting elements, on all sides round environed, wins his way. Harder beset and more endangered than when Argo passed through Bosporus betwixt the jostling rocks, or when Ulysses on the larboard shunned Charybdis and by the other whirlpool steered. So he, with difficulty and labour hard, moved on. With difficulty and labour he. But he once passed, soon after when man fell, strange alteration. Sin and death amain following his track, such was the will of heaven, paved after him a broad and beaten way over the dark abyss, whose boiling gulf tamely endured a bridge of wondrous length, from hell continued, reaching the utmost orb of this frail world, by which the spirits perverse with easy intercourse pass to and fro to tempt or punish mortals, except whom God and good angels guard by special grace. But now, at last, the sacred influence of light appears, and from the walls of heaven shoots far into the bosom of dim night a glimmering dawn. Here nature first begins her farthest verge, and chaos to retire, as from her outmost works a broken foe, with tumult less and with less hostile din, that Satan with less toil, and now with ease, wafts on the calmer wave by dubious light, and like a weather-beaten vessel holds gladly the port, though shrouds and tackle torn, or in the emptier waste, resembling air, weighs his spread wings at leisure to behold far off the imperial heaven, extended wide in circuit, undetermined square or round, with opal towers and battlements adorned of living sapphire, once his native seat. And fast by, hanging in a golden chain, this pendant world, in bigness as a star of smallest magnitude close by the moon. Thither, full fraught with mischievous revenge, accursed and in a cursed hour, he hies.
Paradise Lost by John Milton. Episode 9, in which the blind poet praises light and God reveals his purposes to his beloved son. Hail, holy light, offspring of heaven firstborn, or of the eternal, co-eternal beam. May I express thee unblamed, since God is light, and never but in unapproached light dwelt from eternity, dwelt then in thee, bright effluence of bright essence in create. Or hearst thou rather pure ethereal stream, whose fountain who shall tell? Before the sun, before the heavens thou wert, and at the voice of God, as with a mantle didst invest the rising world of waters dark and deep, one from the void and formless infinite. Thee I revisit now with bolder wing, escaped the Stygian pool, though long detained in that obscure sojourn, while in my flight through utter and through middle darkness born, with other notes than to the Orphean lyre I sung of chaos and eternal night, taught by the heavenly muse to venture down the dark descent and up to reascend, though hard and rare. Thee I revisit safe and feel thy sovereign vital lamp, but thou revisit'st not these eyes that roll in vain to find thy piercing ray and find no dawn. So thick a drop serene hath quenched their orbs or dim suffusion veiled. Yet not the more cease I to wander where the muses haunt clear spring or shady grove or sunny hill, smit with the love of sacred song, but chief thee, Sion, and the flowery brooks beneath that wash thy hallowed feet and warbling flow, nightly I visit, nor sometimes forget those other two, equalled with me in fate, so were I equalled with them in renown, blind Thamyris and blind Meonides, and Teresias and Phineas, prophets old. Then feed on thoughts, that voluntary move harmonious numbers, as the wakeful bird sings darkling, and in shadiest covert hid tunes her nocturnal note. Thus, with the year, seasons return, but not to me returns day, or the sweet approach of even or morn, or sight of vernal bloom, or summer's rose, or flocks, or herds, or human face divine, but cloud instead, and ever during dark surrounds me, from the cheerful ways of men cut off, and for the book of knowledge fair presented with a universal blank, of nature's works to me expunged and raised, and wisdom at one entrance quite shut out. So much the rather, thou celestial light, shine inward, and the mind through all her powers irradiate. There plant eyes, all mist from thence purge and disperse, that I may see and tell of things invisible to mortal sight. Now had the Almighty Father from above, from the pure Empyrean where he sits, high throned above all height, bent down his eye, his own works and their works at once to view. About him all the sanctities of heaven stood thick as stars, and from his sight received beatitude past utterance. On his right the radiant image of his glory sat, his only Son. On earth he first beheld our two first parents, yet the only two of mankind, in the happy garden placed, reaping immortal fruits of joy and love, uninterrupted joy, unrivaled love, in blissful solitude. He then surveyed hell and the gulf between, and Satan there, coasting the wall of heaven on this side night, him God beholding from his prospect high, wherein past, present, future he beholds, thus to his only son foreseeing spake. 
Only begotten son, seest thou what rage transports our adversary, whom no bounds prescribe, no bars of hell, nor all the chains heaped on him there, nor yet the main abyss wide interrupt can hold. So bent he seems on desperate revenge that shall redound upon his own rebellious head. And now, through all restraint broke loose, he wings his way, not far off heaven in the precincts of light, directly towards the new created world and man there placed, with purpose to assay if him by force he can destroy, or worse, by some false guile pervert. And shall pervert, for man will hearken to his glozing lies and easily transgress the sole command, sole pledge of his obedience. So will fall he and his faithless progeny, whose fault, whose but his own, ingrate he had of me all he could have. I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. Such I created all the ethereal powers and spirits, both them who stood and them who failed. Freely they stood who stood, and fell who fell. Not free? What proof could they have given sincere of true allegiance, constant faith or love, where only what they needs must do appeared? Not what they would. What praise could they receive? What pleasure I from such obedience paid when will and reason, reason also is choice, useless and vain, of freedom both despoiled, made passive both, had served necessity, not me. They therefore, as to right belonged, so were created, nor can justly accuse their maker or their making or their fate as if predestination overruled their will, disposed by absolute decree of high foreknowledge. They themselves decreed their own revolt, not I. If I foreknew, foreknowledge had no influence on their fault, which had no less proved certain unforeknown. The first sort, by their own suggestion, fell, self-tempted, self-depraved, Man falls deceived by the other first. Man, therefore, shall find grace, the other none. In mercy and justice both, through heaven and earth, so shall my glory excel, but mercy first and last shall brightest shine. Thus while God spake, ambrosial fragrance filled all heaven, and in the blessed spirit's elect, sense of new joy ineffable diffused. Beyond compare, the Son of God was seen most glorious. In him all his Father shone, substantially expressed. And in his face, divine compassion visibly appeared. Love without end, and without measure, grace. Which uttering, thus he to his Father spake. O oh, Father! Gracious was that word which closed thy sovereign sentence, that man should find grace. For should man finally be lost, should man thy creature late so loved, thy youngest son fall circumvented thus by fraud, though joined with his own folly? That be from thee far. That far be from thee, Father, who art judge of all things made and judgest only right, or shall the adversary thus obtain his end and frustrate thine? Shall he fulfill his malice and thy goodness bring to naught? Or, proud, return though to his heavier doom? Yet with revenge accomplished and to hell draw after him the whole race of mankind by him corrupted? Or wilt thou thyself abolish thy creation and unmake for him what for thy glory thou hast made? So should thy goodness and thy greatness both be questioned and blasphemed without defence. O son, in whom my soul hath chief delight, son of my bosom, son who art alone my word, my wisdom, and effectual might, 
All hast thou spoken as my thoughts are, all as my eternal purpose hath decreed. Man shall not quite be lost, but saved who will, yet not of will in him, but grace in me, freely vouchsafed. Once more I will renew his lapsed powers, though forfeit and enthralled by sin to foul exorbitant desires. Upheld by me, yet once more, he shall stand on even ground against his mortal foe. By me upheld, that he may know how frail his fallen condition is, and to me owe all his deliverance, and to none but me. Some I have chosen of peculiar grace, elect above the rest, so is my will. The rest shall hear me call, and oft be warned their sinful state, and to appease betimes the insensate deity, while offered grace invites, for I will clear their senses dark, what may suffice, and soften stony hearts to pray, repent, and bring obedience due. To prayer, repentance, and obedience due, though but endeavoured with sincere intent. Mine ear shall not be slow, mine eye not shut. And I will place within them as a guide my umpire, conscience, whom if they will hear, light after light well use they shall attain, and to the end persisting safe arrive. But yet all is not done. Man disobeying, disloyal, breaks his fealty and sins against the high supremacy of heaven, affecting Godhead, and so losing all, to expiate his treason, hath naught left but to destruction, sacred and devote, he with his whole posterity must die. Die he, or justice must, unless for him some other able and as willing pay the rigid satisfaction, death for death. Say, heavenly powers, where shall we find such love? Which of ye will be mortal to redeem man's mortal crime and just the unjust to save? Dwells in all heaven charity so dear? He asked, but all the heavenly choir stood mute, and silence was in heaven. Paradise Lost by John Milton. Episode 10, in which God asks who is willing to save mankind. His son freely offers himself. Say, heavenly powers, where shall we find such love? Which of ye will be mortal to redeem man's mortal crime and just the unjust to save? Dwells in all heaven charity so dear? He asked, but all the heavenly choir stood mute, and silence was in heaven. On man's behalf, patron or intercessor, none appeared, much less that durst upon his own head draw the deadly forfeiture and ransom set. And now, without redemption, all mankind must have been lost, adjudged to death and hell by doom severe, had not the Son of God, in whom the fullness dwells of love divine, his dearest mediation thus renewed. Father, thy word is past. Man shall find grace. And shall grace not find means that finds her way the speediest of thy winged messengers to visit all thy creatures, and to all comes unprevented, unimplored, unsought. Happy for man so coming. He her aid can never seek once dead in sins and lost, Atonement for himself or offering meat, Indebted and undone, hath none to bring. Behold me then, me for him, Life for life I offer. On me let thine anger fall, Account me man. I for his sake will leave thy bosom, And this glory next to thee freely put off, And for him lastly die well pleased. 
on me let death wreak all his rage. Under his gloomy power I shall not long lie vanquished. Thou hast given me to possess life in myself forever. By thee I live, though now to death I yield, and am his due all that of me can die. Yet that debt paid, thou wilt not leave me in the loathsome grave his prey, nor suffer my unspotted soul for ever with corruption there to dwell. But I shall rise victorious and subdue my vanquisher, spoiled of his vaunted spoil. Death, his death's wound, shall then receive and stoop, inglorious, of his mortal sting, disarmed. I, through the ample air in triumph high, shall lead hell captive Morga Hell, and show the powers of darkness bound. Thou, at the sight, pleased, out of heaven shalt look down and smile, while by thee raised I ruin all my foes, death last, and with his carcass glut the grave. Then with the multitude of my redeemed shall enter heaven long absent and return, Father, to see thy face, wherein no cloud of anger shall remain, but peace assured and reconcilement. Wrath shall be no more thenceforth, but in thy presence joy entire. His words here ended, but his meek aspect, silent, yet spake, and breathed immortal love to mortal men, above which only shone filial obedience. As a sacrifice glad to be offered, he attends the will of his great father. Admiration seized all heaven, what this might mean and whither tend, wondering, but soon the Almighty thus replied, O thou in heaven and earth, the only peace found out for mankind under wrath, O thou, my soul complacence, well thou knowest how dear to me are all my works, nor man the least, though last created that for him I spare thee from my bosom and right hand to save, by losing thee a while, the whole race lost. Thou, therefore, whom thou only canst redeem, their nature also to thy nature join, and be thyself man among men on earth, made flesh when time shall be, of virgin seed by wondrous birth, be thou in Adam's room the head of all mankind, though Adam's son. As in him perish all men, so in thee, as from a second root, shall be restored as many as are restored, without thee none. His crime makes guilty all his sons. Thy merit imputed shall absolve them who renounce their own both righteous and unrighteous deeds and live in thee transplanted and from thee receive new life. So man, as is most just, shall satisfy for man, be judged and die, and dying rise, and rising with him raise his brethren ransomed with his own dear life. So heavenly love shall outdo hellish hate, giving to death and dying to redeem, so dearly to redeem, what hellish hate so easily destroyed, and still destroys in those who, when they may, accept not grace. Nor shalt thou, by descending to assume man's nature, lessen or degrade thine own, because thou hast, Though throned in highest bliss, equal to God, and equally enjoying godlike fruition, quitted all to save a world from utter loss, and has been found by merit more than birthright son of God, found worthiest to be so by being good far more than great or high, because in thee love hath abounded more than glory abounds. Therefore thy humiliation shall exalt with thee thy manhood also to this throne. Where shalt thou sit incarnate? Here shalt reign both God and man, 
Son, both of God and man, anointed universal King, all power I give thee, reign forever, and assume thy merits under thee as head supreme, thrones, princedoms, powers, dominions I reduce. All knees to thee shall bow, of them that bide in heaven or earth or under earth in hell. When thou attended gloriously from heaven, shalt in the sky appear, and from thee send the summoning archangels to proclaim thy dread tribunal. Forthwith from all winds the living and forthwith the sighted dead of all past ages to the general doom shall hasten. Such appeal shall rouse their sleep. Then all thy saints assembled, thou shalt judge bad men and angels. They arraigned shall sink beneath thy sentence. Hell, her numbers full, thenceforth shall be forever shut. Meanwhile, the world shall burn, and from her ashes spring new heaven and earth, wherein the just shall dwell, and after all their tribulations long, see golden days, fruitful of golden deeds, with joy and love triumphing and fair truth. Then thou, thy regal scepter, shalt lay by, for regal scepter then no more shall need. God shall be all in all. But all ye gods adore him, who to compass all this dies. Adore the Son, and honor him as me. No sooner had the Almighty ceased, but all the multitude of angels, with a shout loud as from numbers without number, sweet as from blessed voices uttering joy, heaven rung with jubilee, and loud hosannas filled the eternal regions. Lowly reverent, towards either throne they bow, and to the ground with solemn adoration down they cast their crowns, inwove with amaranth and gold, immortal amaranth, a flower which once in paradise fast by the tree of life began to bloom, but soon, for man's offence, to heaven removed, where first it grew, there grows, and flowers aloft shading the fount of life. And where the river of bliss through midst of heaven rolls o'er Elysian flowers her amber stream. With these that never fade, the spirits elect bind their resplendent locks inwreathed with beams. Now in loose garlands thick thrown off, the bright pavement that like a sea of jasper shone empurpled with celestial roses smiled. Then, crowned again, their golden harps they took, harps ever tuned that glittering by their side like quivers hung, and with preamble sweet of charming symphony they introduce their sacred song and waken raptures high. No voice exempt, no voice but well could join melodious part, such concord is in heaven. Almighty Father, God omnipotent, immutable, Immortal, infinite, eternal King. Thee, author of all being, fountain of light, thyself invisible amidst the glorious brightness where thou sitst throned inaccessible. No sooner did thy dear and only Son perceive thee purposed not to doom frail man so strictly, but much more to pity inclined. He, to appease thy wrath, and end the strife of mercy and justice in thy face discerned, regardless of the bliss wherein he sat second to thee, offered himself to die for man's offence. O oh, unexampled love, love nowhere to be found less than divine. Hail, Son of God, Saviour of men, thy name shall be the copious matter of my song henceforth, and never shall my harp thy praise forget, nor from thy father's praise disjoin. Meanwhile, upon the firm opacous globe of this round world, whose first convex divides the luminous inferior orbs, enclosed from chaos and the inroad of darkness old, Satan alighted walks.
Paradise Lost by John Milton. Episode 11, in which Satan, by pretending to be a humble angel, is directed to his destination, God's new world. So, on this windy sea of land, the fiend walked up and down, alone, bent on his prey. Alone, for other creature in this place, living or lifeless to be found, was none. None yet. And long he wandered, till at last a gleam of dawning light turned thitherward in haste his travelled steps. Far distant he descries, ascending by degrees magnificent up to the wall of heaven, a structure high. At top whereof, but far more rich, appeared the work as of a kingly palace gate, with frontispiece of diamond and gold embellished. Thick with sparkling orient gems the portal shone, inimitable on earth by model or by shading pencil drawn. The stairs were such as whereon Jacob saw angels ascending and descending, bands of guardians bright, when he from Esau fled to Padan Aram in the field of Luz, dreaming by night under the open sky, and waking cried, This is the gate of heaven. Each stair mysteriously was meant, nor stood there always, but drawn up to heaven sometimes viewless, and underneath a bright sea flowed of jasper or of liquid pearl, whereon who after came from earth sailing arrived, wafted by angels, or flew o'er the lake wrapped in a chariot drawn by fiery steeds. The stairs were then let down whether to dare the fiend by easy ascent, or aggravate his sad exclusion from the doors of bliss, direct against which opened from beneath, just o'er the blissful seat of paradise, a passage down to the earth, a passage wide. So wide the opening seemed, where bounds were set to darkness, such as bound the ocean wave. Satan, from hence, now on the lower stair that scaled by steps of gold to heaven gate, looks down with wonder at the sudden view of all this world at once. As when a scout, through dark and desert ways with peril gone all night, at last, by break of cheerful dawn, obtains the brow of some high-climbing hill, which to his eye discovers unaware the goodly prospect of some foreign land first seen, or some renowned metropolis with glistering spires and pinnacles adorned, which now the rising sun gilds with his beams. Such wonder seized, though after heaven seen, the spirit malign. But much more envy seized at sight of all this world beheld so fair. Round he surveys, and well might, where he stood so high above the circling canopy of night's extended shade, from eastern point of Libra to the fleecy star that bears Andromeda far off Atlantic seas beyond the horizon. Then from pole to pole he views in breadth, and without longer pause, down right into the world's first region throws his flight precipitant, and winds with ease through the pure marble air his oblique way, amongst innumerable stars that shone stars distant, but nigh hand seemed other worlds, or other worlds they seemed, or happy isles, like those Hesperian gardens famed of old, fortunate fields and groves and flowery vales, thrice happy isles. But who dwelt happy there he stayed not to inquire. Above them all, the golden sun, in splendour likest heaven, allured his eye. Thither his course he bends through the calm firmament, but up or down, by centre or eccentric, hard to tell, or longitude, where the great luminary, aloof the vulgar constellations thick that from his lordly eye keep distance due, dispenses light from far. They, as they move their starry dance in numbers that compute days, months, and years, towards his all-cheering lamp turn swift their various motions, or are turned by his magnetic beam that gently warms the universe, and to each inward part, with gentle penetration, though unseen, shoots invisible virtue even to the deep. So wondrously was set his station bright. There lands the fiend, a spot like which perhaps astronomer in the sun's loosened orb through his glazed optic tube yet never saw. The place he found beyond expression bright, compared with aught on earth, 
metal or stone. Not all parts like, but all alike informed with radiant light as glowing iron with fire. If metal, part seemed gold, part silver clear. If stone, carbuncle most or chrysolite. What wonder then if fields and regions here breathe forth elixir pure, and rivers run potable gold, when with one virtuous touch the archchemic sun, so far from us remote, produces with terrestrial humour mixed here in the dark so many precious things of colour glorious and effect so rare. Here, Matter new to gaze the devil met, undazzled. Far and wide his eye commands, for sight no obstacle found here, nor shade, but all sunshine, as when his beams at noon culminate from the equator, as they now shot upward still direct, whence no way round shadow from body opaque can fall. And the air, nowhere so clear, sharpened his visual ray to objects distant far, whereby he soon saw within Ken a glorious angel stand, the same whom John saw also in the sun. His back was turned, but not his brightness hid. Of beaming sunny rays a golden tiara circled his head, nor less his locks behind, illustrious on his shoulders, fledged with wings, lay waving round. On some great charge employed he seemed, or fixed in cogitation deep. Glad was the spirit impure, as now in hope to find who might direct his wandering flight to paradise, the happy seat of man, his journey's end, and our beginning woe. But first he casts to change his proper shape, which else might work him danger or delay, and now a stripling cherub he appears, not of the prime, yet such as in his face youth smiled celestial, and to every limb suitable grace diffused, so well he feigned. Under a coronet his flowing hair in curls on either cheek played, wings he wore of many a coloured plume sprinkled with gold, his habit fit for speed succinct, and held before his decent steps a silver wand. He drew not nigh unheard. The angel bright, ere he drew nigh, his radiant visage turned, admonished by his ear, and straight was known the archangel Uriel, one of the seven who in God's presence nearest to his throne stand ready at command, and are his eyes that run through all the heavens, or down to the earth bear his swift errands over moist and dry, o'er sea and land. Him, Satan, Thus accosts. Uriel, for thou of those seven spirits that stand in sight of God's high throne, gloriously bright, the first art wont his great authentic will interpreter through highest heaven to bring, where all his sons thy embassy attend, and here art likeliest by supreme decree like honour to obtain, and as his eye to visit off this new creation round unspeakable desire to see and know all these his wondrous works, but chiefly man, his chief delight and favour, him for whom all these his works so wondrous he ordained, hath brought me from the choirs of cherubim, alone thus wandering. Brightest seraph, tell in which of all these shining orbs hath man his fixed seat, or fixed seat hath none, but all these shining orbs his choice to dwell, that I may find him, and with secret gaze or open admiration him behold, on whom the great Creator hath bestowed worlds, and on whom hath all these graces poured, that both in him and all things, as is meet, the universal Maker we may praise who justly hath driven out his rebel foes to deepest hell, and to repair that loss, created this new happy race of men to serve him better. Wise are all his ways. So spake the false dissembler, unperceived, for neither man nor angel can discern hypocrisy, the only evil that walks invisible, except to God alone, by his permissive will, through heaven and earth. 
And oft though wisdom wake, suspicion sleeps at wisdom's gate, and to simplicity resigns her charge, while goodness thinks no ill where no ill seems. Which now for once beguiled Uriel, though regent of the sun, and held the sharpest sighted spirit of all in heaven, who to the fraudulent impostor foul, in his uprightness, answer thus returned. Fair angel, thy desire which tends to know the works of God, thereby to glorify the great workmaster, leads to no excess that reaches blame, but rather merits praise the more it seems excess, that led thee hither from thy imperial mansion thus alone, to witness with thine eyes what some perhaps contented with report here only in heaven. I saw when at his word the formless mass this world's material mould came to a heap. Confusion heard his voice, and wild uproar stood ruled, stood vast infinitude confined. Till at his second bidding darkness fled, light shone, and order from disorder sprung. Look downward on that globe, whose hither side with light from hence, though but reflected, shines. That place is earth, the seat of man, that light his day, which else, as the other hemisphere, night would invade. But there the neighbouring moon, so call that opposite fair star, her aid timely interposes, and her monthly round still ending, still renewing through mid-heaven, with borrowed light her countenance triform, hence fills and empties to enlighten the earth, and in her pale dominion checks the night. That spot to which I point is paradise, Adam's abode. Those lofty shades his bower, thy way thou canst not miss, me mine requires. Thus said he turned, and Satan, bowing low, as to superior spirits is wont in heaven, where honour due and reverence none neglects, took leave, and toward the coast of earth beneath, down from the ecliptic sped with hoped success, throws his steep flight in many an airy wheel, nor stayed till on Nifates' top he lights. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 12, in which Satan leaps over the wall of the Garden of Eden and perches, in the shape of a cormorant, in the Tree of Life. Satan, now first inflamed with rage, came down, the tempter ere the accuser of mankind, to wreak on innocent frail man his loss of that first battle and his flight to hell. Yet not rejoicing in his speed, though bold, far off, and fearless, nor with cause to boast, begins his dire attempt, which nigh the birth now rolling, boils in his tumultuous breast, and like a devilish engine back recoils upon himself. Horror and doubt distract his troubled thoughts, and from the bottom stir the hell within him. For within him hell he brings, and round about him, nor from hell one step no more than from himself can fly by change of place. Now conscience wakes despair that slumbered, wakes the bitter memory of what he was, what is, and what must be worse, of worse deeds worse sufferings must ensue. Sometimes towards Eden, which now in his view lay pleasant, his grieved look he fixes sad. Sometimes towards heaven, and the full blazing sun, which now sat high in his meridian tower. Then, much revolving, thus in sighs began. O thou that with surpassing glory crowned, lookst from thy sole dominion like the god of this new world, at whose sight all the stars hide their diminished heads. To thee I call, but with no friendly voice, and add thy name, O sun, 
to tell thee how I hate thy beams, but to bring to my remembrance from what state I fell, how glorious once above thy sphere, till pride and worse ambition threw me down, warring in heaven against heaven's matchless king. Ah, wherefore? He deserved no such return from me, whom he created what I was in that bright eminence, and with his good upbraided none, nor was his service hard. What could be less than to afford him praise, the easiest recompense, and pay him thanks? How do you? Yet all his good proved ill in me, and wrought but malice. Lifted up so high, I disdained subjection, and thought one step higher would set me highest, and in a moment quit the debt immense of endless gratitude. So burdensome, still paying, still to owe, forgetful what from him I still received, and understood not that a grateful mind by owing owes not, but still pays, at once indebted and discharged. What burden, then? Oh, had his powerful destiny ordained me some inferior angel, I had stood then happy. No unbounded hope had raised ambition. Yet why not? Some other power as great might have aspired, and me, though mean, drawn to his part. But other powers as great fell not, but stand unshaken, from within or from without to all temptations armed. Hadst thou the same free will and power to stand? Thou hadst. Whom hast thou then, or what to accuse? But heaven's free love dealt equally to all. Be then his love accursed, since love or hate to me alike it deals eternal woe. Nay, cursed be thou, since against his thy will chose freely what it now so justly rues. Me, miserable, which way shall I fly, infinite wrath and infinite despair? Which way I fly is hell. Myself am hell, and in the lowest deep, a lower deep, still threatening to devour me, opens wide, to which the hell I suffer seems a heaven. Oh, then, at last, relent. Is there no place left for repentance, none for pardon left, none left but by submission? And that word disdain forbids me, and my dread of shame among the spirits beneath whom I seduced with other promises and other vaunts than to submit, boasting I could subdue the omnipotent. I, me, they little know how dearly I abide that boast so vain. Under what torments inwardly I groan, while they adore me on the throne of hell with diadem and scepter high advanced. The lower still I fall, only supreme in misery. Such joy ambition finds. But say I could repent and could obtain by act of grace my former state. How soon would height recall high thoughts? How soon unsay what feigned submission swore? Ease would recant vows made in pain as violent and void, for never can true reconcilement grow where wounds of deadly hate have pierced so deep, which would but lead me to a worse relapse and heavier fall. So should I purchase dear short intermission, bought with double smart. This knows my punisher. Therefore, as far from granting he as I from begging peace, all hope excluded thus, behold, instead of us outcast, exiled, his new delight mankind created, and for him this world. So farewell hope, and with hope farewell fear, farewell remorse. All good to me is lost, evil be thou my good. By thee at least divided empire with heaven's king I hold. By thee and more than half perhaps will reign as man ere long and this new world shall know. Thus while he spake, each passion dimmed his face, thrice changed with pale, ire, envy and despair, which marred his borrowed visage and betrayed him counterfeit if any eye beheld.
for heavenly minds from such distempers foul are ever clear. Whereof he soon aware, each perturbation smoothed with outward calm, artificer of fraud, and was the first that practised falsehood under saintly show, deep malice to conceal, couched with revenge. Yet not enough had practised to deceive Uriel once warned, whose eye pursued him down the way he went, and on the Assyrian mount saw him disfigured more than could befall spirit of happy sort. His gestures fierce he marked, and mad demeanour, then alone, as he supposed, all unobserved, unseen. So on he fares, and to the border comes of Eden, where delicious paradise, now nearer, crowns with her enclosure green, as with a rural mound, the champagne head of a steep wilderness, whose hairy sides, with thicket overgrown, grotesque and wild, access denied. And overhead up grew insuperable height of loftiest shade, cedar and pine and fir and branching palm, a sylvan scene. And as the ranks ascend shade above shade, a woody theatre of stateliest view. Yet higher than their tops, the verdurous wall of paradise upsprung, which to our general sire gave prospect large into his nether empire neighbouring round. And higher than that wall, a circling row of goodliest trees loaden with fairest fruit. Blossoms and fruits at once of golden hue appeared with gay enamelled colours mixed, on which the sun more glad impressed his beams than in fair evening cloud or humid bow when God hath showered the earth. So lovely seemed that landscape. And of pure, now purer air meets his approach, and to the heart inspires vernal delight and joy, able to drive all sadness but despair. Now gentle gales, fanning their odoriferous wings, dispense native perfumes, and whisper whence they stole those balmy spoils. Now to the ascent of that steep savage hill, Satan had journeyed on, pensive and slow. But further way found none, so thick entwined as one continued break, the undergrowth of shrubs and tangling bushes had perplexed all path of man or beast that passed that way. One gate there only was, and that looked east on the other side, which when the arch felon saw, due entrance he disdained, and in contempt at one slight bound, high overleapt all bound of hill or highest wall, and sheer within lights on his feet as when a prowling wolf, whom hunger drives to seek new haunt for prey, watching where shepherds pen their flocks at eve in hurdled cots amid the field secure, leaps o'er the fence with ease into the fold. Or as a thief, bent to unhoard the cash of some rich burgher, whose substantial doors, cross-barred and bolted fast, fear no assault, in at the window climbs, or o'er the tiles, so climbed this first grand thief into God's fold. So since into his church lewd hirelings climb. Thence up he flew, and on the tree of life, the middle tree and highest there that grew, sat like a cormorant, yet not true life thereby regained, but sat devising death to them who lived. Beneath him with new wonder, now he views, to all delight of human sense exposed in narrow room, nature's whole wealth, yea more, a heaven on earth. For blissful paradise of God the garden was, by him in the east of Eden planted. In this pleasant soil, his far more pleasant garden God ordained. Out of the fertile ground he caused to grow all trees of noblest kind for sight, smell, taste. And all amid them stood the tree of life, high eminent, blooming ambrosial fruit of vegetable gold. And next to life, our death, the tree of knowledge, grew fast by. Knowledge of good, bought dear by knowing ill. Southward through Eden went a river large, nor changed his course, but through the shaggy hill passed underneath engulfed. 
For God had thrown that mountain as his garden mould, high raised upon the rapid current, which through veins of porous earth with kindly thirst updrawn, rose a fresh fountain, and with many a rill watered the garden. Thence united fell down the steep glade, and met the nether flood, which from his darksome passage now appears. And now divided into four main streams, runs diverse, wandering many a famous realm and country, whereof here needs no account, but rather to tell how, if art could tell, how from that sapphire fount the crispid brooks, rolling on orient pearl and sands of gold, with mazy error under pendant shades, ran nectar, visiting each plant, and fed flowers worthy of paradise, which not nice art in beds and curious knots, but nature boon poured forth profuse on hill and dale and plain, both where the morning sun first warmly smote the open field, and where the unpierced shade embrowned the noontide bowers. Thus was this place, a happy rural seat of various view. <laughs> Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 13, in which Satan sees Adam and Eve for the first time, and eavesdrops on their conversation. Thus was this place, a happy rural seat of various view, groves whose rich trees wept odorous gums and balm, others whose fruit, burnished with golden rind, hung amiable, Hesperian fables, true, if true, here only and of delicious taste. Betwixt them lawns or level downs, and flocks grazing the tender herb were interposed, or palmy hillock, or the flowery lap of some irriguous valley spread her store. Flowers of all hue, and without thorn the rose. Another side, umbrageous grots and caves of cool recess, o'er which the mantling vine lays forth her purple grape, and gently creeps luxuriant. Meanwhile murmuring waters fall down the slope hills dispersed, or in a lake that to the fringed bank with myrtle crowned her crystal mirror holds, unite their streams. The birds their choir apply, airs, vernal airs, breathing the smell of field and grove, attune the trembling leaves, while universal pan, knit with the graces and the hours in dance, led on the eternal spring. And here the fiend saw, undelighted, all delight, all kind of living creatures new to sight and strange, two of far nobler shape, erect and tall, godlike erect, with native honour clad in naked majesty, seemed lords of all, and worthy seemed, for in their looks divine the image of their glorious maker shone, truth, wisdom, sanctitude, severe and pure, severe, but in true filial freedom placed, whence true authority in men. Though both not equal, as their sex not equal seemed, for contemplation he and valour formed, for softness she and sweet attractive grace, he for God only, she for God in him. His fair large front and eye sublime declared absolute rule, and hyacinthine locks round from his parted forelock manly hung, clustering, but not beneath his shoulders broad. She, as a veil down to the slender waist her unadorned golden tresses wore, dishevelled, but in wanton ringlets waved as the vine curls her tendrils, which implied subjection, 
but required with gentle sway, and by her yielded, by him best received, yielded with coy submission, modest pride, and sweet, reluctant, amorous delay. Nor those mysterious parts were then concealed. Then was not guilty shame. Dishonest shame of nature's works, honour dishonourable, sin-bred, how have ye troubled all mankind with shows instead, mere shows of seeming pure, and banished from man's life his happiest life, simplicity and spotless innocence. So passed they naked on, nor shunned the sight of God or angel, for they thought no ill. So hand in hand they passed, the loveliest pair that ever since in love's embraces met, Adam, the goodliest man of men since born his sons, the fairest of her daughters, Eve. Under a tuft of shade that on a green stood whispering soft, by a fresh fountain side they sat them down. And after no more toil of their sweet gardening labour than sufficed to recommend cool zephyr, and make ease more easy, wholesome thirst and appetite more grateful, to their supper fruits they fell. Nectarine fruits, which the compliant boughs yielded them, sidelong as they sat recline on the soft downy bank damasked with flowers, the savoury pulp they chew, and in the rind, still as they thirsted, scoop the brimming stream. Nor gentle purpose, nor endearing smiles wanted, nor youthful dalliance, as beseems fair couple linked in happy nuptial league, alone as they. About them frisking played all beasts of the earth since wild, and of all chase in wood or wilderness, forest or den. Sporting the lion ramped, and in his paw dandled the kid. Bears, tigers, lynxes, pards, gambled before them. The unwieldy elephant, to make the mirth, used all his might, and wreathed his lithe proboscis. Close the serpent, sly insinuating, wove with gordian twine his braided train, and of his fatal guile gave proof unheeded. Others on the grass couched, and now filled with pasture grazing sat, or bedward ruminating. For the sun declined was hasting now with prone career to the ocean isles, and in the ascending scale of heaven the stars that usher evening rose. When Satan, still in gaze, as first he stood, scarce thus at length failed speech recovered, sad. O oh, hell, what do mine eyes with grief behold? Into our room of bliss thus high advanced, Creatures of other mould, earth-born perhaps, Not spirits, yet to heavenly spirits bright, Little inferior, whom my thoughts pursue with wonder, And could love, so lively shines in them divine resemblance, And such grace the hand that formed them on their shape hath poured, Ah, gentle pair, ye little think how nigh your change approaches, when all these delights will vanish and deliver ye to woe. More woe, the more your taste is now of joy. Happy, but for so happy, ill-secured, long to continue, and this high seat your heaven, ill-fenced for heaven to keep out such a foe as now is entered. Yet no purposed foe to you, whom I could pity thus forlorn, though I unpitied. League with you I seek, and mutual amity so straight, so close, that I with you must dwell, or you with me, henceforth. My dwelling haply may not please, like this fair paradise, your sense, yet such accept your Maker's work. He gave it me which I as freely give. Hell shall enfold to entertain you two her widest gates and send forth all her kings. There will be room, not like these narrow limits, to receive your numerous offspring. If no better place, thank him who puts me loath to this revenge on you who wrong me not for him who wronged. 
and should I at your harmless innocence melt, as I do, yet public reason just, honor and empire with revenge enlarged by conquering this new world, compels me now to do what else, though damned, I should abhor. So spake the fiend, and with necessity the tyrant's plea excused his devilish deeds. Then from his lofty stand on that high tree, down he alights among the sportful herd of those four-footed kinds, himself now one, now other, as their shape served best his end nearer to view his prey, and unespied to mark what of their state he more might learn by word or action marked. About them round a lion now he stalks with fiery glare, then as a tiger, who by chance hath spied in some purlieu two gentle fawns at play, straight couches close, then rising changes oft his couch and watch, as one who chose his ground, whence rushing he might surest seize them both, gripped in each paw. When Adam, first of men, to first of women Eve, thus moving speech, turned him all ear to hear new utterance flow. Soul partner, and sole part of all these joys, dearer thyself than all. Needs must the power that made us, and for us this ample world be infinitely good, and of his good as liberal and free as infinite, that raised us from the dust and placed us here in all this happiness, who at his hand have nothing merited, nor can perform aught whereof he hath need. He who requires from us no other service than to keep this one, this easy charge, of all the trees in paradise that bear delicious fruit so various, not to taste that only tree of knowledge planted by the tree of life. So near grows death to life, whate'er death is, some dreadful thing, no doubt. For well thou knowest, God hath pronounced it death to taste that tree, the only sign of our obedience left among so many signs of power and rule conferred upon us, and dominion given over all other creatures that possess earth, air, and sea. Then let us not think hard one easy prohibition, who enjoy free leave so large to all things else, and choice unlimited of manifold delights. But let us ever praise him, and extol his bounty, following our delightful task to prune these growing plants and tend these flowers, which were it toilsome, yet with thee were sweet. O oh, thou, for whom and from whom I was formed flesh of thy flesh, and without whom and to no end, my guide and head, what thou hast said is just and right, for we to him indeed all praises owe and daily thanks. I chiefly who enjoy so far the happier lot, enjoying thee pre-eminent by so much odds, while thou, like consort to thyself, canst nowhere find. That day I oft remember, when from sleep I first awaked, and found myself reposed under a shade on flowers, much wondering where and what I was, whence thither brought and how. Not distant far from thence, a murmuring sound of waters issued from a cave and spread into a liquid plain, and stood unmoved, pure as the expanse of heaven. I thither went with unexperienced thought and laid me down on the green bank to look into the clear, smooth lake that to me seemed another sky. As I bent down to look, just opposite, a shape within the watery gleam appeared, bending to look on me. I started back, it started back, but pleased I soon returned. Pleased it returned as soon with answering looks of sympathy and love. There I had fixed mine eyes till now, and pined with vain desire, had not a voice thus warned me. What thou seest, what there thou seest, fair creature, is thyself. With thee it came and goes. But follow me, and I will bring thee where no shadow stays thy coming, and thy soft embraces. He whose image thou art, him thou shalt enjoy, inseparably thine. To him shalt bear multitudes like thyself, and thence be called mother of human race.
Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 14, in which the angel Uriel warns Gabriel that an evil spirit has entered Paradise. But first, Eve recalls the first time she saw Adam. To him shall bear multitudes like thyself, and thence be called mother of human race. What could I do but follow straight, invisibly thus led, till I espied thee, fair indeed and tall, under a platen, yet methought less fair, less winning soft, less amiably mild than that smooth, watery image? Back I turned, thou following criedst aloud, Return, fair Eve, whom fliest thou? Whom thou fliest of him thou art, his flesh, his bone. To give thee being I lent out of my side to thee, Nearest my heart, substantial life, To have thee by my side, henceforth an individual solace dear. Part of my soul I seek thee, and thee claim my other half. With that thy gentle hand seized mine. I yielded, and from that time see how beauty is excelled by manly grace and wisdom, which alone is truly fair. So spake our general mother, and with eyes of conjugal attraction unreproved and meek surrender, half embracing leaned on our first father. Half her swelling breast naked met his, under the flowing gold of her loose tresses hid. He, in delight both of her beauty and submissive charms, smiled with superior love, as Jupiter on Juno smiles when he impregnates the clouds that shed May flowers, and pressed her matron lip with kisses pure. Aside the devil turned for envy, yet with jealous leer malign eyed them askance, and to himself thus plained. Sight hateful, sight tormenting, thus these two, imparadised in one another's arms, the happier Eden, shall enjoy their fill of bliss on bliss, while I to hell am thrust, where neither joy nor love but fierce desire, among our other torments, not the least, still unfulfilled with pain of longing pines. Yet let me not forget what I have gained from their own mouths. All is not theirs, it seems. One fatal tree there stands, of knowledge called, forbidden them to taste. Knowledge forbidden, suspicious, reasonless. Why should their lord envy them that? Can it be sin to know? Can it be death? And do they only stand by ignorance? Is that their happy state, the proof of their obedience and their faith? O oh, fair foundation laid whereon to build their ruin! Hence I will excite their minds with more desire to know and to reject envious commands invented with design to keep them low, whom knowledge might exalt equal with gods. Aspiring to be such, they taste and die. What likelier can ensue? But first, with narrow search, I must walk round this garden and no corner leave unspied. A chance, but chance may lead where I may meet some wandering spirit of heaven by fountain side or in thick shade retired, from him to draw what further would be learned. Live while ye may, yet happy pair. Enjoy till I return short pleasures, for long woes are to succeed. So saying, his proud step he scornful turned, but with sly circumspection, and began through wood, through waste, o'er hill, o'er dale, his roam. Meanwhile, in utmost longitude, where heaven with earth and ocean meets, the setting sun slowly descended, and with right aspect, against the eastern gate of paradise, levelled his evening rays. It was a rock of alabaster, piled up to the clouds, conspicuous far, winding with one ascent accessible from earth, one entrance high. The rest was craggy cliff that overhung still as it rose, impossible to climb. Betwixt these rocky pillars, Gabriel sat, chief of the angelic guards, awaiting night. About him exercised heroic games the unarmed youth of heaven, but nigh at hand, celestial armory, shields, helms, and spears, hung high with diamond flaming and with gold. Thither came Uriel, 
Gliding through the even on a sunbeam, swift as a shooting star in autumn thwarts the night, when vapours fired impress the air, and shows the mariner from what point of his compass to beware impetuous winds. He thus began in haste. Gabriel, to thee thy course by lot hath given charge and strict watch, that to this happy place no evil thing approach or enter in. This day, at height of noon, came to my sphere a spirit, Zealous, as he seemed to know more of the Almighty's work, and chiefly man, God's latest image. I described his way, bent all on speed, and marked his airy gait. But in the mount that lies from Eden north, where he first lighted, soon discerned his looks alien from heaven, with passions foul obscured. Mine eye pursued him still, but under shade lost sight of him. One of the banished crew, I fear, hath ventured from the deep, to raise new troubles. Him thy care must be to find. Uriel, no wonder if thy perfect sight, amid the sun's bright circle where thou sitst, see far and wide. In at this gate none pass the vigilance here placed, but such as come well known from heaven, and since meridian hour no creature thence. If spirit of other sort, so minded, have o'erleapt these earthy bounds on purpose, hard thou know'st it to exclude spiritual substance with corporeal bar. But if within the circuit of these walks, in whatsoever shape he lurk, of whom thou tell'st, by morrow dawning I shall know. So promised he, and Uriel to his charge returned on that bright beam, whose point now raised bore him slope downward to the sun, now fallen beneath the Azores. And twilight grey had in her sober livery all things clad, silence accompanied. For beast and bird, they to their grassy couch, these to their nests were slunk, all but the wakeful nightingale. She all night long her amorous descant sung. Silence was pleased. Now glowed the firmament with living sapphires. Hesperus, that led the starry host, rode brightest. Till the moon, rising in clouded majesty, at length apparent queen unveiled her peerless light, and o'er the dark her silver mantle threw. When Adam thus to Eve. Fair consort, the hour of night, and all things now retired to rest, mind us to like repose. Since God hath set labour and rest, as day and night, to men successive, and the timely dew of sleep now falling with soft slumberous weight inclines our eyelids. Other creatures all day long rove idle, unemployed, and less need rest. Man hath his daily work of body or mind appointed, which declares his dignity and the regard of heaven on all his ways, while other animals unactive range, and of their doings God takes no account. Tomorrow, ere fresh morning streak the east with first approach of light, we must be risen and at our pleasant labour to reform yon flowery arbours, yonder alleys green, our walks at noon with branches overgrown that mock our scant manuring, and require more hands than ours to lop their wanton growth. Those blossoms also, and those dropping gums that lie bestrewn, unsightly and unsmooth, ask riddance, if we mean to tread with ease. Meanwhile, as nature will, night bids us rest. My author and disposer, what thou bidst unargued I obey. So God ordains, God is thy law, thou mine. To know no more is woman's happiest knowledge and her praise. With thee conversing, I forget all time, all seasons and their change, all pleas alike. Sweet is the breath of morn, her rising sweet, with charm of earliest birds. Pleasant the sun when first on this delightful land he spreads his orient beams on herb, tree, fruit, and flower glistering with dew. Fragrant the fertile earth after soft showers, and sweet the coming on of grateful evening mild. Then silent night with this her solemn bird, and this fair moon, and these the gems of heaven her starry train. But neither breath of morn, when she ascends with charm of earliest birds, 
nor rising sun on this delightful land, nor herb, fruit, flower glistering with dew, nor fragrance after showers, nor grateful evening mild, nor silent night with this her solemn bird, nor walk by moon or glittering starlight, without thee is sweet. But wherefore all night long shine these? For whom this glorious sight, when sleep hath shut all eyes? Daughter of God and man, accomplished Eve, those have their course to finish round the earth by morrow evening, and from land to land in order, though to nations yet unborn, ministering light prepared they set and rise, lest total darkness should by night regain her old possession and extinguish life in nature and all things, which these soft fires not only enlighten, but with kindly heat of various influence ferment and warm, temper or nourish, or in part shed down their stellar virtue on all kinds that grow on earth, made hereby apter to receive perfection from the sun's more potent ray. These, then, though unbeheld in deep of night, shine not in vain, nor think, though men were none, that heaven would want spectators, God want praise. Millions of spiritual creatures walk the earth unseen, both when we wake and when we sleep. All these, with ceaseless praise, his works behold both day and night. How often, from the steep of echoing hill or thicket, have we heard celestial voices to the midnight air, soul or responsive, each to other's note, singing their great creator, in full harmonic number joined, their songs divide the night and lift our thoughts to heaven. Thus talking, hand in hand alone they passed on to their blissful bower. It was a place chosen by the sovereign planter when he framed all things to man's delightful use. The roof of thickest covert was inwoven shade, laurel and myrtle, and what higher grew of firm and fragrant leaf. On either side, acanthus, and each odorous bushy shrub fenced up the verdant wall, each beauteous flower, iris, all hues, roses and jessamine, reared high their flourished heads between, and wrought mosaic. Underfoot the violet, crocus and hyacinth, with rich inlay, broidered the ground, more coloured than with stone of costliest emblem. Other creature here, beast, bird, insect, or worm, durst enter none. Such was their awe of man. And here it was, with flowers, garlands, and sweet-smelling herbs, espoused Eve decked first her nuptial bed. And heavenly choirs the Hymenean sung, what day the genial angel to our sire brought her. In naked beauty. Paradise Lost by John Milton, Episode 15, in which Adam and Eve take their rest, and the angels appointed to guard them apprehend Satan the intruder. Thou also madest the night maker omnipotent. And thou the day which we in our appointed work employed have finished happy in our mutual help. And mutual love. The crown of all our bliss ordained by thee. And this delicious place for us too large. Where thy abundance wants partakers. And uncropped falls to the ground. But thou hast promised from us to a race. To fill the earth. Who shall with us extol thy goodness infinite. Both when we wake and when we seek, as now, thy gift of sleep. This said unanimous, and other rites observing none but adoration pure, which God likes best, into their inmost bower handed they went, and eased the putting off these troublesome disguises which we wear. Straight side by side were laid, nor turned I ween Adam from his fair spouse, nor Eve the rites mysterious of connubial love refused. Whatever hypocrites austerely talk of purity and peace and innocence, defaming as impure what God declares pure and commands to some, leaves free to all. Our Maker bids increase. 
Who bids abstain but our destroyer, foe to God and man? Hail, wedded love, mysterious law, true source of human offspring, sole propriety in paradise of all things common else. Here love his golden shafts employs, here lights his constant lamp and waves his purple wings, reigns here and revels, not in the bought smile of harlots, loveless, joyless, unendeared, casual fruition, nor in court amours, mixed dance or wanton mask or midnight ball or serenade, which the starved lover sings to his proud fair, best quitted with disdain. These, lulled by nightingales, embracing slept, and on their naked limbs the flowery roof showered roses, which the morn repaired. Sleep on, blessed pair, and, O oh, yet happiest, if ye seek no happier state, and know to know no more. Now had night measured with her shadowy cone halfway uphill this vast sublunar vault, and from their ivory port the cherubim, forth issuing at the accustomed hour, stood armed to their night watches in warlike parade, when Gabriel, to his next in power, thus spake. Uziel, half these draw off, and coast the south with strictest watch. These other wheel the north, our circuit meet full west. As flame they part, half wheeling to the shield, half to the spear, from these two strong and subtle spirits he called that near him stood, and gave them thus in charge. Ithuriel and Zephon, with winged speed, search through this garden, leave unsearched no nook, but chiefly where those two fair creatures lodge, now laid perhaps asleep, secure of harm. This evening from the sun's decline arrived, who tells of some infernal spirit seen hitherward bent, who could have thought, escaped the bars of hell, on errand bad, no doubt? Such where ye find, seize fast, and hither bring. So saying, on he led his radiant files, dazzling the moon, these to the bower direct, in search of whom they sought. Him there they found, squat like a toad, close at the ear of Eve, essaying by his devilish art to reach the organs of her fancy, and with them forge illusions as he list, phantasms and dreams. Him thus intent, Ithuriel with his spear touched lightly, for no falsehood can endure touch of celestial temper, but returns of force to its own likeness. Up he starts, discovered and surprised. So started up in his own shape the fiend. Back stepped those two fair angels, half amazed so sudden to behold the grisly king. Yet thus, unmoved with fear, accost him soon. Which of those rebel spirits adjudged to hell comest thou, escaped thy prison and transformed? Why satst thou like an enemy in wait here, watching at the head of these that sleep? Know ye not me? Ye knew me once, no mate for you, there sitting where ye durst not soar. Not to know me argues yourselves unknown the lowest of your throng. Or if ye know, why ask ye, and superfluous begin your message, like to end as much in vain? To whom thus Zephon answering scorn with scorn? Think not, revolted spirit, thy shape the same, or undiminished brightness to be known as when thou stoodst in heaven upright and pure. That glory then, when thou no more wast good, departed from thee. And thou resemblest now thy sin and place of doom, obscure and foul. But come, for thou be sure shalt give account to him who sent us, whose charge is to keep this place inviolable and these from harm. So spake the cherub, and his grave rebuke, severe in youthful beauty, added grace invincible. Abashed the devil stood, and felt how awful goodness is, and saw virtue in her shape how lovely, saw and pined. Then, like a proud steed reined, went haughty on, champing his iron curb. Now drew they nigh the western point, where those half-rounding guards just met, and closing stood in squadron joined, awaiting next command, to whom their chief Gabriel from the front thus called aloud. O friends, 
I hear the tread of nimble feet hasting this way, and now by glimpse discern Ithuriel and Zephon through the shade, and with them comes a third of regal port, but faded splendor one, who by his gait and fierce demeanor seems the prince of hell. He scarce had ended when those two approached, and brief related whom they brought, where found, how busied, in what form and posture couched, to whom with stern regard thus Gabriel spake. Why hast thou, Satan, broke the bounds prescribed to thy transgressions? Gabriel, thou hadst in heaven the esteem of wise, and such I held thee, but this question asked, puts me in doubt, lives there who loves his pain. Who would not, finding way, break loose from hell, though thither doomed? Thou wouldst thyself, no doubt, and boldly venture to whatever place farthest from pain, where thou mightst hope to change torment with ease, and soonest recompense dole with delight, which in this place I sought. Let him sure bar his iron gates, if he intends our stay in that dark durance. But wherefore thou alone... Wherefore with thee came not all hell broke loose? Is pain to them less pain, less to be fled? Or thou than they less hardy to endure, courageous chief? The first in flight from pain, hadst thou alleged to thy deserted host this cause of flight, thou surely hadst not come so fugitive. Not that I less endure or shrink from pain, insulting angel. Well thou knowest, I stood thy fiercest, when in battle to thy aid the blasting volleyed thunder made all speed and seconded thy else not dreaded spear. But still thy words at random, as before, argue thy inexperience. What behoves from hard assays and ill successes past a faithful leader? not to hazard all through ways of danger by himself untried. I, therefore, I alone first undertook to wing the desolate abyss and spy this new created world, whereof in hell fame is not silent, here in hope to find better abode and my afflicted powers to settle here on earth or in mid-air, Though for possession put to try once more what thou and thy gay legions dare against, whose easier business were to serve their lord high up in heaven with songs to him his throne, and practised distances to cringe, not fight. To say and straight unsay, pretending first wise to fly pain, professing next the spy, argues no leader, but a liar traced, Satan. And couldst thou faithful add? O name, O sacred name of faithfulness profaned. Faithful to whom? To thy rebellious crew? Army of fiends, fit body to fit head? Was this your discipline and faith engaged? Your military obedience to dissolve allegiance to the acknowledged power supreme? And thou, sly hypocrite, who now wouldst seem patron of liberty, who more than thou once fawned and cringed and servilely adored heaven's awful monarch, wherefore but in hope to dispossess him and thyself to reign? But mark what I advise thee now, avaunt, fly thither whence thou fledst. If from this hour within these hallowed limits thou appear, Back to the infernal pit I drag thee chained, and seal thee so, as henceforth not to scorn the facile gates of hell too slightly barred. Then when I am thy captive, talk of chains, proud, limitary cherub. But ere then, far heavier load thyself expect to feel from my prevailing arm, though heaven's king ride on thy wings, and thou with thy compeers, used to the yoke, drawst his triumphant wheels in progress through the road of heaven's star paved. While thus he spake, the angelic squadron bright turned fiery red, sharpening in mooned horns their phalanx, and began to hem him round with ported spears, as thick as when a field of Ceres, ripe for harvest, waving bends her bearded grove of ears which way the wind sways them. The careful ploughman doubting stands, lest on the threshing-floor his hopeful sheaves prove chaff. 
On the other side, Satan, alarmed, collecting all his might, dilated stood like Tenerife or Atlas, unremoved. His stature reached the sky, and on his crest sat horror plumed, nor wanted in his grasp what seemed both spear and shield. Now dreadful deeds might have ensued, nor only paradise in this commotion, but the starry cope of heaven, perhaps, or all the elements at least had gone to rack, disturbed and torn with violence of this conflict, had not soon the Eternal, to prevent such horrid fray, hung forth in heaven his golden scales, yet seen betwixt Astria and the scorpion sign, wherein all things created first he weighed, the pendulous round earth with balanced air in counterpoise, now ponders all events, battles, and realms. In these he put two weights, the sequel each of parting and of fight. The latter quick up flew and kicked the beam, which Gabriel spying thus bespake the fiend. Satan, I know thy strength, and thou knowst mine, neither our own but given. What folly, then, to boast what arms can do, since thine no more than heaven permits, nor mine, though doubled now to trample thee as mire. For proof look up, and read thy lot in yon celestial sign where thou art weighed, and shown how light, how weak, if thou resist. The fiend looked up and knew his mounted scale aloft. No more, but fled murmuring, and with him fled the shades of night. Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 16, in which Eve tells Adam of a troublesome dream. Now morn, her rosy steps in the eastern clime advancing, sowed the earth with orient pearl, when Adam waked, so customed, for his sleep was airy light from pure digestion bred and temperate vapours bland, which the only sound of leaves and fuming rills Aurora's fan lightly dispersed, and the shrill matin song of birds on every bough. So much the more his wonder was to find unwakened Eve, with tresses discomposed and glowing cheek as through unquiet rest. He on his side leaning half-raised, with looks of cordial love hung over her enamoured, and beheld beauty, which, whether waking or asleep, shot forth peculiar graces. Then, with voice mild as when Zephyrus on Flora breathes, her hand soft touching, whispered thus, Awake, my fairest, my espoused, my latest found, heaven's last best gift, my ever new delight. Awake, the morning shines, and the fresh field calls us. We lose the prime to mark how spring our tended plants. How blows the citron grove, what drops the myrrh, and what the balmy reed. How nature paints her colours, how the bee sits on the bloom extracting liquid sweet. Such whispering waked her, but with startled eye on Adam, whom embracing, thus she spake. O oh soul, in whom my thoughts find all repose, my glory, my perfection, glad I see thy face, and morn returned. For I this night, such night till this I never passed, have dreamed, if dreamed, not as I often won't, of thee, works of day past, or morrow's next design, but of offence and trouble, which my mind knew never till this irksome night. Methought, close at mine ear, one called me forth to walk, with gentle voice I thought it thine. It said, Why sleep'st thou, Eve? Now is the pleasant time, the cool, the silent, save where silence yields to the night-warbling bird that now awake tunes sweetest his love-laboured song. Now reigns full orb the moon, and with more pleasing light shadowy sets off the face of things, in vain if none regard. Heaven wakes with all his eyes, whom to behold but thee, Nature's desire, in whose sight all things joy with ravishment, attracted by thy beauty still to gaze. I rose, as at thy call, but found thee not. 
To find thee I directed then my walk, and on, methought, alone I passed through ways that brought me on a sudden to the tree of interdicted knowledge. Fair it seemed, much fairer to my fancy than by day, and as I wondering looked, beside it stood one, shaped and winged like one of those from heaven, by us oft seen, his dewy locks distilled ambrosia. On that tree he also gazed, and, O oh, fair plant, said he, with fruit surcharged, deigns none to ease thy load, and taste thy sweet, nor God, nor man, is knowledge so despised, or envy, or what reserve forbids to taste. Forbid who will, none shall from me withhold longer thy offered good. Why else set here? This said, he paused not, but with venturous arm he plucked, he tasted. Me, damp horror, chilled at such bold works, vouched with a deed so bold, and he thus overjoyed. O oh, fruit divine, sweet of thyself, but much more sweet thus cropped. Forbidden, forbidden here, here it, seems, it seems, as, as only, only fit, fit for gods, gods, yet able to make gods of men. And why not gods of men, since good, the more communicated, more abundant grows, the author not impaired, but honoured more. Here, happy creature, fair angelic Eve, partake thou also. Happy as thou art, happy as thou mayst be, worthier canst not be. Taste this, and be henceforth among the gods, thyself a goddess, not to earth confined, but sometimes in the air as we, sometimes ascend to heaven by merit thine, and see what life the gods live there, and such live thou. So saying, he drew nigh. And to me held, even to my mouth, of that same fruit held part which he had plucked. The pleasant, savoury smell so quickened appetite that I, methought, could not but taste. Forthwith, up to the clouds with him I flew, and underneath beheld the earth outstretched immense, a prospect wide and various, wondering at my flight and change to this high exultation. Suddenly my guide was gone, and I, methought, sunk down and fell asleep. But oh, how glad I wait to find this but a dream. Best image of myself and dearer half, Some such resemblances methinks I find Of our last evening's talk in this thy dream, But with additions strange. Yet be not sad. Evil into the mind of God or man may come and go so unapproved and leave no spot or blame behind. Which gives me hope that what in sleep thou didst abhor to dream, waking thou never wilt consent to do. So cheered he his fair spouse, and she was cheered, but silently a gentle tear let fall from either eye and wiped them with her hair. Two other precious drops that ready stood, each in their crystal sluice, he, ere they fell, kissed as the gracious signs of sweet remorse and pious awe that feared to have offended. So all was cleared, and to the field they haste. But first, from under shady arborous roof, soon as they forth were come to open sight of day-spring and the sun, who, scarce uprisen, with wheels yet hovering o'er the ocean brim, shot parallel to the earth his dewy ray, discovering in wide landscape all the east of paradise and Eden's happy plains, lowly they bowed adoring, and began their orisons, each morning duly paid in various style, for neither various style nor holy rapture wanted they to praise their maker. These are thy glorious works, parent of good, almighty, thine this universal frame, thus wondrous fair, thyself how wondrous then, unspeakable, who sits above these heavens to us invisible or dimly seen in these thy lowest works, yet these declare thy goodness beyond thought and power divine, Thou, Son, of this great world, both eye and soul, 
acknowledge him thy greater. Sound his praise in thy eternal course, both when thou climbst, and when high noon has gained, and when thou fallst. Moon, that now meets the Orient sun, now flies to the fixed stars, fixed in their orb that flies, and ye five other wandering fires that move in mystic dance, not without song, resound his praise, who out of darkness called up light. Air, and ye elements the eldest birth of nature's womb, that in quaternion run perpetual circle multiform, and mix and nourish all things, let your ceaseless change vary to our great maker still new praise. Ye mists and exhalations that now rise from hill or steaming lake, dusky or grey, till the sun paint your fleecy skirt with gold, in honour to the world's great author rise, whether to deck with clouds the uncoloured sky, or wet the thirsty earth with falling showers, rising or falling, still advance his praise. His praise, ye winds that from four quarters blow, breathe soft or loud, and wave your tops, ye pines, with every plant in sign of worship wave. Fountains, and ye that warble as ye flow, melodious murmurs, warbling, tune his praise. Join voices, all ye living souls, ye birds that singing up to heaven gate ascend, bear on your wings and in your notes his praise. Ye that in waters glide, and ye that walk the earth and stately tread or lowly creep, witness, if I be silent, morn or even, to hill or valley, fountain or fresh shade made vocal by my song, and taught his praise. Hail, universal Lord, be bounteous still to give us only good, and if the night have gathered aught of evil or concealed, disperse it, as now light dispels the dark. So prayed they, innocent, and to their thoughts firm peace recovered soon, and wonted calm. On to their morning's rural work they haste, among sweet dews and flowers, where any row of fruit trees over woody reached too far their pampered boughs, and needed hands to check fruitless embraces. Or they led the vine to wed her elm. She, spoused, about him twines her marriageable arms, and with her brings her dower, the adopted clusters, to adorn his barren leaves. Then, thus employed, beheld with pity heaven's high king, and to him called Raphael, the sociable spirit, that deigned to travel with Tobias and secured his marriage with the seven times wedded maid. Raphael! Thou hearest what stir on earth, Satan from hell, scaped through the darksome gulf, hath raised in paradise, and how disturbed this night the human pair, how he designs in them at once to ruin all mankind. Go, therefore, half this day as friend with friend, converse with Adam, and such discourse bring on as may advise him of his happy state, Happiness in his power left free to will, left to his own free will, his will, though free yet mutable. Whence warn him to beware he swerve not too secure. Tell him with all his danger, and from whom, what enemy, late fallen himself from heaven, is plotting now the fall of others from like state of bliss. By violence, no. For that shall be withstood. But by deceit and lies, this let him know, lest willfully transgressing he pretend surprisal, unadmonished, unforewarned. So spake the Eternal Father, and fulfilled all justice, nor delayed the winged saint after his charge received, but from among thousand celestial ardours, where he stood veiled with his gorgeous wings, upspringing light flew through the midst of heaven. The angelic choirs on each hand parting, to his speed gave way through all the imperial road, till at the gate of heaven arrived. The gate self-opened wide, on golden hinges turning, as by work divine the sovereign architect had framed. Paradise Lost by John Milton 
Episode 17, in which the Archangel Raphael is entertained by Adam and Eve. God spoke, and Raphael, the winged saint, after his charge received, out from among thousand celestial ardours, where he stood veiled with his gorgeous wings, upspringing light flew through the midst of heaven. The angelic choirs on each hand parting to his speed gave way through all the imperial road till at the gate of heaven arrived. The gate self-opened wide on golden hinges turning, as by work divine the sovereign architect had framed. From hence, no cloud or to obstruct his sight star interposed, however small, he sees, not unconformed to other shining globes, earth and the garden of God, with cedars crowned above all hills. Down thither, prone in flight, he speeds, and through the vast ethereal sky sails between worlds and worlds with steady wing, now on the polar winds, then with quick fan winnows the buxom air, till within soar of towering eagles, to all the fowls he seems a phoenix, gazed by all as that sole bird when, to enshrine his relics in the sun's bright temple, to Egyptian Thebes he flies. At once on the eastern cliff of paradise he lights, and to his proper shape returns, a seraph winged. Six wings he wore to shade his lineaments divine. The pair that clad each shoulder broad came mantling o'er his breast with regal ornament. The middle pair girt like a starry zone his waist, and round skirted his loins and thighs with downy gold and colours dipped in heaven. The third his feet shadowed from either heel with feathered mail, sky-tinctured grain. Like Maya's son he stood and shook his plumes, that heavenly fragrance filled the circuit wide. Him through the spicy forest onward come, Adam discerned, as in the door he sat of his cool bower. And Eve within, due at her hour, prepared for dinner savoury fruits of taste to please true appetite and not disrelish thirst of nectarous draughts between, from milky stream, berry, or grape, to whom thus Adam called. Haste hither, Eve, and worth thy sight behold eastward among those trees, what glorious shape comes this way moving, seems another morn risen on mid-noon. Some great behest from heaven to us perhaps he brings, and will vouchsafe this day to be our guest. But go with speed, and what thy stores contain, bring forth and pour abundance, fit to honour and receive our heavenly stranger. Adam, I'll haste, and from each bough and brake, each plant and juiciest gourd will pluck such choice to entertain our angel guest, as he beholding shall confess that here on earth God hath dispensed his bounties as in heaven. So saying, with dispatchful looks, in haste she turns, on hospitable thoughts intent. What choice to choose for delicacy best? What order, so contrived as not to mix tastes not well joined, inelegant, but bring taste after taste, upheld with kindliest change, bestirs her then? Fruit of all kinds, in coat, rough or smooth rind, or bearded husk, or shell, she gathers, tribute large, and on the board heaps with unsparing hand. For drink, the grape she crushes, inoffensive must, and meads for many a berry, and from sweet kernels pressed she tempers dulcet creams, nor these to hold wants her fit vessels pure, then strews the ground with rose and odours from the shrub unfumed. Meanwhile our primitive great sire, to meet his godlike guest, walks forth and says, Native of heaven, vouchsafe with us two only, who yet by sovereign gift possess this spacious ground, in yonder shady bower to rest, and what the garden choicest bears to sit and taste, till this meridian heat be over, and the sun more cool decline. Adam, I therefore came, nor art thou such created, or such place hast here to dwell, as may not oft invite those spirits of heaven to visit thee. Lead on then where thy bower o'er shades, for these mid-hours till evening rise, I have at will. So to the sylvan lodge they came, that like Pomona's arbour smiled, with flowerets decked and fragrant smells. But Eve, 
undecked, save with herself more lovely fair than wood nymph or the fairest goddess feigned of three that in Mount Ida naked strove, stood to entertain her guest from heaven. No veil she needed, virtue proof, no thought infirm altered her cheek, on whom the angel hail bestowed, the holy salutation used long after to blessed Mary, second Eve. Hail, mother of mankind, whose fruitful womb shall fill the world more numerous with thy sons than with these various fruits the trees of God have heaped this table. Raised of grassy turf their table was, and mossy seats had round, and on her ample square from side to side all autumn piled, though spring and autumn here danced hand in hand. A while discourse they hold, no fear lest dinner cool, when thus began our sire. Heavenly stranger, please to taste these bounties which our nourisher, from whom all perfect good unmeasured out, descends to us for food and for delight hath caused the earth to yield. Unsavory food, perhaps, to spiritual natures. Only this I know, that one celestial father gives to all. And therefore what he gives, whose praise be ever sung, to man in part spiritual, may of purest spirits be found no ingrateful food. And food alike those pure intelligential substances require, as doth your rational, and both contain within them every lower faculty of sense, whereby they hear, see, smell, touch, taste, Tasting, concoct, digest, assimilate, and corporeal to incorporeal turn. For no, whatever was created needs to be sustained and fed. Of elements, the grosser feeds the purer. Earth, the sea. Earth and the sea feed air. The air, those fires ethereal. And, as lowest first, the moon. Meanwhile at table, Eve ministered naked, and their flowing cups with pleasant liquors crowned. O oh, innocence, deserving paradise! If ever, then, then had the sons of God excuse to have been enamoured at that sight. But in those hearts love unlibidinous reigned, nor jealousy was understood, the injured lover's hell. Thus, when with meats and drinks they had sufficed, not burdened nature, sudden mind arose in Adam not to let the occasion pass, given him by this great conference, to know of things above his world, and of their being who dwell in heaven, whose excellence he saw transcend his own so far, whose radiant forms divine effulgence, whose high power so far exceeded human. And his weary speech... Thus to the imperial minister he framed. Inhabitant with God, now know I well thy favour, in this honour done to man, under whose lowly roof thou hast vouchsafed to enter and these earthly fruits to taste, food not of angels, yet accepted so, as that more willingly thou couldst not seem at heaven's high feasts to have fed. Yet what compare? O oh, Adam, one almighty is from whom all things proceed and up to him return, if not depraved from good, created all such to perfection, one first matter all, endued with various forms, various degrees of substance, and in things that live, of life. We differ in degree of kind the same. Your bodies may at last turn all to spirit, improved by tract of time, and winged ascend ethereal as we or may at choice here or in heavenly paradises dwell. If ye be found obedient and retain unalterably firm his love entire whose progeny you are. Meanwhile, enjoy your fill what happiness this happy state can comprehend, incapable of more. O oh, favourable spirit, propitious guest, what meant that caution joined? If ye be found obedient, can we want obedience then to him, or possibly his love desert, who formed us from the dust, and placed us here full to the utmost measure of what bliss human desires can seek or apprehend? Son of heaven and earth, attend. That thou art happy, O to God, that thou continuest such, O to thyself, that is, to thy obedience, therein stand.
This was that caution given thee, Be advised, God made thee perfect, not immutable, and good he made thee. But to persevere, he left it in thy power, ordained thy will by nature free, not overruled by fate, inextricable or strict necessity. Our voluntary service he requires, not our necessitated. Such with him finds no acceptance, nor can find. For how can hearts not free be tried, whether they serve, willing or no, who will but what they must, by destiny, and can no other choose? Myself and all the angelic host that stand in sight of God enthroned, our happy state hold as you yours, while our obedience holds. On other surety none. Freely we serve because we freely love, as in our will to love or not. In this we stand or fall, and some are fallen, to disobedience fallen, and so from heaven to deepest hell, oh, fall from what high state of bliss into what woe. I know we never shall forget to love our Maker, and obey him whose command single is yet so just. My constant thoughts assured me and still assure. Though what thou tell'st hath passed in heaven, some doubt within me move. But more desire to hear, if thou consent, the full relation, which must needs be strange, worthy of sacred silence to be heard. High matter thou enjoinst me, O prime of men, sad task and hard. For how shall I relate to human sense the invisible exploits of warring spirits? How without remorse the ruin of so many glorious once and perfect while they stood? How last unfold the secrets of another world, perhaps not lawful to reveal? Yet for thy good this is dispensed, and what surmounts the reach of human sense I shall delineate so by likening spiritual to corporeal forms, as may express them best, though what if earth be but the shadow of heaven, and things therein, each to other like, more than on earth is thought. As yet, this world was not, and chaos wild reigned where these heavens now roll, where earth now rests upon her center poised. When on a day, for time, though in eternity, applied to motion, measures all things durable by present, past, and future, on such day, as heaven's great year brings forth, the imperial host of angels by imperial summons called innumerable before the Almighty's throne. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 18 In which Raphael tells Adam and Eve how Satan fermented rebellion among the angels But first, how God presented his only son to the host of heaven The Father infinite, by whom in bliss embosomed sat the Son Amidst, as from a flaming mount, whose top brightness had made invisible, thus spake Hear, all ye angels, progeny of light, thrones, dominations, princedoms, virtues, powers. Hear my decree, which unrevoked shall stand. This day I have begot whom I declare my only son, and on this holy hill him have anointed, whom ye now behold at my right hand. Your head I him appoint, and by myself have sworn to him shall bow all knees in heaven, and shall confess him Lord. Under his great vicegerent reign abide united as one individual soul forever happy. Him who disobeys, me disobeys, breaks union, and that day cast out from God and blessed vision, falls into utter darkness, deep engulfed, his place ordained without redemption, without end. 
So spake the Omnipotent, and with his words all seemed well pleased. All seemed, but were not all. That day, as other solemn days, they spent in song and dance about the sacred hill, mystical dance which yonder starry sphere of planets and of fixed in all her wheels resembles nearest mazes intricate, eccentric, intervolved, yet regular then most when most irregular they seem. And in their motions harmony divine so smooths her charming tones that God's own ear listens delighted. Evening now approached, for we have also our evening and our morn, we ours for change delectable not need. Forthwith from dance to sweet repast they turn, desirous, all in circles as they stood, tables are set, and on a sudden piled with angels food, and rubid nectar flows, in pearl, in diamond, and massy gold, fruit of delicious vines, the growth of heaven. On flowers reposed, and with fresh flowerets crowned, they eat, they drink, and in communion sweet quaff immortality and joy, secure of surfeit, where full measure only bounds excess, before the all-bounteous king, who showered with copious hand, rejoicing in their joy. Now when ambrosial night with clouds exhaled from that high mount of God, whence light and shade spring both, the face of brightest heaven had changed to grateful twilight, for night comes not there in darker veil, and roseate dews disposed all but the unsleeping eyes of God to rest. Wide over all the plain, and wider far than all this globus earth in plain outspread, such are the courts of God. The angelic throng dispersed in bands and files, their camp extend by living streams among the trees of life, pavilions numberless, and sudden reared celestial tabernacles, where they slept, fanned with cool winds, save those who in their course melodious hymns about the sovereign throne alternate, all night long. But not so waked Satan, so call him now. His former name is heard no more in heaven. He of the first, if not the first archangel, great in power, in favor and preeminence, yet fraught with envy against the Son of God, that day honoured by his great father, and proclaimed Messiah King, anointed, could not bear through pride that sight, and thought himself impaired. Deep malice thence conceiving and disdain, soon as midnight brought on the dusky hour friendliest to sleep and silence, he resolved with all his legions to dislodge, and leave unworshipped, unobeyed, the throne supreme, contemptuous. And his next subordinate awakening, thus to him in secret spake. Sleep'st thou, companion dear, what sleep can close thy eyelids? And rememberest what decree of yesterday so late hath passed the lips of heaven's almighty? Thou to me thy thoughts wast wont, I mine to thee wast wont to impart. Both waking we were one, how then can now thy sleep descent? New laws thou seest imposed, new laws from him who reigns, new minds may raise in us who serve, new counsels to debate what doubtful may ensue. More in this place to utter is not safe. Assemble thou of all those myriads which we lead, the chief. So spake the false archangel, and infused bad influence into the unwary breast of his associate. He together calls, or several one by one, the regent powers, under him regent. And they all obeyed the wonted signal and superior voice of their great potentate. For great indeed his name, and high was his degree in heaven, his countenance as the morning star that guides the starry flock allured them, and with lies drew after him the third part of heaven's host. Meanwhile, the eternal eye, whose sight discerns abstrusest thoughts from forth his holy mountain, from within the golden lamps that burn nightly before him, saw without their light 
rebellion rising, saw in whom, how spread among the sons of morn, what multitudes were banded to oppose his high decree, and smiling to his only son thus said, Son, thou in whom my glory I behold in full resplendence, heir of all my might, nearly it now concerns us to be sure of our omnipotence, and with what arms we mean to hold what anciently we claim of deity or empire. Such a foe is rising, who intends to erect his throne equal to ours throughout the spacious north, nor so content hath in his thought to try in battle what our power is or our right. Let us advise, and to this hazard draw with speed what force is left, and all employ in our defense, lest unawares we lose this our high place, our sanctuary, our hill. To whom the sun, with calm aspect and clear, lightning divine, ineffable, serene, made answer. Mighty Father, thou thy foes justly hast in derision, and secure lasts at their vain designs and tumults vain. Matter to me of glory whom their hate illustrates, when they see all regal power given me to quell their pride, and in event know whether I be dexterous to subdue thy rebels, or be found the worst in heaven. So spake the sun, but Satan with his powers far was advanced on winged speed an host innumerable as the stars of night or stars of morning, dewdrops which the sun impearls on every leaf and every flower. Regions they passed, the mighty regences of seraphim and potentates and thrones in their triple degrees, regions to which all thy dominion, Adam, is no more than what this garden is to all the earth, and all the sea from one entire globose stretched into longitude, which... Having passed, at length into the limits of the north they came, and Satan to his royal seat high on a hill far blazing, as a mount raised on a mount with pyramids and towers from diamond quarries hewn and rocks of gold, the palace of great Lucifer. Thrones, dominations, princedoms, virtues, powers. If these magnific titles yet remain not merely titular, since by decree another now hath to himself engrossed all power, and us eclipsed under the name of King Anointed, for whom all this haste of midnight march and hurried meeting here. Will ye submit your necks and choose to bend the supple knee? Ye will not, if I trust and know ye right, or if ye know yourselves, natives and sons of heaven, possessed before by none. And if not equal all, yet free, equally free. For orders and degrees jar not with liberty, but well consist. Who can, in reason then, or right, assume monarchy over such as live by right his equals, if in power and splendor less, in freedom equal? Or can introduce law and edict on us, who without law err not, much less for this to be our Lord, and look for adoration to the abuse of those imperial titles which assert our being ordained to govern, not to serve. Thus far his bold discourse without control had audience, when among the seraphim, Abdiel, than whom none with more zeal adored the deity, and divine commands obeyed, stood up, and in a flame of zeal severe, the current of his fury thus opposed. O oh, argument blasphemous, false and proud, words which no ear ever to hear in heaven expected, least of all from thee, ingrate, in place thyself so high above thy peers. Shalt thou give law to God? Shalt thou dispute with him the points of liberty, who made thee what thou art, and formed the powers of heaven, such as he pleased, and circumscribed their being? O oh, alienate from God, O oh, spirit accursed, forsaken of all good! I see thy fall determined, and thy hapless crew involved in this perfidious fraud, contagion spread both of thy crime and punishment. 
Henceforth, no more be troubled how to quit the yoke of God's Messiah. Those indulgent laws will not be now vouchsafed. Other decrees against thee are gone forth without recall. That golden scepter which thou didst reject is now an iron rod to bruise and break thy disobedience. So spake the seraph Abdiel, faithful found, among the faithless, faithful only he, among innumerable false, unmoved, unshaken, unseduced, unterrified, his loyalty he kept, his love, his zeal. Nor number nor example with him wrought to swerve from truth or change his constant mind, though single. From amidst them forth he passed, long way through hostile scorn, which he sustained superior, nor of violence feared aught. And with retorted scorn his back he turned on those proud towers to swift destruction doomed. Paradise Lost by John Milton. Episode 19, in which Raphael continues to relate how Michael and Gabriel were sent to battle against Satan. All night, Abdiel, the dreadless angel unpursued, through heaven's wide champagne held his way, till morn, waked by the circling hours, with rosy hand unbarred the gates of light. When all the plain, covered with thick embattled squadrons bright, chariots and flaming arms and fiery steeds, reflecting blaze on blaze, first met his view. War, he perceived, ready to break, and found already known what he for news had thought to have reported. On to the sacred hill they led him high applauded, and present before the seat supreme, from whence a voice from midst a golden cloud Thus mild was heard. Servant of God, well done. Well hast thou fought the better fight, who single hast maintained against revolted multitudes the cause of truth, in word mightier than they in arms. Go, Michael of celestial armies, prince, and thou in military prowess next, Gabriel, Lead forth to battle these my sons invincible. Lead forth my armed saints by thousands and by millions range for fight, equal in number to that godless crew rebellious. Them with fire and hostile arms fearless assault, and to the brow of heaven pursuing drive them out from God and bliss into their place of punishment, the gulf of Tartarus, which ready opens wide his fiery chaos to receive their fall. So spake the sovereign voice. The clouds began to darken all the hill, and smoke to roll in dusky reeds. Reluctant flames, the sign of wrath awaked. Nor with less dread the loud ethereal trumpet from on high gan blow, at which command the powers militant that stood for heaven in mighty quadrate joined of union irresistible, moved on, indissolubly firm, nor obvious hill, nor straightening vale, nor wood, nor stream divides their perfect ranks, for high above the ground their march was, and the passive air upbore their nimble tread, as when the total kind of birds in orderly array on wing came summoned over Eden to receive their names of thee. So over many a tract of heaven they marched, and many a province wide tenfold the length of this terrene. At last, far in the horizon to the north, appeared the banded powers of Satan, hasting on with furious expedition. For they weaned that selfsame day by fight or by surprise to win the mount of God, and on his throne to set the envy of his state, the proud aspirer, but their thoughts proved fond and vain. High in the midst, exalted as a god, the apostate in his sun-bright chariot sat, idol of majesty divine, enclosed with flaming cherubim and golden shields, then lighted from his gorgeous throne, for now, twixt host and host, but narrow space was left. 
On the rough edge of battle, ere it joined, Satan, with vast and haughty strides advanced, came towering, armed in adamant and gold. Abdiel, that sight endured not, where he stood among the mightiest, bent on highest deeds. Proud art thou met. Thy hope was to have reached the height of thy aspiring unopposed, the throne of God unguarded, and his side abandoned at the terror of thy power or potent tongue. Fool, not to think how vain against the omnipotent to rise in arms, who out of smallest things could without end have raised incessant armies to defeat thy folly or with solitary hand reaching beyond all limit, at one blow unaided could have finished thee, and whelmed thy legions under darkness. Ill for thee, but in wished hour of my revenge first sought for, thou returns from flight, seditious angel, to receive thy merited reward. And well thou comest before thy fellows, ambitious to win from me some plume that thy success may show destruction to the rest. This pause between, unanswered, lest thou boast, to let thee know. At first I thought that liberty and heaven to heavenly souls had been all one. But now I see that most through sloth had rather serve. Ministering spirits trained up in feast and song. Such hast thou armed, the minstrelsy of heaven. Servility with freedom to contend, as both their deeds compared, this day shall prove. Reign now in hell, thy kingdom. Let me serve in heaven, God ever blessed, and his divine behests obey, worthiest to be obeyed. Yet chains in hell, not realms expect. Meanwhile from me returned, as erst thou saidst from flight, this greeting on thy impious crest receive. So saying, a noble stroke he lifted high, which hung not, but so swift with tempest fell on the proud crest of Satan, that no sight nor motion of swift thought, less could his shield such ruin intercept. Ten paces huge he back recoiled. The tenth, on bended knee, his massy spear upstayed, as if on earth winds underground or waters forcing way sidelong had pushed a mountain from his seat, half sunk with all his pines. Amazement seized the rebel thrones, but greater rage to see thus foiled their mightiest. Ours joy-filled and shout, presage of victory and fierce desire of battle, Whereat Michael bid sound the archangel trumpet. Through the vast of heaven it sounded, and the faithful armies rung Hosanna to the highest. Nor stood at gaze the adverse legions, nor less hideous joined the horrid shock. Now storming fury rose, and clamour such as heard in heaven till now was never. Arms on armour, clashing, braid, horrible discord, and the madding wheels of brazen chariots raged. Dire was the noise of conflict. Overhead the dismal hiss of fiery darts in flaming volleys flew, and flying vaulted either host with fire. So under fiery cope together rushed, both battles main, with ruinous assault and inextinguishable rage. All heaven resounded, and had earth been then, all earth had to her centre shook. What wonder, when millions of fierce encountering angels fought on either side, the least of whom could wield these elements and arm him with the force of all their regions. How much more of power, army against army, numberless to raise dreadful combustion warring, and disturb, though not destroy, their happy native seat. Had not the eternal king omnipotent from his stronghold of heaven high overruled and limited their might, though numbered such as each divided legion might have seemed a numerous host, in strength each armed hand a legion, led in fight, yet leader seemed each warrior single as in chief, expert when to advance or stand or turn the sway of battle open when and when to close the ridges of grim war. 
No thought of flight, none of retreat, no unbecoming deed that argued fear. Each on himself relied, as only in his arm the moment lay of victory. Deeds of eternal fame were done, but infinite, for wide was spread that war and various. Sometimes on firm ground a standing fight, then soaring on main wing tormented all the air, all air seemed then conflicting fire. Long time in even scale the battle hung. Till Satan, who that day prodigious power had shown and met in arms no equal, ranging through the dire attack of fighting seraphim confused, at length saw where the sword of Michael smote and felled squadrons at once. With huge two-handed sway, brandished aloft, the horrid edge came down wide wasting. Such destruction to withstand he hasted, and opposed the rocky orb of tenfold adamant, his ample shield of vast circumference. At his approach the great archangel from his warlike toil surceased, and glad, as hoping here to end intestine war in heaven, the arch-foe subdued or captive dragged in chains, with hostile frown and visage all inflamed, first thus began. Author of evil, unknown till thy revolt, unnamed in heaven, now plenteous, as thou seest these acts of hateful strife, hateful to all, though heaviest by just measure on thyself and thy adherence. How hast thou disturbed heaven's blessed peace, and into nature brought misery, uncreated till the crime of thy rebellion? How hast thou instilled thy malice into thousands, once upright and faithful, now proved false? But think not here to trouble holy rest. Heaven cast thee out from all her confines. Heaven, the seat of bliss, brooks not the works of violence and war. Hence then, and evil go with thee along thy offspring to the place of evil hell, thou and thy wicked crew. There mingle broils, ere this avenging sore begin thy doom, or some more sudden vengeance winged from God precipitate thee with augmented pain. Nor think thou with wind of airy threats to all whom yet with deeds thou canst not. Hast thou turned the least of these to flight, or if to fall, but that they rise unvanquished, easier to transact with me than thou shouldst hope, imperious and with threats, to chase me hence? Err not that so shall end the strife which thou caused evil, but we style the strife of glory which we mean to win, or turn this heaven itself into the hell thou fablest, here, however, to dwell free, if not to reign. Meanwhile, thy utmost force, and join him named Almighty to thy aid. I fly not, but have sought thee far and nigh. Paradise Lost by John Milton. Episode 20, in which a fight between the Archangel Michael and Satan is described. They ended pow, and both addressed for fight. Now waved their fiery swords, and in the air made horrid circles. Two broad suns their shields blazed opposite, while expectation stood in horror. From each hand with speed retired where erst was thickest fight the angelic throng, and left large field, unsafe within the wind of such commotion, such as to set forth great things by small. If nature's concord broke among the constellations, war were sprung. Two planets rushing from aspect malign of fiercest opposition in mid-sky should combat, and their jarring spheres confound. Together both with necks to almighty arm, uplifted imminent one stroke they aimed that might determine. But the sword of Michael from the armory of God was given him tempered so 
that neither keen nor solid might resist that edge. It met the sword of Satan with steep force to smite descending, and in half cut sheer, not stayed, but with swift wheel reverse, deep entering, shared all his right side. Then Satan first knew pain, and writhed him to and fro, convolved. So saw the slashing sword with a wide gaping wound passed through him, but the ethereal substance closed not long divisible, and from the gash a stream of nectarous issuing flowed sanguine, such as celestial spirits may bleed, and all his armour stained, erewhile so bright. Forthwith on all sides to his aid was run by angels many and strong, who interposed defence, while others bore him on their shields back to his chariot where it stood retired from off the files of war. There they him laid, gnashing for anguish and despite and shame to find himself not matchless, and his pride humbled by such rebuke, so far beneath his confidence to equal God in power. Yet soon he healed, for spirits that live throughout, vital in every part, not as frail man in entrails, heart or head, liver or reins, cannot but by annihilating die, nor in their liquid texture mortal wound receive, no more than can the fluid air. All heart they live, all head, all eye, all ear, all intellect, all sense, and as they please they limb themselves, and colour, shape, or size assume, as likes them best, condense or rare. Meanwhile, in other parts, like deeds deserved memorial, where the might of Gabriel fought, and with fierce ensigns pierced the deep array of Moloch, furious king who him defied, and at his chariot wheels to drag him bound threatened, nor from the Holy One of Heaven refrained his tongue blasphemous. But anon, down cloven to the waist, with shattered arms and uncouth pain, fled bellowing. On each wing, Uriel and Raphael, his vaunting foe, though huge and in a rock of diamond armed, vanquished Adramelech and Asmodai, two potent thrones that to be less than gods disdained, but meaner thoughts learned in their flight, mangled with ghastly wounds through plate and mail. Nor stood unmindful Abdiel to annoy the atheist crew, but with redoubled blow, Ariel and Arioc, and the violence of Ramiel, scorched and blasted overthrew. I might relate of thousands, and their names eternize here on earth. But those elect angels contented with their fame in heaven seek not the praise of men. The other sort, in might though wondrous, and in acts of war, nor of renown less eager, yet by doom cancelled from heaven and sacred memory, nameless in dark oblivion, let them dwell. And now their mightiest quelled, the battle swerved, with many an inroad gored, deformed rout entered, and foul disorder. All the ground with shivered armour strewn, and on a heap, chariot and charioteer lay overturned, and fiery foaming steeds. What stood, recoiled o'er wearied, through the faint satanic host, defensive scarce, or with pale fear surprised, then first with fear surprised and sense of pain, fled ignominious to such evil brought by sin of disobedience till that hour not liable to fear, or flight, or pain. Far otherwise the inviolable saints in cubic phalanx firm advanced entire, invulnerable, impenetrably armed. Such high advantages their innocence gave them above their foes, not to have sinned, not to have disobeyed. In fight they stood unwearied, unobnoxious to be pained by wound, though from their place by violence moved. Now night her course began, and over heaven inducing darkness, grateful truce imposed, and silence on the odious din of war. Under her cloudy covert both retired, victor and vanquished, 
on the foughten field, Michael and his angels prevalent, encamping, placed in guard their watches round, cherubic waving fires. On the other part, Satan, with his rebellious, disappeared, far in the dark dislodged, and void of rest, his potentates to counsel, called by night, and in the midst thus undismayed began. O oh, now in danger tried, now known in arms not to be overpowered, companions dear, who have sustained one day in doubtful fight, and if one day, why not eternal days, what heaven's Lord had power fullest to send against us from about his throne, and judge sufficient to subdue us to his will, but proves not so. Then fallible, it seems, of future we may deem him, though till now omniscient thought. True is, less firmly armed, some disadvantage we endured and pain. The remedy? Perhaps more valid arms, weapons more violent when next we meet, may serve to better us and worse our foes, or equal what between us may be odds. In nature, none. If other hidden cause left them superior, while well, we can preserve unhurt our minds and understanding sound, due search and consultation will disclose. He sat, and in the assembly next up stood Nisroch of Principalities the Prime. As one he stood escaped from cruel fight, sore toiled, his riven arms to havoc hewn. Deliverer from new lords, leader to free enjoyment of our right as gods, yet hard for gods, and to unequal work we find against unequal arms to fight in pain. Ah, pain is perfect misery, the worst of evils, and excessive overturns all patience. He who therefore can invent with what more forcible we may offend our yet unwounded enemies or arm ourselves with like defense to me deserves no less than for deliverance what we owe. Not uninvented. That which thou aright believe so main to our success I bring. The earth shall yield us dark materials, shall yield us pregnant with infernal flame, which into hollow engines long and round, thick rammed, at the other bore, with touch of fire dilated and infuriate, shall send forth from far, with thundering noise among our foes, such implements of mischief as shall dash to pieces and o'erwhelm whatever stands adverse that they shall fear we have disarmed the thunderer of his only dreaded bolt. He ended, and his words their drooping cheer enlightened, and their languished hope revived. The invention all admired, and each how he to be the inventor missed, so easy it seemed once found, which yet unfound most would have thought impossible. Yet haply of thy race in future days, if malice should abound, someone intent on mischief or inspired with devilish machination might devise like instrument to plague the sons of men for sin, on war and mutual slaughter bent. Forthwith, from counsel to the work they flew. None arguing stood, innumerable hands were ready. In a moment up they turned wide the celestial soil and saw beneath the originals of nature in their crude conception. Sulfurous and nitrous foam they found. They mingled, and with subtle art, concocted and adusted, they reduced to blackest grain and into store conveyed. So all ere day spring, under conscious night, secret they finished, and in order set with silent circumspection unespied. Now when fair morn, orient in heaven appeared, up rose the victor angels, and to arms the matin trumpet sung. In arms they stood of golden panoply, but then, behold, not distant far with heavy pace, the foe approaching, gross and huge, in hollow cube training his devilish enginery, impaled on every side with shadowing squadrons deep to hide the fraud. At interview both stood a while, but suddenly at head appeared Satan, and thus was heard, commanding loud, Vanguard, to right and left, the front, unfold! 
that all may see who hate us how we seek peace and composure and with open breasts stand ready to receive them. So scoffing in ambiguous words he scarce had ended when to right and left the front divided and to either flank retired, which to our eyes discovered new and strange a triple-mounted row of pillars laid on wheels, for like to pillars most they seemed, or hollowed bodies made of oak or fir, with branches lopped, in wood or mountain felled. Brass, iron, stony mould, had not their mouths with hideous orifice gaped on us wide, portending hollow truce. At each behind a seraph stood, and in his hand a reed stood waving, tipped with fire, while we, suspense, collected, stood within our thoughts bemused, not long, for sudden all at once their reeds put forth, and to a narrow vent applied with nicest touch. Immediate in a flame, but soon obscured with smoke, all heaven appeared, from those deep-throated engines belched, whose roar emboweled with outrageous noise the air, and all her entrails tore, disgorging foul their devilish glut, chained thunderbolts and hail of iron globes, which on the victor host levelled with such impetuous fury smote, that whom they hit none on their feet might stand though standing else as rocks, but down they fell by thousands, angel on archangel rolled. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 21 in which God sends his son to drive the rebellious angels out of heaven. Satan beheld their plight, and to his mates, thus in derision, called, O oh, friends, why come not on these victors proud, ere while they fierce were coming? And when we do entertain them fair, with open front and breast, what could we more? Propounded terms of composition, straight they changed their minds, flew off and into strange vagaries fell, as they would dance. Yet for a dance they seemed somewhat extravagant and wild. To whom thus Belial, in like gamesome mood, Leader, the terms we sent were terms of weight, of hard contents, and full of force urged home, such as we might perceive bemused them all, and stumbled many. Who receives them right had need from head to foot well understand, not understood. This gift they have besides, they show us when our foes walk not upright. So they among themselves in pleasant vein all of God's hosts derided while they stood a while in trouble, but they stood not long. Rage prompted them at length, and found them arms against such hellish mischief, fit to oppose. Forthwith, behold the excellence, the power which God hath in his mighty angels placed. Their arms away they threw, and to the hills, light as the lightning glimpse they ran, they flew. From their foundations, loosening to and fro, they plucked the seated hills with all their load, rocks, waters, woods, and by the shaggy tops uplifting, bore them in their hands. Amaze, be sure, and terror seized the rebel host, when coming towards them so dread they saw the bottom of the mountains upward turned, till on those cursed engines triple row they saw them whelmed, and all their confidence under the weight of mountains buried deep. Themselves invaded next, and on their heads main promontories flung, which in the air came shadowing, and oppressed whole legions armed. Their armour helped their harm, crushed in and bruised into their substance pent, which wrought them pain implacable and many a dolorous groan, long struggling underneath, ere they could wind out of such prison. Those spirits of purest light, purest at first now gross by sinning groan. The rest, in imitation to like arms, betook them, and the neighbouring hills uptore, 
So hills amid the air encountered hills, hurled to and fro with jaculation dire, that underground they fought in dismal shade, infernal noise. War seemed a civil game to this uproar. Horrid confusion heaped upon confusion rose, and now all heaven had gone to rack with ruin overspread. Had not the Almighty spoken to his son? Effulgence of my glory, son beloved, second omnipotence, two days are past since Michael and his powers went forth to tame these disobedient. Saw has been their fight, as likely as was, when two such foes met armed. Two days are therefore past, the third is thine. For thee I have ordained it, and thus far have suffered that the glory may be thine of ending this great war, since none but thou can end it. Into thee such virtue and grace immense I have transfused, that all may know in heaven and hell thy power above compare. Go then, thou mightiest in thy father's might, ascend my chariot, Guide the rapid wheels that shake heaven's basis. Bring forth all my war, my bow and thunder, my almighty arms, gird on, and sword upon thy puissant thigh. Pursue these sons of darkness. Drive them out from all heaven's bounds into the utter deep. There let them learn, as likes them, to despise God and Messiah, his anointed king. O Father, O Supreme of heavenly thrones, scepter and power thy giving I assume, and gladly I shall resign when in the end thou shalt be all in all, and I in thee for ever, and in me all whom thou lovest, but whom thou hatest I hate, and can put on thy terrors as I put thy mildness on, image of thee in all things and shall soon, armed with thy might, rid heaven of these rebelled, to their prepared ill mansion driven down to chains of darkness and the undying worm. So said, he o'er his sceptre bowing, rose from the right hand of glory where he sat, and the third sacred morn began to shine, dawning through heaven. Forth rushed with whirlwind sound the chariot of paternal deity, flashing thick flames. Wheel within wheel, undrawn, itself instinct with spirit, but convoyed by four cherubic shapes. Four faces each had, wondrous, as with stars their bodies all and wings were set with eyes, with eyes the wheels of Beryl, and careering fires between. Over their heads a crystal firmament, whereon a sapphire throne inlaid with pure amber and colours of the showery arch. He, in celestial panoply all armed of radiant urim, work divinely wrought, ascended. At his right hand victory sat eagle-winged. Beside him hung his bow and quiver with three-bolted thunder stored, and from about him fierce effusion rolled of smoke and flame and sparkles dire. Attended with ten thousand thousand saints, he onward came, far off his coming shone, and twenty thousand, I their number heard, chariots of God, half on each hand were seen. He, on the wings of cherub, rode sublime on the crystalline sky, in sapphire throne. Illustrious far and wide, but by his own first scene, them unexpected joy surprised, when the great ensign of Messiah blazed aloft by angels born, his sign in heaven, under whose conduct Michael soon reduced his army, circumfused on either wing, under their head embodied all in one. Before him power divine his way prepared. At his command the uprooted hills retired, each to his place. They heard his voice and went obsequious. Heaven his wonted face renewed, and with fresh flowerets hill and valley smiled. This saw his hapless foes, but stood obdured, and to rebellious fight rallied their powers, insensate hope conceiving from despair. In heavenly spirits could such perverseness dwell, but to convince the proud what signs avail, or wonders move the obdurate to relent. 
they hardened more by what might most reclaim. Grieving to see his glory, at the sight took envy, and aspiring to his height, stood re-embattled fierce by force or fraud, weaning to prosper and at length prevail against God and Messiah, or to fall in universal ruin last. And now to final battle drew, disdaining flight or faint retreat, when the great Son of God to all his host on either hand thus spake. Stand still in bright array, ye saints, here stand, ye angels armed, this day from battle rest. Number to this day's work is not ordained, nor multitude. Stand only, and behold God's indignation on these godless poured by me. Not you, but me they have despised, yet envied. Against me is all their rage, because the Father whom in heaven supreme kingdom and power and glory appertains, hath honoured me according to his will. Therefore, to me, their doom he hath assigned. So spake the Son, and into terror changed his countenance, too severe to be beheld and full of wrath bent on his enemies. At once the four spread out their starry wings with dreadful shade contiguous, and the orbs of his fierce chariot rolled, as with the sound of torrent floods or of a numerous host. Full soon among them he arrived, in his right hand grasping ten thousand thunders which he sent before him, such as in their souls infixed plagues. They astonished, all resistance lost, all courage. Down their idle weapons dropped, O'er shields and helms and helmed heads he rode, Of thrones and mighty seraphim prostrate, That wished the mountains now might be again thrown on them As a shelter from his ire. Yet half his strength he put not forth, But checked his thunder in mid-volley, For he meant not to destroy, But root them out of heaven. The overthrown he raised, And as a herd of goats or timorous flock together thronged, drove them before him thunderstruck, pursued with terrors and with furies to the bounds and crystal wall of heaven, which, opening wide, rolled inward, and a spacious gap disclosed into the wasteful deep. The monstrous sight struck them with horror backward, but far worse urged them behind. Headlong themselves they threw down from the verge of heaven, eternal wrath burnt after them to the bottomless pit. Hell heard the insufferable noise. Hell saw heaven ruining from heaven, and would have fled affrighted, but strict fate had cast too deep her dark foundations, and too fast had bound. Nine days they fell. Confounded chaos roared, and felt tenfold confusion in their fall through his wild anarchy, so huge a rout encumbered him with ruin. Hell at last yawning, received them whole, and on them closed. Hell, their fit habitation, fraught with fire unquenchable, the house of woe and pain. Disburdened heaven rejoiced, and soon repaired her mural breach, returning whence it rolled. Sole victor from the expulsion of his foes, Messiah, his triumphal chariot, turned, to meet him all his saints, who silent stood, eyewitnesses of his almighty acts. Thus, measuring things in heaven by things on earth, at thy request, and that thou mayst beware by what is past, to thee I have revealed what might have else to human race been hid, the discord which befell and war in heaven among the angelic powers, and the deep fall of those too high aspiring, who rebelled with Satan. He who envies now thy state, who now is plotting, how he may seduce thee also from obedience. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 22 
in which Raphael relates how God announced his intention to create the world. But first, the poet invokes his heavenly muse, Urania. Descend from heaven, Urania, by that name if rightly thou art called, whose voice divine following, above the Olympian hill I saw, above the flight of Pegasian wing. The meaning, not the name, I call, for thou, nor of the muses nine, nor on the top of old Olympus dwellst, but heavenly born. Before the hills appeared, or fountain flowed, thou with eternal wisdom didst converse, wisdom thy sister, and with her didst play in presence of the Almighty Father, pleased with thy celestial song. Up led by thee, into the heaven of heavens I have presumed, an earthly guest, and drawn imperial air, thy tempering. With like safety guided down, return me to my native element, lest from this flying steed unreined, as once Bellerophon, though from a lower clime, dismounted on the Aelian field, I fall erroneous, there to wander and forlorn. Half yet remains unsung, but narrower bound within the visible diurnal sphere, standing on earth, not wrapped above the pole, more safe I sing, with mortal voice, unchanged to horse or mute, though fallen on evil days, on evil days though fallen, and evil tongues, in darkness and with dangers compassed round, and solitude, yet not alone, while thou visit'st my slumbers nightly, or when morn purples the east. Still govern thou my song, Urania, and fit audience find, though few. But drive far off the barbarous dissonance of Bacchus and his revellers, the race of that wild rout that tore the Thracian bard in Rhodope, where woods and rocks had ears to rapture, till the savage clamour drowned both harp and voice, nor could the muse defend her son. So fail not thou who thee implores, for thou art heavenly, she an empty dream." Say, goddess, what ensued when Raphael, the affable archangel, had forewarned Adam by dire example to beware apostasy, by what befell in heaven to those apostates, lest the like befall in paradise to Adam or his race, charged not to touch the interdicted tree, if they transgress and slight that sole command, so easily obeyed amid the choice of all tastes else to please their appetite, though wandering. He, with his consorted Eve, the story heard, attentive, and was filled with admiration and deep muse to hear of things so high and strange, things to their thoughts so unimaginable as hate in heaven, and war so near the peace of God in bliss, with such confusion. But the evil, soon driven back, redounded as a flood on those from whom it sprung, impossible to mix with blessedness. Whence Adam soon repealed the doubts that in his heart arose, and now led on, yet sinless, with desire to know what nearer might concern him, how this world of heaven and earth conspicuous first began, when and whereof created, for what cause, what within Eden or without was done before his memory, as one whose drought yet scarce allayed still eyes the current stream, whose liquid murmur heard new thirst excites proceeded thus to ask his heavenly guest. Great things, and full of wonder in our ears, far differing from this world, thou hast revealed, divine interpreter, by favour sent down from the Empyrean to forewarn us timely of what might else have been our loss, unknown, which human knowledge could not reach, for which to the infinitely good we owe immortal thanks, and his admonishment receive with solemn purpose to observe immutably his sovereign will, the end of what we are. But since thou hast vouchsafed gently for our instruction to impart things above earthly thought, which yet concerned our knowing, as to highest wisdom seemed, deign to descend now lower, and relate what may no less perhaps avail us known, how first began this heaven which we behold distant so high, with moving fires adorned innumerable, 
And this which yields or fills all space, the ambient air, wide interfused, embracing round this florid earth, what cause moved the Creator in his holy rest through all eternity so late to build in chaos? And the work begun, how soon absolved? If unforbid thou mayst unfold what we, not to explore the secrets, ask of his eternal empire, but the more to magnify his works, the more we know. And the great light of day, yet wants to run much of his race, though steep. Suspense in heaven, held by thy voice, thy potent voice he hears, and longer will delay to hear thee tell his generation. And the rising birth of nature from the unapparent deep. Or if the star of evening and the moon haste to thy audience, night with her will bring silence, and sleep listening to thee will watch, or we can bid his absence till thy song end, and dismiss thee ere the morning shine. Thus Adam his illustrious guest besought, and thus the godlike angel answered mild. This also thy request with caution asked obtain. Though to recount almighty works, what words or tongue of seraph can suffice, or heart of man suffice to comprehend? Yet what thou canst attain, which best may serve to glorify the Maker, and infer thee also happier, shall not be withheld thy hearing. Such commission from above I have received, to answer thy desire of knowledge within bounds. Beyond, abstain to ask, nor let thine own inventions hope things not revealed, which the invisible King, only omniscient, hath suppressed in night, to none communicable in earth or heaven. Enough is left besides to search and know. But knowledge is as food, and needs no less her temperance over appetite, to know in measure what the mind may well contain, oppresses else with surfeit, and soon turns wisdom to folly as nourishment to wind. Know then that after Lucifer from heaven fell with his flaming legions through the deep into his place, and the great sun returned victorious with his saints, the omnipotent eternal Father from his throne beheld their multitude, and to his Son thus spake. At least our envious foe hath failed, who thought all like himself rebellious, by whose aid this inaccessible high strength, the seat of deity supreme, us dispossessed, he trusted to have seized, and into fraud drew many, whom their place knows here no more. Yet far the greater part have kept, I see, their station. Heaven yet populous retains number sufficient to possess her realms, though wide, and this high temple to frequent with ministries due and solemn rites. But lest his heart exalt him in the harm already done to have dispeopled heaven, my damage fondly deemed, I can repair that detriment, if such it be to lose self-lost, and in a moment will create another world out of one man, a race of men innumerable, there to dwell. Not here, till by degrees of merit raised, they open to themselves at length the way up hither, under long obedience tried. And earth be changed to heaven, and heaven to earth, one kingdom, joy and union without end. Meanwhile, Inhabit lax, ye powers of heaven. And thou, my word, begotten son, by thee this I perform. Speak thou, and be it done. My overshadowing spirit and might with thee I send along. Ride forth, and bid the deep within appointed bounds be heaven and earth. Boundless the deep, because I am who fill infinitude nor vacuous the space. Though I uncircumscribe myself retire, and put not forth my goodness, which is free to act or not, necessity and chance approach not me, and what I will is fate. So spake the Almighty, and to what he spake, his word, the filial Godhead, gave effect. Immediate are the acts of God, more swift than time or motion, but to human ears cannot without process of speech be told, so told as earthly notion can receive. 
Great triumph and rejoicing was in heaven when such was heard declared the Almighty's will. Glory they sung to the Most High, good will to future men and in their dwellings peace. Glory to him whose just avenging ire had driven out the ungodly from his sight and the habitations of the just. To him glory and praise whose wisdom had ordained good out of evil to create. Instead of spirits malign, a better race to bring into their vacant room and thence diffuse his good to worlds and ages infinite. So sang the hierarchies. Meanwhile, the sun, on his great expedition, now appeared, girt with omnipotence, with radiance crowned of majesty divine, sapience and love immense, and all his father in him shone. About his chariot numberless were poured cherub and seraph, potentates and thrones and virtues, winged spirits and chariots winged from the armory of God, where stand of old myriads between two brazen mountains lodged against a solemn day, harnessed at hand, celestial equipage. And now came forth, spontaneous, for within them spirit lived, attendant on their Lord. Heaven opened wide her ever-during gates harmonious sound on golden hinges moving to let forth the king of glory in his powerful word and spirit coming to create new worlds. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 23, in which God begins the creation of the world and of its manifold creatures. Silence, ye troubled waves, and thou deep peace. Your discord end, said then the omnific word. Nor stayed, but on the wings of cherubim uplifted, in paternal glory rode far into chaos and the world unborn. For chaos heard his voice. Him all his train followed in bright procession to behold creation and the wonders of his might. Then stayed the fervid wheels, and in his hand he took the golden compasses prepared in God's eternal store to circumscribe this universe and all created things. One foot he centred, and the other turned round through the vast profundity obscure, and said, Thus far extend, thus far thy bounds, this be thy just circumference, O world. Thus God the heaven created, thus the earth, matter unformed and void. Darkness profound covered the abyss, but on the watery calm his brooding wings the Spirit of God outspread, and vital virtue infused, and vital warmth throughout the fluid mass, but downward purge the black Tartarius cold infernal dregs adverse to life. Then founded, then conglobed, like things to like, the rest to several place disparted, and between spun out the air, and earth self-balanced on her centre hung. Let there be light, said God, and forthwith light, ethereal, First of things, quintessence pure sprung from the deep, and from her native east to journey through the airy gloom began, sphered in a radiant cloud, for yet the sun was not. She in a cloudy tabernacle sojourned the while. Thus was the first day, even and morn. Nor passed uncelebrated, nor unsung by the celestial choirs, when orient light, exhaling first from darkness, they beheld. Birthday of heaven and earth, with joy and shout, the hollow universal orb they filled, and touched their golden harps, and hymning praised God and his works. Creator him they sung, both when first evening was and when first morn. Again God said, let there be firmament amid the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, 
expanse of liquid, pure, transparent, elemental air diffused in circuit to the uttermost convex of this great round. Partition firm and sure, the waters underneath from those above dividing. For as earth, so he the world built on circumfluous waters calm, in wide crystalline ocean, and allowed misrule of chaos far removed, lest fierce extremes contiguous might distemper the whole frame. And heaven he named the firmament. So even and morning chorus sung the second day. The earth was formed, but in the womb as yet of waters, embryon immature involved appeared not. Over all the face of earth, main ocean flowed, not idle, but with warm prolific humour softening all her globe, fermented the great mother to conceive, satiate with genial moisture, when God said, Be gathered now, ye waters, under heaven, into one place, and let dry land appear. Immediately the mountains huge appear emergent, and their broad bare backs upheave into the clouds. Their tops ascend the sky, so high as heave the tumid hills, so low down sunk a hollow bottom broad and deep, capacious bed of waters. Thither they hasted with glad precipitance, uprolled as drops on dust conglobing from the dry, part rise in crystal wall or ridge direct for haste. Such flight the great command impressed on the swift floods, as armies at the call of trumpet, for of armies thou hast heard, troop to their standard. So the watery throng, wave rolling after wave, where way they found, if steep, with torrent rapture, if through plain, soft ebbing, nor withstood them rock or hill, but they, or underground, or circuit wide with serpent error wandering, found their way, and on the washy ooze deep channels wore, easy ere God had bid the ground be dry, all but within those banks where rivers now stream and perpetual draw their humid train. The dry land, earth, and the great receptacle of congregated waters he called seas, and saw that it was good, and said, Let the earth put forth the verdant grass, herb yielding seed, and fruit tree yielding fruit after her kind, whose seed is in herself upon the earth. He scarce had said, when the bare earth, till then desert and bare, Unsightly, unadorned, brought forth the tender grass, whose verdure clad her universal face with pleasant green. Then herbs of every leaf that sudden flowered, opening their various colours, and made gay her bosom smelling sweet. And these scarce blown, forth flourished thick the clustering vine, forth crept the swelling gourd, up stood the corny reed embattled in her field. Add the humble shrub, and bush the frizzled hair entwining. Last rose, as in dance the stately trees, And spread their branches hung with copious fruit, Or gemmed their blossoms. With high woods the hills were crowned, With tufts the valleys and each fountain side, With borders long the rivers. That earth now seemed like to heaven, a seat where gods might dwell or wander with delight and love to haunt her sacred shades. Though God had yet not reigned upon the earth, and man to till the ground none was, but from the earth a dewy mist went up and watered all the ground, and each plant of the field, which ere it was in the earth, God made, and every herb before it grew on the green stem. God saw that it was good, so, even and morn recorded the third day. Again the Almighty spake, Let there be light high in the expanse of heaven to divide the day from night, and let them be for signs, for seasons, and for days and circling years, and let them be for lights as I ordain their office in the firmament of heaven to give light on the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, great for their use to man, the greater to have rule by day, the less by night all turn. 
and made the stars and set them in the firmament of heaven to illuminate the earth and rule the day in their vicissitude and rule the night and light from darkness to divide. God saw, surveying his great work, that it was good. Of light, by far the greater part, he took, transplanted from her cloudy shrine and placed in the sun's orb made porous to receive and drink the liquid light, firm to retain her gathered beams, great palace now of light. First in his east the glorious lamp was seen, regent of day, and all the horizon round invested with bright rays, jocund to run his longitude through heaven's high road. The grey dawn and Pleiades before him danced, shedding sweet influence. Less bright the moon, but opposite, in levelled west, was set his mirror, with full face borrowing her light from him, for other light she needed none in that aspect, and still that distance keeps till night. Then in the east her turn she shines, revolved on heaven's great axle, and her reign, with thousand lesser lights, dividual holes, with thousand thousand stars, that then appeared, spangling the hemisphere. Then first adorned with their bright luminaries that set and rose, glad evening and glad morn crowned the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters generate reptile with spawn abundant, living soul, and let fowl fly above the earth with wings displayed on the open firmament of heaven. And God created the great whales, and each soul living, each that crept, which plenteously the water generated by their kinds, and every bird of wing after his kind, and saw that it was good, and blessed them, saying, Be fruitful, multiply, and in the seas and lakes and running streams the waters fill, and let the fowl be multiplied on the earth. Forthwith the sounds and seas, each creek and bay, with fry innumerable swarm, and shoals of fish that with their fins and shining scales glide under the green wave, in skulls that oft bank the mid-sea, part single or with mate graze the seaweed their pasture, and through groves of coral stray, or sporting with quick glance, show to the sun their waved coats dropped with gold, or in their pearly shells at ease attend moist nutriment, or under rocks their food in jointed armour watch. Unsmooth the seal, and bended dolphins play. Part huge of bulk, wallowing unwieldy, enormous in the gate, tempest the ocean. There Leviathan, hugest of living creatures, on the deep stretched like a promontory, sleeps or swims, and seems a moving lane, and at his gills draws in, and at his trunk spouts out a sea. Meanwhile the tepid caves and fens and shores there brood as numerous hatch, from the egg that soon bursting with kindly rupture forth disclose their callow young, but feathered soon and fledge they summed their pens, and soaring the air sublime with clang despise the ground under a cloud in prospect. There the eagle and the stork on cliffs and cedar tops their eyries build. Part loosely wing the region, part more wise in common ranged in figure wedge their way, intelligent of seasons, and set forth their airy caravan, high over seas flying, and over lands with mutual wing easing their flight. So steers the prudent crane her annual voyage, borne on winds. The air floats as they pass, fanned with unnumbered plumes. From branch to branch, the smaller birds, with song, solace the woods, and spread their painted wings till even. Nor then the solemn nightingale ceased warbling, but all night tuned her soft lays. Others, on silver lakes and rivers, bathed their downy breast. The swan, with arched neck between her white wings mantling proudly, rose her state with oary feet. Yet oft they quit the dank, and rising on stiff pennons, tower the mid-aerial sky. Others on ground walked firm. The crested cock whose clarion sounds the silent hours, and the other whose gay train adorns him, coloured with the florid hue of rainbows and starry eyes. The waters thus with fish replenished, and the air with fowl, 
evening and morn solemnized the fifth day. Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 24, in which Raphael concludes his description of God's creation of the world. The waters thus with fish replenished and the air with fowl, evening and morn, solemnized the fifth day. The sixth and of creation last arose with evening harps and matin, when God said, Let the earth bring forth soul living in her kind, cattle and creeping things, and beast of the earth, each in their kind. The earth obeyed, and straight, opening her fertile womb, teemed at a birth in numerous living creatures, perfect forms, limbed and full-grown. Out of the ground uprose, as from his lair, the wild beast where he dwells in forest wild, in thicket, brake or den. Among the trees in pairs they rose, they walked, the cattle in the fields and meadows green, those rare and solitary, these in flocks pasturing at once, and in broad herds upsprung. The grassy clods now carved, now half appeared the tawny lion, pawing to get free his hinder parts. Then springs as broke from bonds, and rampant shakes his brinded mane. The lynx, the leopard, and the tiger, as the mole rising, the crumbled earth above them threw in hillocks. The swift stag from underground bore up his branching head. Scarce from his mould behemoth, biggest born of earth, upheaved his vastness. Fleeced the flocks and bleating rose as plants. Ambiguous between sea and land, the river horse and scaly crocodile. At once came forth whatever creeps the ground, insect or worm. Those waved their limber fans for wings, and smallest lineaments exact in all the liveries decked of summer's pride with spots of gold and purple, azure and green. These, as a line their long dimension drew, streaking the ground with sinuous trace. Not all minims of nature, some of serpent kind, wondrous in length and corpulence, involved their snaky folds and added wings. First crept the parsimonious emmet, provident of future, in small room, large heart enclosed, pattern of just equality perhaps hereafter, joined in her popular tribes of commonalty. Swarming next appeared the female bee that feeds her husband drone deliciously and builds her waxen cells with honey stored. The rest are numberless, and thou their natures know'st, and gavest them names needless to thee repeated. Nor unknown the serpent, subtlest beast of all the field, of huge extent sometimes, with brazen eyes and hairy mane terrific, though to thee not noxious, but obedient at thy call. Now heaven in all her glory shone, and rolled her motions as the great first mover's hand first wheeled their course. Earth in her rich attire consummate, lovely smiled, air, water, earth, by foul fish, beast, was flown, was swum, was walked, frequent. And of the sixth day yet remained. There wanted yet the master work, the end of all yet done. A creature who not prone and brute as other creatures, but endued with sanctity of reason, might erect his stature, and upright, with front serene, govern the rest, self-knowing, and from thence magnanimous to correspond with heaven, but grateful to acknowledge whence his good descends. Thither with heart and voice and eyes directed in devotion to adore and worship God supreme, who made him chief of all his works. Therefore the omnipotent eternal Father, for where is not he present, thus to his Son audibly spake. Let us make now man in our image, man in our similitude, and let them rule over the fish and fowl of sea and air, beast of the field, and over all the earth, 
and every creeping thing that creeps the ground. This said, he formed thee, Adam, thee, O man, dust of the ground, and in thy nostrils breathed the breath of life. In his own image he created thee, in the image of God express, and thou becamest a living soul. Male he created thee, but thy consort female for race. Then blessed mankind, and said, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, subdue it, and throughout dominion hold over fish of the sea, and fowl of the air, and every living thing that moves on the earth. Wherever thus created, for no place is yet distinct by name, thence, as thou knowst, he brought thee into this delicious grove, this garden, planted with the trees of God, delectable both to behold and taste, and freely all their pleasant fruit for food gave thee. All sorts are here that all the earth yields, variety without end. But of the tree which, tasted, works knowledge of good and evil, thou mayst not. In the day thou eatst, thou diest. Death is the penalty imposed. Beware, and govern well thy appetite, lest sin surprise thee, and her black attendant, death. Here finished he, and all that he had made, viewed, and behold, all was entirely good. So even and morn accomplished the sixth day. Yet not till the Creator from his work desisting, though unwearied, up returned, up to the heaven of heavens his high abode, thence to behold this new created world, the addition of his empire, how it showed in prospect from his throne, how good, how fair, answering his great idea. Up he rode, followed with acclamation and the sound symphonious of ten thousand harps that tuned angelic harmonies, the earth, the air resounded, thou rememberedst, for thou heardst. The heavens and all the constellations rung, the planets in their station listening stood, while the bright pomp ascended jubilant. Open, open, open ye everlasting gates, open ye heavens your living doors. Let in the great creator from his work returned magnificent, his six days work a world open, and henceforth oft, for God will deign to visit oft the dwellings of just men delighted, and with frequent intercourse thither will send his winged messengers on errands of supernal grace. So sung the glorious train ascending. He through heaven that opened wide her blazing portals led to God's eternal house direct the way, a broad and ample road whose dust is gold and pavement stars, as stars to thee appear, seen in the galaxy, that milky way which nightly as a circling zone thou seest, powdered with stars. And now on earth the seventh evening arose in Eden, for the sun was set, and twilight from the east came on, forerunning night, when at the holy mount of heaven's high-seated top the imperial throne of Godhead, fixed for ever firm and sure, the filial power arrived, and sat him down with his great father, for he also went invisible, yet stayed, such privilege hath omnipresence, and the work ordained, author and end of all things. And from work now resting, blessed and hallowed the seventh day, as resting on that day from all his work, but not in silence wholly kept, the harp had work and rested not, the solemn pipe and dulcimer, all organs of sweet stop, all sounds on fret by string or golden wire tempered soft tunings, intermixed with voice, choral or unison, of incense clouds fuming from golden censers hid the mount. Creation and the six days' acts they sung. Great are thy works, Jehovah, Infinite thy power, what thought can measure thee, or tongue relate thee, greater now in thy return than from the giant angels, 
Thee that day thy thunders magnified. But to create is greater than created to destroy. Who can impair thee, mighty king, or bound thy empire? Easily the proud attempt of spirits apostate and their counsels vain thou hast repelled, while impiously they thought thee to diminish and from thee withdraw the number of thy worshippers. Who seeks to lessen thee against his purpose serves to manifest the more thy might. His evil thou usest, and from thence createst more good. Witness this new-made world, another heaven from heaven gate not far, founded in view on the clear higher line, the glassy sea. Of amplitude almost immense, with stars numerous, and every star perhaps a world of destined habitation. But thou knowest their seasons, among these the seat of men, earth with her nether ocean circumfused, their pleasant dwelling place. Thrice happy men and sons of men, whom God hath thus advanced, created in his image there to dwell and worship him. And in reward to rule over his works, on earth, in sea or air, and multiply a race of worshippers, holy and just. Thrice happy if they know their happiness and persevere upright. So sung they, and the Empyrean rung with hallelujahs. Thus was Sabbath kept. And thy request think now fulfilled, that asked how first this world and face of things began, and what, before thy memory, was done from the beginning, that posterity informed by thee might know. If else thou seekst aught, not surpassing human measure, say, Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 25, in which Raphael responds to Adam's questions about the solar system. The angel ended, and in Adam's ear so charming left his voice that he a while thought him still speaking, still stood fixed to hear. Then, as new waked, thus gratefully replied, What thanks sufficient! Or what recompense equal have I to render thee, divine historian, who thus largely has allayed the thirst I had of knowledge, and vouchsafed this friendly condescension to relate things else by me unsearchable, now heard with wonder, but delight, and, as is due, with glory attributed to the high Creator. Something yet of doubt remains, which only thy solution can resolve. When I behold this goodly frame, this world of heaven and earth consisting, and compute their magnitudes, this earth, a spot, a grain, an atom, with the firmament compared and all her numbered stars, that seem to roll spaces incomprehensible, for such their distance argues and their swift return diurnal, merely to supply the light round this opacous earth, this punctual spot, one day and night. In all their vast survey, useless besides, reasoning I oft admire, how nature, wise and frugal, could commit such disproportions, with superfluous hands so many nobler bodies to create, greater so manifold to this one use, for aught appears, and on their orbs impose such restless revolution, day by day repeated, while the sedentary earth, that better might with far less compass move, served by more noble than herself, attains her end without least motion, and receives as tribute such a sumless journey brought of incorporeal speed, her warmth and light. Speed, to describe whose swiftness, number fails. So spake our sire, and by his countenance seemed entering on studious thoughts abstruse, which Eve, perceiving where she sat retired in sight, with lowliness majestic from her seat, and grace that one who saw to wish her stay, rose, and went forth among her fruits and flowers to visit how they prospered, bud and bloom, her nursery. They at her coming sprung, and touched by her fair tendance gladly agrew. Yet when she not, as not with such discourse delighted, 
or not capable her ear of what was high. Such pleasure she reserved Adam relating, she sole auditress. Her husband, the relator, she preferred before the angel, and of him to ask chose rather. He, she knew, would intermix grateful digressions, and solve high dispute with conjugal caresses. From his lip not words alone pleased her. Oh, when meet now such pairs in love and mutual honour joined! With goddess-like demeanour forth she went, not unattended, for on her as queen a pomp of winning graces waited still, and from about her shot darts of desire into all eyes, to wish her still in sight. And Raphael now, to Adam's doubt proposed, benevolent and facile, thus replied, to ask or search, I blame thee not, for heaven is as the book of God before thee set, wherein to read his wondrous works, and learn his seasons, hours, or days, or months, or years. This to attain, whether heaven move or earth, imports not, if thou reckon right. The rest, from man or angel, the great architect did wisely to conceal, and not divulge his secrets to be scanned by them who ought rather admire. Or, if they list to try conjecture, he his fabric of the heavens hath left to their disputes. Perhaps to move his laughter at their quaint opinions wide hereafter, when they come to model heaven and calculate the stars, how they will wield the mighty frame, how build, unbuild, contrive, solve great problems, how gird the sphere with centric and eccentric, scribbled o'er, cycle and epicycle, orb in orb. Already by thy reasoning this I guess, who art to lead thy offspring, and supposest that bodies bright and greater should not serve the less not bright, nor heaven such journeys run, earth sitting still, when she alone receives the benefit. Consider first that great or bright infers not excellence, the earth, though in comparison of heaven so small, nor glistering, may of solid good contain more plenty than the sun that barren shines, whose virtue on itself works no effect but in the fruitful earth. There first received his beams, unactive else their vigour find. Yet not to earth are those bright luminaries officious, but to thee, earth's habitant, and for the heaven's wide circuit, let it speak the Maker's high magnificence, who built so spacious, and his line stretched out so far, that man may know he dwells not in his own, an edifice too large for him to fill, lodged in a small partition, and the rest ordained for uses to his Lord best known. The swiftness of those circles Attribute, though numberless, to his omnipotence, that to corporeal substances could add speed almost spiritual. Me thou think'st not slow, who, since the morning hour, set out from heaven where God resides, and ere midday arrived in Eden, distance inexpressible by numbers that have name. But this I urge, admitting motion in the heavens, to show invalid, that which thee to doubt it moved. Not that I so affirm, though so it seem to thee who hast thy dwelling here on earth. God, to remove his ways from human sense, placed heaven from earth so far that earthly sight, if it presume, might err in things too high and no advantage gain. What if the sun be centre to the world, and other stars, by his attractive virtue and their own incited, dance about him various rounds? Their wandering course, now high, now low, then hid, progressive, retrograde, or standing still, in six thou seest, and what if seventh to these, the planet Earth, so steadfast though she seem, insensibly three different motions move? which else to several spheres thou must ascribe, moved contrary with thwart obliquities, or save the sun his labour and that swift nocturnal and diurnal romb supposed, invisible else above all stars, the wheel of day and night, which 
needs not thy belief if earth industrious of herself fetch day travelling east and with her part averse from the sun's beam meet night her other part still luminous by his ray what if that light sent from her through the wide transpicuous air to the terrestrial moon be as a star enlightening her by day as she by night this earth reciprocal if land be there fields and inhabitants her spots thou seest as clouds and clouds may rain and rain produce fruits in her softened soil for some to eat allotted there and other suns perhaps with their attendant moons thou wilt descry communication male and female light which two great sexes animate the world stored in each orb perhaps with some that live for such vast room in nature unpossessed by living soul desert and desolate only to shine yet scarce to contribute each orb a glimpse of light conveyed so far down to this habitable which returns light back to them is obvious to dispute but whether thus these things or whether not whether the sun predominant in heaven rise on the earth or earth rise on the sun he from the east his flaming road begin or she from west her silent course advance with an unstumbling pace that spinning sleeps on her soft axle while she paces even and bears thee soft with the smooth air along solicit not thy thoughts with matters hid leave them to god above him serve and fear of other creatures as him pleases best wherever placed let him dispose joy thou in what he gives to thee this paradise and thy fair eve heaven is for thee too high to know what passes there be lowly wise think only what concerns thee and thy being dream not of other worlds what creatures there live in what state condition or degree contented that thus far hath been revealed not of earth only but of highest heaven to whom thus adam cleared of doubt replied how fully hast thou satisfied me pure intelligence of heaven angel serene and freed from intricacies taught to live the easiest way nor with perplexing thoughts to interrupt the sweet of life from which god hath bid dwell far off all anxious cares and not molest us unless we ourselves seek them with wandering thoughts and notions vain but apt the mind or fancy is to rove unchecked and of her roving is no end till warned or by experience taught she learn that not to know at large of things remote from use obscure and subtle but to know that which before us lies in daily life is the prime wisdom what is more is fume or emptiness or fond impertinence and renders us in things that most concern unpractised unprepared and still to seek therefore from this high pitch let us descend a lower flight and speak of things at hand useful which haply mention may arise of something not unseasonable to ask by sufferance and thy wanted favour deigned thee i have heard relating what was done ere my remembrance now hear me relate my story which perhaps thou hast not heard and day is yet not spent till then thou seest how subtly to detain thee i devise inviting thee to hear while i relate fond were it not in hope of thy reply for while i sit with thee i seem in heaven and sweeter thy discourse is to my ear than fruits of palm tree pleasantest to thirst and hunger both from labour at the hour of sweet repast they satiate and soon fill though pleasant but thy words with grace divine imbued bring to their sweetness no satiety paradise lost by john milton episode 26 in which raphael welcomes adam's offer to tell his own story nor are thy lips ungraceful sire of men nor tongue ineloquent for god on thee abundantly his gifts hath also poured inward and outward both his image fair 
Speaking or mute, all comeliness and grace attends thee, and each word, each motion forms. Nor less think we in heaven of thee on earth than of our fellow servant, and inquire gladly into the ways of God with man. For God, we see, hath honoured thee, and set on man his equal love. Say therefore on. For I that day was absent, as befell, bound on a voyage uncouth and obscure, far on excursion towards the gates of hell. But thy relation now, for I attend, pleased with thy words no less than thou with mine. For man to tell how human life began is hard, for who, himself beginning, knew? Desire with thee still longer to converse induced me. As new waked from sounder sleep, soft on the flowery herb, I found me laid in balmy sweat, which with his beams the sun soon dried, and on the reeking moisture fed. Straight toward heaven my wandering eyes I turned, and gazed a while the ample sky, till raised by quick instinctive motion up I sprung, as thitherward endeavouring, and upright stood on my feet. About me round I saw, hill, dale, and shady woods, and sunny plains, and liquid laps of murmuring streams. By these, creatures that lived and moved and walked or flew, birds on the branches warbling, all things smiled, with fragrance and with joy my heart o'erflowed. Myself I then perused, and limb by limb surveyed, and sometimes went and sometimes ran with supple joints as lively vigour led. But who I was, or where, or from what cause, knew not. To speak I tried, and forthwith spake. My tongue obeyed and readily could name whate'er I saw. Thou sun, said I, fair light, and thou enlightened earth so fresh and gay, ye hills and dales, ye rivers, woods, and plains, and ye that live and move, fair creatures, tell, tell, if ye saw, how came I thus, how here? Not of myself, by some great maker, then, in goodness and in power preeminent. Tell me, how may I know him, how adore, from whom I have, that thus I move and live, and feel that I am happier than I know? While thus I called and strayed, I knew not whither, from where I first drew air, and first beheld this happy light, when answer none returned, on a green shady bank profuse of flowers, pensive I sat me down. There gentle sleep first found me, and with soft oppression seized my drowsed sense, untroubled, though I thought I then was passing to my former state, insensible, and forthwith to dissolve when suddenly stood at my head a dream, whose inward apparition gently moved my fancy to believe I yet had being and lived. One came, methought, of shape divine, and said, Thy mansion wants thee, Adam, rise, first man, of men innumerable ordained first father. Called by thee, I come thy guide to the garden of bliss, thy seat prepared. So saying, by the hand he took me raised, and over fields and waters, as in air, smooth sliding without step, last led me up a woody mountain, whose high top was plain, a circuit wide, enclosed with goodliest trees planted, with walks and browers, that what I saw loaden with fairest fruit, that hung to the eye tempting, stirred in me sudden appetite to pluck and eat. Whereat I waked, and found before mine eyes all real as the dream had lively shadowed. Here had new begun my wandering, had not he who was my guide up hither from among the trees appeared, presence divine, rejoicing, but with awe in adoration at his feet I fell submiss. He reared me, and whom thou soughtest I am, said mildly, Author of all this thou seest above, or round about thee, or beneath. This paradise I give thee, count it thine to till and keep, and of the fruit to eat. Of every tree that in the garden grows, eat freely with glad heart. Fear here no dearth. But of the tree whose operation brings knowledge of good and ill, 
which I have set the pledge of thy obedience and thy faith amid the garden by the tree of life, remember what I warn thee, shun to taste, and shun the bitter consequence. For know the day thou eatest thereof, my sole command transgressed, inevitably thou shalt die. From that day mortal, and this happy state shalt lose, expelled from hence into a world of woe and sorrow. Sternly he pronounced the rigid interdiction, which resounds yet dreadful in mine ear, though in my choice not to incur. But soon his clear aspect returned, and gracious purpose thus renewed. Not only these fair bounds, but all the earth to thee and to thy race I give, as lords possess it, and all things that therein live, all live in sea or air, beast, fish, and fowl, in sign whereof each bird and beast behold after their kinds. I bring them to receive from thee their names, and pay thee fealty with low subjection. Understand the same of fish within their watery residence, not hither summoned, since they cannot change their element to draw the thinner air. As thus he spake, each bird and beast behold approaching two and two, these cowering low with blandishment, each bird stooped on his wing. I named them as they passed, and understood their nature. With such knowledge God endued my sudden apprehension. But in these I found not what methought I wanted still, and to the heavenly vision thus presumed. O oh, by what name, for thou above all these, above mankind, or aught than mankind heighter, surpassest far my naming. How may I adore thee, author of this universe, and all this good to man, for whose well-being so amply and with hands so liberal thou hast provided all things? But with me I see not who partakes. In solitude, what happiness? Who can enjoy alone, or all enjoying what contentment find? Thus I, presumptuous, and the vision bright, as with a smile more brightened, thus replied, What call'st thou solitude? Is not the earth with various living creatures and the air replenished, and all these at thy command to come and play before thee? Know'st thou not their language and their ways? They also know, and reason not contentably. With these find pastime and bear rule. Thy realm is large. So spake the universal Lord, and seemed so ordering. I, with leave of speech, implored, and humble deprecation thus replied, Let not my words offend thee, heavenly power, my maker. Be propitious while I speak. Hast thou not made me here deputy, and these inferior far beneath me set? Among unequals, what society can sort, what harmony or true delight, which must be mutual, in proportion due given and received? But in disparity, the one intense, the other still remiss, cannot well suit with either, but soon prove tedious alike. Of fellowship I speak, such as I seek, fit to participate all rational delight, wherein the brute cannot be human consort. They rejoice each with their kind, lion with lioness. So fitly them in pairs thou hast combined, much less can bird with beast or fish with fowl so well converse, nor with the ox, the ape. Whereto the Almighty answered, not displeased. A nice and subtle happiness I see thou to thyself proposest. In the choice of thy associates, Adam, and will taste no pleasure, though in pleasure, solitary. What thinkst thou then of me in this my state? Seem I to thee sufficiently possessed of happiness, or not? Who am alone from all eternity? For none I know second to me or like, equal much less. How have I then with whom to hold converse? save with the creatures which I made, and those to me inferior, infinite descents beneath what other creatures are to thee. He ceased. I lowly answered, To attain the height and depth of thy eternal ways, all human thoughts come short, supreme of things. 
thou in thyself art perfect, and in thee is no deficience found. Not so is man, but in degree, the cause of his desire by conversation with his like to help or solace his defects. No need that thou shouldst propagate, already infinite, and through all numbers absolute, though one. But man by number is to manifest his single imperfection and beget like of his like, his image multiplied, in unity defective, which requires collateral love and dearest amity. Thou, in thy secrecy, although alone, best with thyself accompanied, seeks not social communication, yet so pleased, canst raise thy creature to what height thou wilt of union or communion deified. I, by conversing, cannot these erect from prone, nor in their ways complacence find. Thus I, emboldened, spake, the freedom used permissive and acceptance found, which gained this answer from the gracious voice divine. Thus far to try thee, Adam, I was pleased, and find thee knowing not of beasts alone, which thou hast rightly named, but of thyself expressing well the spirit within thee free, my image, not imparted to the brute, whose fellowship therefore unmeet for thee, good reason was thou freely shouldst dislike, and be so minded still. I, ere thou spakest, knew it not good for man to be alone, and no such company as then thou sawst intended thee, for trial only brought to see how thou couldst judge of fit and meet. What next I bring shall please thee, be assured, thy likeness, thy fit help, thy other self, thy wish, exactly to thy heart's desire. Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 27, in which Adam tells how Eve was created and discusses the nature of love with Raphael. My earthly, by his heavenly, overpowered, which it had long stood under, strained to the height in that celestial colloquy sublime, as with an object that excels the sense, dazzled and spent, sunk down and sought repair of sleep, which instantly fell on me, called by nature as an aid, and closed mine eyes. Mine eyes he closed, but open left the cell of fancy, my internal sight, by which abstract as in a trance methought I saw, though sleeping where I lay, and saw the shape still glorious before whom awake I stood, who stooping opened my left side, and took from thence a rib, with cordial spirits warm and life-blood streaming fresh. Wide was the wound, but suddenly with flesh filled up and healed. The rib he formed and fashioned with his hands. Under his forming hands a creature grew, man-like but different sex, so lovely, fair, that what seemed fair in all the world seemed now mean, or in her summed up, in her contained and in her looks, which from that time infused sweetness into my heart, unfelt before, and into all things from her air inspired the spirit of love and amorous delight. She disappeared and left me dark. I waked to find her or forever to deplore her loss and other pleasures all abjure. When out of hope, behold her, not far off, such as I saw her in my dream, adorned with what all earth or heaven could bestow to make her amiable. On she came, led by her heavenly maker, though unseen, and guided by his voice, nor uninformed of nuptial sanctity and marriage rites. Grace was in all her steps, heaven in her eye, in every gesture, dignity and love. I, overjoyed, could not forbear aloud, this turn hath made amends. Thou hast fulfilled thy words, creator, bounteous and benign, giver of all things fair, but fairest this of all thy gifts. 
nor enviest. I now see bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, myself before me. Woman is her name, of man extracted. For this cause he shall forgo father and mother, and to his wife adhere. And they shall be one flesh, one heart, one soul. She heard me thus, and though divinely brought, yet innocence and virgin modesty, her virtue and the conscience of her worth, that would be wooed and not unsought be won, not obvious, not obtrusive, but retired, the more desirable, or to say all, nature herself, though pure of sinful thought, wrought in her so that seeing me, she turned. I followed her, she what was honour knew, and with obsequious majesty approved my pleaded reason. To the nuptial bower I led her, blushing like the morn. All heaven and happy constellations on that hour shed their selectest influence. The earth gave sign of gratulation, and each hill, joyous the birds. Fresh gales and gentle airs whispered it to the woods, and from their wings flung rose, flung odors from the spicy shrub, disporting, till the amorous bird of night sung spousal and bid haste the evening star on his hilltop to light the bridal lamp. Thus I have told thee all my state, and brought my story to the sum of earthly bliss which I enjoy, and must confess to find in all things else delight indeed, but such as used or not works in the mind no change, nor vehement desire, these delicacies, I mean, of taste, sight, smell, herbs, fruits and flowers, walks and the melody of birds. But here, far otherwise, transported I behold, transported touch. Here, passion first I felt, commotion strange, in all enjoyments else superior and unmoved, here only weak against the charm of beauty's powerful glance. Or nature failed in me, and left some part not proof enough such object to sustain, or from my side subducting took perhaps more than enough, at least on her bestowed too much of ornament, in outward show elaborate, of inward less exact. For well I understand in the prime end of nature her the inferior, in the mind and inward faculties, which most excel, in outward also her resembling less his image, who made both, and less expressing the character of that dominion given o'er other creatures. Yet when I approach her loveliness, so absolute she seems, and in herself complete, so well to know her own, that what she wills to do or say seems wisest, virtuousest, discreetest, best. All higher knowledge in her presence falls degraded. Wisdom in discourse with her loses discountenance and like folly shows. Authority and reason on her weight, as one intended first, not after made occasionally. And to consum it all, greatness of mind and nobleness their seat build in her loveliest and create an awe about her as a guard angelic placed. Accuse not nature, she hath done her part. Do thou but thine, and be not diffident of wisdom. She deserts thee not, if thou dismiss not her, when most thou needst her nigh, by attributing overmuch to things less excellent as thou thyself perceivest. For what admirest thou? What transports thee so? An outside fair no doubt and worthy well thy cherishing thy honouring and thy love not thy subjection weigh with her thyself then value oft times nothing profits more than self-esteem grounded on just and right well managed of that skill the more thou know'st the more she will acknowledge thee her head and to realities yield all her shows made so adorn for thy delight the more so awful that with honour thou mayst love thy mate, who sees when thou art seen least wise. But if the sense of touch whereby mankind is propagated seems such dear delight beyond all other, 
think the same vouchsafe to cattle and each beast, which would not be to them made common and divulged, if aught therein enjoyed were worthy to subdue the soul of man, or passion in him move. What higher in her society thou find'st, attractive, human, rational, love still? In loving thou dost well, in passion not, wherein true love consists not. Love refines the thoughts, and heart enlarges, hath his seat in reason, and is judicious, is the scale by which to heavenly love thou mayst ascend, not sunk in carnal pleasure, for which cause among the beasts no mate for thee was found. Neither her outside formed so fair, nor aught in procreation common to all kinds, though higher of the genial bed by far, and with mysterious reverence I deem, so much delights me as those graceful acts, those thousand decencies that daily flow from all her words and actions, mixed with love and sweet compliance, which declare unfeigned union of mind, or in us both one soul. Harmony to behold in wedded pair, more grateful than harmonious sound to the ear. Yet these subject not, I to thee disclose what inward thence I feel, not therefore foiled, who meet with various objects from the sense variously representing, yet still free approve the best, and follow what I approve. To love thou blamest me not, for love thou sayest leads up to heaven, is both the way and guide. Bear with me then, if lawful what I ask. Love not the heavenly spirits, and how their love express they? By looks only, or do they mix irradiance, virtual, or immediate touch? To whom the angel with a smile that glowed celestial rosy red, love's proper hue, answered, Let it suffice thee that thou knowst us happy, and without love no happiness. Whatever pure thou in the body enjoyst, and pure thou wert created, we enjoy in eminence, and obstacle find none of membrane, joint, or limb, exclusive bars. Easier than air with air, if spirits embrace, total they mix, union of pure with pure desiring, nor restrain conveyance need as flesh to mix with flesh, or soul with soul. But I can now no more. The parting sun beyond the earth's green cape and verdant isles Hesperian sets my signal to depart. Be strong, live happy, and love. But first of all, him whom to love is to obey and keep his great command. Take heed lest passion sway thy judgment to do aught which else free will would not admit. Thine and of all thy sons the weal or woe in thee is placed. Beware. I in thy persevering shall rejoice, and all the blessed. Stand fast. To stand or fall, free to thine own arbitrament it lies. Perfect within, no outward aid require, and all temptation to transgress, repel. So saying, he arose, whom Adam thus followed with benediction. Since to part, go, heavenly guest, ethereal messenger, sent from whose sovereign goodness I adore. Gentle to me and affable hath been thy condescension, and shall be honoured ever with grateful memory. Thou to mankind be good and friendly still, and oft return. So parted they, the angel up to heaven from the thick shade, and Adam to his bower. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 28, in which Satan returns to Eden and enters the body of the sleeping serpent. The sun was sunk, 
and after him the star of Hesperus, whose office is to bring twilight upon the earth, short arbiter twixt day and night. And now, from end to end, night's hemisphere had veiled the horizon round, when Satan, who late fled before the threats of Gabriel out of Eden, now improved in meditated fraud and malice, bent on man's destruction, maugre what might hap of heavier on himself, fearless returned. The space of seven continued nights he rode with darkness. Thrice the equinoctial line he circled, four times crossed the car of night from pole to pole, traversing each collure. On the eighth returned, and on the coast, averse from entrance or cherubic watch, by stealth found unsuspected way. There was a place, now not, though sin, not time, first wrought the change, where Tigris at the foot of paradise into a gulf shot underground, till part rose up a fountain by the tree of life, in with the river sunk, and with it rose Satan, involved in rising mist, then sought where to lie hid. Thus the whole orb he roamed with narrow search, and with inspection deep considered every creature, which of all most opportune might serve his wiles, and found the serpent, subtlest beast of all the field. Him, after long debate, irresolute of thoughts revolved, his final sentence chose fit vessel, fittest imp of fraud, in whom to enter, and his dark suggestions hide from sharpest sight. For in the wily snake, whatever slights, none would suspicious mark, as from his wit and native subtlety proceeding, which in other beasts observed, doubt might beget of diabolic power active within, beyond the sense of brute. Thus he resolved. But first from inward grief his bursting passion into plaints thus poured. O oh, earth, how like to heaven, if not preferred more justly, seat worthier of gods, as built with second thoughts, reforming what was old. With what delight could I have walked thee round, if I could joy in aught? Sweet interchange of hill and valley, rivers, woods and plains, now land, now sea, and shores with forest crowned, rocks, dens and caves, but I in none of these find place or refuge. And the more I see pleasures about me, so much more I feel torment within me, so much more I see of contraries. All good to me becomes bane, and in heaven much worse would be my state. But neither here seek I, no, nor in heaven to dwell, unless by mastering heaven supreme. Nor hope to be myself less miserable by what I seek, but others to make such as I, though thereby worse to me redound, for only in destroying I find ease to my relentless thoughts, and him destroyed, or one to what may work his utter loss, for whom all this was made, all this will soon follow, as to him linked in weal or woe. In woe, then, that destruction wide may range, this creature man he made, and for him built magnificent this world, and earth his seat, him Lord pronounced, and, oh, indignity, subjected to his service angel wings, and flaming ministers to watch and tend their earthy charge. Of these the vigilance I dread, and to elude, Thus, wrapped in mist of midnight vapour, glide obscure, and pry in every bush and brake, where hap may find the serpent sleeping, in whose mazy folds to hide me and the dark intent I bring. O oh, foul descent, that I, who erst contended with gods to sit the highest, am now constrained into a beast, and mixed with bestial slime, this essence to incarnate and imbrute, that to the height of deity aspired. But what will not ambition and revenge descend to? 
who aspires must down as low as high he soared, obnoxious first or last to basest things. Revenge, at first, though sweet, bitter ere long, back on itself recoils. Let it. I reck not, so it light well aimed, since higher I fall short on him who next provokes my envy, this new favourite of heaven, this man of clay, son of despite, whom us the more to spite his maker raised from dust. Spite, then, with spite, is best repaid. So saying... Through each thicket, dank or dry, like a black mist low creeping, he held on his midnight search, where soonest he might find the serpent. Him, fast sleeping, soon he found. In labyrinth of many a round, self-rolled, his head the midst, well stored with subtle wiles. Not yet in horrid shade or dismal den, nor harmful yet, but on the grassy herb, fearless, unfeared, he slept. In at his mouth the devil entered, and his brutal sense in heart or head possessing, soon inspired with act intelligential. But his sleep disturbed not, waiting close the approach of morn. Now... When a sacred light began to dawn in Eden on the humid flowers that breathed their morning incense, when all things that breathe from the earth's great altar send up silent praise to the Creator, and his nostrils fill with grateful smell, forth came the human pair, and joined their vocal worship to the choir of creatures wanting voice. That done, partake the season, prime for sweetest scents and airs, then commune how that day they best may ply their growing work, for much their work outgrew the hand's dispatch of two, gardening so wide. And Eve, first to her husband, thus began. Adam, well may we labour still to dress this garden, still to tend plant, herb, and flower, our pleasant task enjoined. But till more hands aid us, the work under our labour grows luxurious by restraint, what we by day lop, overgrown, or prune, or prop, or bind, one night or two with wanton growth derides, tending to wild. Thou therefore now advise, or hear what to my mind first thoughts present. Let us divide our labours. Thou, where choice leads thee, or where most needs, whether to wind the woodbine round this arbour, or direct the clasping ivy where to climb, while I, in yonder spring of roses, intermixed with myrtle, find what to redress till noon. For while so near each other thus all day our task we choose, what wonder if so near looks intervene and smiles, or object new casual discourse draw on, which intermits our day's work brought a little, though begun early, and the hour of supper comes unearned? Soul Eve, associate soul, to me beyond compare above all living creatures dear. Well hast thou motioned, well thy thoughts employed, how we might best fulfil the work which here God hath assigned us, nor of me shalt pass unpraised. For nothing lovelier can be found in woman than to study household good, and good works in her husband to promote. Yet not so strictly hath our Lord imposed labour, as to debar us when we need refreshment, whether food or talk between, food of the mind, or this sweet intercourse of looks and smiles, for smiles from reason flow, to brute denied, and are of love the food, love not the lowest end of human life. For not to irksome toil, but to delight he made us, and delight to reason joined. These paths and bowers doubt not but our joint hands will keep from wilderness with ease, as wide as we need walk, till younger hands ere long assist us. But if much converse, perhaps, thee satiate, to short absence I could yield, for solitude sometimes is best society, and short retirement urges sweet return. But other doubt possesses me, lest harm befall thee severed from me, for thou knowest what hath been warned us, what malicious foe, envying our happiness, 
and of his own despairing seeks to work us woe and shame by sly assault. And somewhere nigh at hand watches, no doubt, with greedy hope to find his wish and best advantage, us asunder, hopeless to circumvent us joined, where each to other speedy aid might lend at need. Whether his first design be to withdraw our fealty from God, or to disturb conjugal love, than which perhaps no bliss enjoyed by us excites his envy more, or this, or worse, Leave not the faithful side that gave thee being, still shades thee and protects. The wife, where danger or dishonour lurks, safest and seemliest by her husband stays, who guards her, or with her the worst endures. To whom the virgin majesty of Eve, as one who loves and some unkindness meets, with sweet austere composure, thus replied. Offspring of heaven and earth, and all earth's lord, that such an enemy we have who seeks our ruin, both by thee informed I learn, and from the parting angel overheard, as in a shady nook I stood behind, just then returned at shut of evening flowers. But that thou shouldst my firmness therefore doubt to God or thee, because we have a foe may tempt it, I expect it not to hear. His violence thou fearst not, being such as we, not capable of death or pain, can either not receive or can repel. His fraud is then thy fear, which plain infers thy equal fear that my firm faith and love can by his fraud be shaken or seduced. Thoughts, which how found they harbour in thy breast, Adam, misthought of her to thee so dear. Daughter of God and man, immortal Eve, for such thou art, from sin and blame entire. Not diffident of thee do I dissuade thy absence from my sight, but to avoid the attempt itself intended by our foe. Subtle he needs must be, who could seduce angels, nor think superfluous others' aid. I, from the influence of thy looks, receive access in every virtue, in thy sight more wise, more watchful, stronger, if need were of outward strength. While shame, thou looking on, shame to be overcome or overreached, would utmost vigour raise, and raised unite. Why shouldst not thou like sense within thee feel when I am present, and thy trial choose with me, best witness of thy virtue tried? Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 29, in which Eve persuades Adam to let her work alone in the garden. If this be our condition, thus to dwell in narrow circuits straightened by a foe, subtle or violent, we not endued single with like defence, wherever met, how are we happy, still in fear of harm? And what is faith? Love, virtue, unassayed alone, without exterior help sustained. Let us not then suspect our happy state left so imperfect by the maker wise, as not secure to single or combined. Frail is our happiness, if this be so, an Eden were no Eden thus exposed. O woman, best are all things as the will of God ordained them. His creating hand, nothing imperfect or deficient left of all that he created, much less man, or aught that might his happy state secure, secure from outward force. Within himself the danger lies, yet lies within his power. Against his will he can receive no harm. But God left free the will, for what obeys reason is free, and reason he made right, but bid her well beware, and be alert, lest by some fair appearing good, surprised, she dictate false and misinform the will to do what God expressly hath forbid. Not then mistrust, but tender love enjoins that I should mind thee oft, and mind thou me. Seek not temptation then, which to avoid were better, and most likely if from me thou sever not. Trial will come unsought. 
Wouldst thou approve thy constancy, approve first thy obedience. The other, who can know? Not seeing thee attempted, who attest? But if thou think, trial unsought may find us both securer than thus warned thou seemst. Go, for thy stay, not free, absents thee more. Go in thy native innocence, rely on what thou hast of virtue, summon all. For God towards thee hath done his part. Do thine. With thy permission, then, and thus forewarned chiefly by what thy own last reasoning words touched only, that our trial, when least sought, may find us both perhaps far less prepared, the willinger I go, nor much expect a foe so proud will first the weaker seek, so bent, the more shall shame him his repulse. Thus saying, from her husband's hand, her hand soft she withdrew, and like a wood nymph light betook her to the groves. Her long with ardent look his eye pursued, delighted, but desiring more her stay. Oft he to her his charge of quick return repeated, she to him as oft engaged to be returned by noon amid the bower. Oh, much deceived, much failing, hapless Eve, for now, and since first break of dawn, the fiend, mere serpent in appearance, forth was come. He sought them both, but wished his hap might find Eve separate. He wished, but not with hope of what so seldom chanced, when to his wish, beyond his hope, Eve separate he spies, Veiled in a cloud of fragrance, where she stood, half spied, So thick the roses bushing round about her glowed, Oft stooping to support each flower of slender stalk, Whose head, though gay carnation, purple, azure, or specked with gold, Hung drooping unsustained. Nearer he drew, and many a walk traversed of stateliest covert, cedar, pine, or palm, then voluble and bold, now hid, now seen among thick-woven arborets and flowers, embordered on each bank, the hand of Eve. Much he the place admired, the person more. Great pleasure took the serpent to behold this flowery plot, the sweet recess of Eve thus early, thus alone, her heavenly form angelic, but more soft and feminine. Her graceful innocence, her every air of gesture or least action, overawed his malice, and with rapine sweet bereaved his fierceness of the fierce intent it brought. That space the evil one abstracted stood from his own evil, and for the time remained stupidly good, of enmity disarmed, of guile, of hate, of envy, of revenge. But the hot hell that always in him burns, though in mid-heaven, soon ended his delight, and tortures him now more, the more he sees of pleasure not for him ordained. Then soon fierce hate he recollects, and all his thoughts of mischief gratulating thus excites. Thoughts, whither have ye led me, with what sweet compulsion thus transported to forget what hither brought us, hate, not love, nor hope of paradise for hell, hope here to taste of pleasure, but all pleasure to destroy, save what is in destroying other joy to me is lost. Then let me not let pass occasion which now smiles, behold, alone the woman, opportune to all attempts. Her husband, for I view far round, not nigh, whose higher intellectual more I shun, and strength, of courage haughty, and of limb heroic built. Though of terrestrial mould, foe not informidable, exempt from wound, I not, so much hath hell debased, and pain enfeebled me to what I was in heaven, she fair, divinely fair, fit love for gods, not terrible, 
though terror be in love and beauty not approached by stronger hate hate stronger under show of love well feigned the way which to her ruin now i tend so spake the enemy of mankind, enclosed in serpent, inmate bad, and toward Eve addressed his way, not with indented wave prone on the ground as since, but on his rear circular base of rising folds that towered fold above fold a surging maze, his head crested aloft and carbuncle his eyes, with burnished neck of verdant gold erect amidst his circling spires that on the grass floated redundant. Pleasing was his shape. With tract oblique at first, as one who sought access but feared to interrupt, sidelong he works his way. As when a ship by skilful steersman wrought nigh river's mouth or foreland, where the wind veers oft, as oft so steers and shifts her sail. So varied he, and of his tortuous train curled many a wanton wreath in sight of Eve to lure her eye. She, busied, heard the sound of rustling leaves, but minded not, as used to such disport before her through the field, from every beast more duteous at her call than at Circean call the herd disguised. He, bolder now, uncalled before her stood, but as in gaze admiring, Oft he bowed his turret crest and sleek enameled neck, fawning, and licked the ground whereon she trod. His gentle, dumb expression turned at length the eye of Eve to mark his play. He, glad of her attention gained, with serpent tongue organic, or impulse of vocal air, his fraudulent temptation thus began. Fairest resemblance of thy maker fair, thee all things living gaze on, all things thine by gift, and thy celestial beauty adore, with ravishment beheld, there best beheld were universally admired, but here in this enclosure wild these beasts among, beholders rude and shallow to discern half what in thee is fair, one man except who sees thee. And what is one who shouldst be seen a goddess among gods, adored and served by angels numberless, thy daily train? So glozed the tempter, and his proem tuned. Into the heart of Eve his words made way. Though at the voice much marvelling, at length not unamazed, she thus in answer spake. What may this mean? Language of man pronounced by tongue of brute, and human sense expressed? These serpent, subtlest beast of all the field, I knew, but not with human voice endued. Redouble then this miracle, and say how camest thou speakable of mute, and how to me so friendly grown, above the rest of brutal kind, the daily are in sight. Say, for such wonder claims attention due. Empress of this fair world, resplendent eve i was at first as other beasts that graze the trodden herb of abject thoughts and low as was my food nor aught but food discerned or sex and apprehended nothing high till on a day roving the field i chanced a goodly tree far distant to behold loaden with fruit of fairest colours mixed ruddy and gold I nearer drew to gaze, when, from the boughs, a savoury odour blown, grateful to appetite, more pleased my sense than smell of sweetest fennel, nor the teats of ewe or goat dropping with milk at even, unsucked of lamb or kid that tend their play. To satisfy the sharp desire I had of tasting those fair apples, I resolved not to defer. Hunger and thirst at once, powerful persuaders, quickened at the scent of that alluring fruit, urged me so keen. About the mossy trunk I wound me soon, for high from ground the branches would require thy utmost reach, or Adam's. Round the tree all other beasts that saw, with like desire, longing and envying stood, but could not reach. Amid the tree now got, 
where plenty hung, tempting so nigh to pluck and eat my fill, I spared not. For such pleasure till that hour, at feed or fountain, never had I found. Sated at length, ere long I might perceive strange alteration in me, to degree of reason in my inward powers, and speech wanted not long, though to this shape retained. Thenceforth to speculations, high or deep I turned my thoughts, and with capacious mind considered all things visible in heaven, or earth or middle, all things fair and good. But all that fair and good in thy divine semblance and in thy beauty's heavenly ray united I behold. No fair to thine equivalent or second, which compelled me thus, though importune perhaps, to come and gaze and worship thee, of right declared, sovereign of creatures, universal dame. Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 30, in which the serpent tempts Eve to taste the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Sovereign of creatures, universal day. So talked the spirited sly snake, and Eve, yet more amazed, unwary, thus replied. Serpent. Thy overpraising leaves in doubt the virtue of that fruit in thee first proved. But say, where grows the tree? From hence how far? For many are the trees of God that grow in paradise. Oh, Empress, the way is ready, and not long. Beyond a row of myrtles, on a flat, fast by a fountain, one small thicket passed of blowing myrrh and balm. If thou accept my conduct, I can bring thee thither. Soon. Lead then, said Eve. He leading swiftly rolled in tangles and made intricate seem straight to mischief swift. Hope elevates and joy brightens his crest, as when a wandering fire, compact of unctuous vapour, which the night condenses and the cold environs round, kindled through agitation to a flame, which oft, they say, some evil spirit attends, hovering and blazing with delusive light, misleads the amazed night-wanderer from his way to bogs and mires, and oft through pond or pool, there swallowed up and lost from succour far. So glistered the dire snake, and into fraud led Eve, our credulous mother, to the tree of prohibition, root of all our woe, which when she saw, thus to her guide she spake. Serpent, we might have spared our coming hither, fruitless to me, though fruit be here to excess, the credit of whose virtue rest with thee, wondrous indeed if cause of such effects. But of this tree we may not taste nor touch. God so commanded, and left that command sole daughter of his voice. The rest we live law to ourselves. Our reason is our law. Indeed. Hath God then said that of the fruit of all these garden trees ye shall not eat, yet lords declared of all in earth or air? Of the fruit of each tree in the garden we may eat. But of the fruit of this fair tree, amidst the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat thereof, nor shall ye touch it, lest ye die. She scarce had said, though brief, when now more bold, the tempter, all impassioned, thus began. O sacred, wise, and wisdom-giving plant, mother of science, now I feel thy power within me clear not only to discern things in their causes, but to trace the ways of highest agents deemed however wise. Queen of this universe, do not believe those rigid threats of death. Ye shall not die. How should ye? By the fruit. It gives you life to knowledge. By the threatener? Look on me, 
me who have touched and tasted, yet both live, and life more perfect have attained than fate meant me, by venturing higher than my lot. Shall that be shut to man which to the beast is open? Or will God incense his ire for such a petty trespass, and not praise, rather, your dauntless virtue, whom the pain of death denounced? Whatever thing death be, deterred not from achieving what might lead to happier life, knowledge of good and evil. Of good, how just. Of evil, if what is evil be real, why not known, since easier shunned? God, therefore, cannot hurt ye and be just. Not just, not God, not feared then, nor obeyed. Your fear itself of death removes the fear. Why, then, was this forbid? Why, but to all? Why, but to keep ye low and ignorant his worshippers? He knows that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes that seem so clear, yet are but dim, shall perfectly be then opened and cleared, and ye shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil as they know. That ye should be as gods, since I as man, internal man, is but proportion meet. I of brute human, ye of human gods. So ye shall die, perhaps, by putting off human to put on gods. Death to be wished, though threatened, which no worse than this can bring. And what are gods, that man may not become as they, participating godlike food? The gods are first, and that advantage use on our belief that all from them proceeds. I question it. For this fair earth, I see, warmed by the sun, producing every kind, them... Nothing. If they all things, who enclosed knowledge of good and evil in this tree, that whoso eats thereof forwith attains wisdom without their leave? And wherein lies the offence that man should thus attain to know? But can your knowledge hurt him, or this tree impart against his will, if all be his? Or is it envy? And can envy dwell in heavenly breasts? These, these, and many more causes import your need of this fair fruit. Goddess humane, reach then and freely taste. He ended, and his words replete with guile into her heart too easy entrance won. Fixed on the fruit she gazed, which to behold might tempt alone. And in her ears the sound yet rung of his persuasive words, impregnant with reason to her seeming, and with truth. Meanwhile the hour of noon drew on, and waked an eager appetite, raised by the smell so savoury of that fruit, which with desire, inclinable now grown to touch or taste, solicited her longing eye. Yet first, pausing a while, Thus to herself she mused. In the day we eat of this fair fruit, our doom is we shall die. How dies the serpent? He hath eaten and lives, and knows, and speaks, and reasons, and discerns, irrational till then. For us alone was death invented. Or to be denied this intellectual food for beasts reserved? For beast it seems, yet that one beast which first hath tasted envies not, but brings with joy the good befallen him, author unsuspect, friendly to man, far from deceit or guile. What fear I then? Rather, what know to fear, under this ignorance of good and evil, of God or death, of law or penalty? Here grows the cure of all, this fruit divine, fair to the eye, inviting to the taste, of virtue to make wise. What hinders then to reach and feed at once both body and mind? So saying, her rash hand in evil hour forth reaching to the fruit, she plucked, she ate. Earth felt the wound, 
and nature from her seat, sighing through all her works, gave signs of woe that all was lost. Back to the thicket slunk the guilty serpent, and well might, for Eve, intent now wholly on her taste, naught else regarded, such delight till then as seemed in fruit she never tasted, whether true or fancied so, through expectation high of knowledge, nor was Godhead from her thought. Greedily she engorged without restraint, and knew not eating death. Satiate at length, and heightened as with wine, jocund and boon, thus to herself she pleasingly began. O oh, sovereign, virtuous, precious of all trees in paradise, of operation blessed to sapience, hitherto obscured, infamed, and thy fair fruit let hang as to no end created, but henceforth my early care, not without song, each morning, and due praise shall tend thee, and the fertile burden ease of thy full branches, offered free to all, till dieted by thee I grow mature in knowledge, as the gods who all things know, though others envy what they cannot give, for had the gift been theirs, it had not here thus grown. Experience, next to thee I owe, best guide, not following thee, I had remained in ignorance. Thou openst wisdom's way, and givest access, though secret she retire. And I, perhaps, am secret. Heaven is high, high and remote, to see for men's distinct each thing on earth. And other care, perhaps, may have diverted from continual watch our great forbidder, safe with all his spies about him. But to Adam, in what sort shall I appear? Shall I to him make known as yet my change, and give him to partake full happiness with me? Or rather not, but keep the odds of knowledge in my power without co-partner, so to add what wants in female sex, the more to draw his love, and render me more equal, and perhaps a thing not undesirable, sometimes superior, for inferior who is free? This may be well, but what if God have seen, and death ensue? Then I shall be no more, and Adam wedded to another Eve, shall live with her enjoying, I extinct, a death to think. Confirmed then I resolve, Adam shall share with me in bliss or woe. So dear I love him, that with him all deaths I could endure, without him live no life. So saying, from the tree her step she turned. Adam the while, waiting desirous her return, had wove of choicest flowers a garland to adorn her tresses, and her rural labours crown, as reapers oft are wont their harvest queen. Great joy he promised to his thoughts, and new solace in her return, so long delayed. Yet oft his heart, divine of something ill, misgave him. He the faltering measure felt, and forth to meet her went, the way she took that morn when first they parted. By the tree of knowledge he must pass. There he her met, scarce from the tree returning. In her hand a bough of fairest fruit that downy smiled, new gathered, and ambrosial smell diffused. To him she hasted, in her face excuse came prologue, and apology to prompt, which with bland words at will she thus addressed. Hast thou not wondered, Adam, at my stay? Thee I have missed, and thought it long, deprived thy presence. Agony of love till now not felt, nor shall be twice, for never more mean I to try what rash untried I sought. The pain of absence from thy sight. Paradise Lost by John Milton, Episode thirty one, in which Eve persuades Adam to taste the forbidden fruit.
This tree is not as we are told, a tree of danger tasted, nor to evil unknown opening the way, but of divine effect to open eyes and make them gods who taste and have been tasted such. The serpent wise, or not restrained as we, or not obeying, hath eaten of the fruit and is become not dead as we are threatened, but thenceforth endued with human voice and human sense, reasoning to admiration. And with me persuasively hath so prevailed that I have also tasted, and have also found the effects to correspond. Opener mine eyes, dim erst, dilated spirits, ampler heart, and growing up to Godhead, which for thee chiefly I sought, without thee can despise, for bliss, as thou hast part, to me is bliss, tedious unshared with thee, and odious soon. Thou therefore also taste, that equal lot may join us, equal joy as equal love, lest thou not tasting, different degree disjoin us, and I, then too late, renounce deity for thee, when fate will not permit. Thus Eve with countenance blithe her story told, but in her cheek distemper flushing glowed. On the other side, Adam, soon as he heard the fatal trespass done by Eve, amazed, astonished, stood and blank, while horror chill ran through his veins, and all his joints relaxed. From his slack hand the garland wreathed for Eve down dropped, and all the faded roses shed. Speechless he stood and pale, till thus at length, first to himself, he inward silence broke. O fairest of creation, how art thou lost, how on a sudden lost, defaced, deflowered, and now to death devote, and me with thee hath ruined, for with thee certain my resolution is to die. How can I live without thee? How forego thy sweet converse and love so dilly joined, to live again in these wild woods forlorn? Should God create another Eve, and I another rib afford? Yet loss of thee would never from my heart. No, no, I feel the link of nature draw me, flesh of flesh, bone of my bone thou art, and from thy state mine never shall be parted bliss or woe. So having said, as one from sad dismay recomforted, and after thoughts disturbed, submitting to what seemed remediless, thus in calm mood his words to Eve he turned. Bold deed thou hast presumed, adventurous Eve, and peril great provoked, but past who can recall, or done undo. Nor can I think that God, creator-wise, though threatening, will in earnest so destroy us, his prime creatures, dignified so high, set over all his works, which in our fall, for us created, needs with us must fail. However, I with thee have fixed my lot, certain to undergo like doom. If death consort with thee, death is to me as life. So forcible within my heart I feel the bond of nature draw me to my own, my own in thee, for what thou art is mine. Our state cannot be severed, we are one, one flesh. To lose thee were to lose myself. O oh, glorious trial of exceeding love, Adam, from whose dear side I boast me sprung, and gladly of our union hear thee speak, one heart, one soul in both, whereof good proof this day affords, declaring thee resolved, rather than death, or aught than death, more dread shall separate us, linked in love so dear, to undergo with me one guilt, one crime, if any be, of tasting this fair fruit. This my attempt, I would sustain alone the worst, and not persuade thee, but I feel far otherwise the event, not death, but life augmented, opened eyes, new hopes, new joys, taste so divine that what of sweet before hath touched my sense flat seems to this, and harsh. On my experience, Adam, freely taste, and fear of death deliver to the winds. 
So saying, she embraced him, and for joy tenderly wept, much won that he his love had so ennobled as of choice to incur divine displeasure for her sake, or death. In recompense, for such compliance bad, such recompense best merits, from the bough she gave him of that fair enticing fruit with liberal hand. He scrupled not to eat against his better knowledge, not deceived, but fondly overcome with female charm. Earth trembled from her entrails, as again in pangs, and nature gave a second groan. Sky lowered, and muttering thunder, some sad drops wept at completing of the mortal sin original. While Adam took no thought, eating his fill, nor Eve to iterate her former trespass feared, the more to soothe him with her loved society, that now, as with new wine intoxicated both, they swim in mirth, and fancy that they feel divinity within them, breeding wings wherewith to scorn the earth. But that false fruit, far other operation first displayed, carnal desire inflaming, he on Eve began to cast lascivious eyes, she him as wantonly repaid, in lust they burn, till Adam thus gan Eve to dalliance move. Much pleasure we have lost, while we abstain from this delightful fruit, nor known till now true relish tasting. If such pleasure be in things to us forbidden, it might be wished for this one tree had been forbidden ten. But come, so well refreshed, now let us play, as meat is after such delicious fare. For never did thy beauty, since the day I saw thee first and wedded thee, adorned with all perfections, so inflame my sense with ardour to enjoy thee, fairer now than ever, bounty of this virtuous tree. So said he, and forbore not glance or toy of amorous intent, well understood of Eve, whose eye darted contagious fire. Her hand he seized, and to a shady bank, thick overhead with verdant roof embowered, he led her, nothing loath. Flowers were the couch, pansies and violets and asphodel and hyacinth, earth's freshest, softest lap. There they their fill of love and love's disport took largely. Of their mutual guilt the seal, the solace of their sin, till dewy sleep oppressed them, wearied with their amorous play. Soon as the force of that fallacious fruit, that with exhilarating vapour bland about their spirits had played, and inmost powers made err, was now exhaled, and grosser sleep, bred of unkindly fumes, with conscious dreams encumbered, now had left them, up they rose, as from unrest, and each the other viewing, soon found their eyes how opened, and their minds how darkened. Innocence, that as a veil had shadowed them from knowing ill, was gone. They, destitute and bare of all their virtue, silent and in face confounded, long they sat, as strucken mute, till Adam, though not less than Eve abashed, at length gave utterance to these words constrained. O Eve, in evil hour thou didst give ear to that false worm, of whomsoever taught to counterfeit man's voice, true in our fall, false in our promised rising. Since our eyes opened, we find indeed, and find we know both good and evil, good lost and evil got. Bad fruit of knowledge, if this be to know, which leaves us naked thus. How shall I behold the face henceforth of God or angel, erst with joy and rapture so oft beheld? Oh, might I here in solitude live savage, in some glade obscured, where highest woods impenetrable to star or sunlight spread their umbrage broad and brown as evening? Cover me, ye pines, ye cedars, with innumerable boughs hide me, where I may never see them more. But let us now, as in bad plight, 
devise what best may for the present serve to hide the parts of each from other that seem most to shame obnoxious and unseemliest seen. Some tree whose broad smooth leaves together sewed and girded on our loins may cover round those middle parts that this newcomer shame there sit not and reproach us as unclean. So counselled he, and both together went into the thickest wood. There soon they chose the fig tree, gathering its broadest leaves, and with what skill they had together sewed to gird their waist. Vain covering it to hide their guilt and dreaded shame. Oh, how unlike to that first naked glory. Thus fenced, and as they thought their shame in part covered, but not at rest or ease of mind, they sat them down to weep. Nor only tears rained at their eyes, but high winds worse within began to rise, high passions, anger, hate, mistrust, suspicion, discord, and shook sore their inward state of mind. Calm region once and full of peace, now tossed and turbulent. Would thou hast hearkened to my words, and stayed with me as I besought thee, when that strange desire of wandering this unhappy morn, I know not whence possessed thee, we had then remained still happy. What words have passed thy lips, Adam Severe? Impute thou that to my default, or will of wandering, as thou callst it, which who knows but might as ill have happened thou being by, or to thyself perhaps? Hadst thou been there, or hear the attempt, thou couldst not have discerned fraud in the serpent, speaking as he spake. No ground of enmity between us known, why he should mean me ill or seek to harm. Was I to have never parted from thy side, as could have grown there still a lifeless rib? Being as I am, why didst not thou, the head, command me absolutely not to go, going into such danger as thou saidst? Is this the love, is this the recompense of mine to thee, in grateful eve, expressed immutable when thou wert lost? Not I, who might have lived and joyed immortal bliss, yet willingly chose rather death with thee. And am I now upbraided as the cause of thy transgressing? Not enough severe, it seems, in thy restraint. What could I more? I warned thee, I admonished thee, foretold the danger and the lurking enemy that lay in wait. Thus they in mutual accusation spent the fruitless hours, but neither self-condemning, and of their vain contest appeared no end. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 32 In which God sends his son to judge Adam and Eve Up into heaven from paradise In haste the angelic guards ascended Mute and sad for man For of his state by this they knew Much wondering how the subtle fiend Had stolen entrance unseen Soon as the unwelcome news from earth arrived at heaven gate, displeased all were who heard. Dim sadness did not spare that time celestial visages, yet, mixed with pity, violated not their bliss. About the new arrived in multitudes the ethereal people ran to hear and know how all befell. They, towards the throne supreme, accountable, made haste to make appear with righteous plea their utmost vigilance, and easily approved. When the Most High Eternal Father, from his secret cloud, amidst in thunder, uttered thus his voice. Assembled angels, and ye powers returned from unsuccessful charge, be not dismayed, nor troubled at these tidings from the earth, which your sincerest care could not prevent foretold so lately what would come to pass when first this tempter crossed the gulf from hell. I told ye then he should prevail and speed on his bad errand. Man should be seduced and flattered out of all, believing lies against his maker, 
no decree of mine concurring to necessitate his fall or touch with lightest moment of impulse his free will to her own inclining left in even scale. But fallen he is, and now what rests but that the mortal sentence pass on his transgression, death denounced that day, which he presumes already vain and void, because not yet inflicted as he feared by some immediate stroke, but soon shall find forbearance no acquittance ere day end. Justice shall not return as bounty is scorned. But whom send I to judge them? Who but thee, vicegerent son, to thee I have transferred all judgment, whether in heaven or earth or hell. Easy it may be seen that I intend mercy colleague with justice, sending thee man's friend, his mediator, his designed both ransom and redeemer voluntary, and destined man himself to judge man fallen. So spake the Father, and unfolding bright toward the right hand his glory, on his Son blazed forth unclouded deity. He, full resplendent, all his Father manifest expressed, and thus divinely answered mild. Father eternal, thine is to decree, mine both in heaven and earth to do thy will supreme, that thou in me, thy son beloved, mayst ever rest well pleased. I go to judge on earth these thy transgressors, but thou knowest, whoever judged, the worst on me must light. When time shall be, for so I undertook before thee, and not repenting this obtain of right, that I may mitigate their doom on me derived. Yet I shall temper so justice with mercy, as may illustrate most, them fully satisfied, and thee appease. Thus saying, from his radiant seat he rose of high collateral glory, him thrones and powers, princedoms and dominations ministrant, accompanied to heaven gate, from whence Eden and all the coast in prospect lay. Down he descended straight, the speed of God's time counts not, though with swiftest minutes winged. Now was the sun in western cadence low from noon, and gentle airs, due at their hour to fan the earth, now waked, and usher in the evening cool, when he, from wrath more cool, came the mild judge and intercessor both to sentence man. The voice of God they heard now walking in the garden, by soft winds brought to their ears while day declined. They heard, and from his presence hid themselves among the thickest trees, both man and wife, till God approaching, thus to Adam called aloud. Where art thou, Adam? Won't with joy to meet my coming seen far off? I miss thee here, not pleased, thus entertained with solitude, where obvious duty erewhile appeared unsought. Or come I less conspicuous? Or what change absents thee? Or what chance detains? Come forth! He came, and with him Eve, More loath, though first to offend, Discountenanced both, and discomposed. Love was not in their looks, Either to God or to each other, But apparent guilt, and shame, And perturbation, and despair, Anger, and obstinacy, and hate, and guile. Whence Adam, faltering long, thus answered brief. I heard thee in the garden, and of thy voice afraid, being naked, hid myself. My voice thou oft hast heard, and hast not feared, but still rejoiced. How is it now become so dreadful to thee, that thou art naked, who hath told thee? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I gave thee charge thou shouldst not eat? O heaven, in evil strait this day I stand before my judge, either to undergo myself the total crime, or to accuse my other self, the partner of my life, whose falling, while her faith to me remains, I should conceal and not expose to blame by my complaint. Yet thou wouldst easily detect what I conceal. 
This woman, whom thou madest to be my help, and gavest me as thy perfect gift, so good, so fit, so acceptable, so divine, that from her hand I could suspect no ill, and what she did, whatever in itself, her doings seemed to justify the deed. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. Was she thy God, that her thou didst obey before his voice? Or was she made thy guide superior? Or but equal, that to her thou didst resign thy manhood, and the place wherein God set thee above her, made of thee and for thee, whose perfection far excelled hers in all real dignity? Adorned she was indeed, and lovely, to attract thy love, not thy subjection. And her gifts were such as under government well seemed, unseemly to bear rule, which was thy part and person, hadst thou known thyself aright. Say, woman, what is this which thou hast done? The serpent me beguiled, and I did eat. Which, when the Lord God heard, without delay to judgment he proceeded on the accused, and on the serpent thus his curse let fall. Because thou hast done this, thou art accursed above all cattle, each beast of the field. Upon thy belly grovelling thou shalt go, and dust shalt eat all the days of thy life. Between thee and the woman I will put enmity, and between thine and her seed. Her seed shall bruise thy head, thou bruise his heel. And to the woman thus his sentence turned. Thy sorrow I will greatly multiply by thy conception. Children thou shalt bring in sorrow forth, and to thy husband's will thine shall submit. He over thee shall rule. On Adam last thus judgment he pronounced. Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and eaten of the tree concerning which I charge thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat thereof, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Thou in sorrow shalt eat thereof all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles it shall bring thee forth unbid. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Till thou return unto the ground, for thou out of the ground wast taken. Know thy birth, for dust thou art, and shalt to dust return. So judged he man, both judge and saviour sent, and the instant stroke of death, denounced that day, removed far off. Then, pitying how they stood before him naked to the air that now must suffer change, disdained not to begin thenceforth the form of servant to assume. As when he washed his servant's feet, so now, as father of his family, he clad their nakedness with skins of beasts, or slain, or as the snake with youthful coat repaid, and thought not much to clothe his enemies, nor he their outward only with the skins of beasts, but inward nakedness, much more opprobrious, with his robe of righteousness, arraying covered from his father's sight. To him with swift ascent he upreturned, into his blissful bosom reassumed in glory as of old. To him appeased all, though all-knowing, what had passed with man recounted, mixing intercession sweet. Meanwhile, ere thus was sinned and judged on earth, within the gates of hell sat sin and death, in count of you within the gates, that now stood open wide, belching outrageous flame far into chaos, since the fiend passed through. Sin opening, who thus now to death began. O oh, son, why sit we here each other viewing idly, while Satan, our great author, thrives in other worlds, and happier seat provides for us his offspring dear? Methinks I feel new strength within me rise, wings growing, and dominion given me large beyond this deep, Whatever draws me, thou inseparable must with me along. For death from sin no power can separate. 
But lest the difficulty of passing back stay his return, perhaps, over this gulf impassable, impervious, let us try adventurous work, yet to thy power and mine not unagreeable, to found a path over this main from hell to that new world where Satan now prevails, a monument of merit high to all the infernal host, easing their passage hence. Go with a fate and inclination strong leads thee. I shall not lag behind, nor err the way. Thou leading, such a scent I draw of carnage. Pray innumerable, and taste the savour of death from all things there that live. Nor shall I to the work thou enterprisest be wanting, but afford thee equal aid. So saying, with delight he snuffed the smell of mortal change on earth. As when a flock of ravenous fowl, though many a league remote, against the day of battle, to a field where armies lie encamped, come flying, lured with scent of living carcasses, designed for death the following day in bloody fight. So scented the grim feature, and upturned his nostril wide into the murky air, sagacious of his quarry from so far. Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 33, in which sin and death construct a highway leading from hell to earth. Then sin and death, from hell into the waste, wide anarchy of chaos, damp and dark, flew diverse, and with power, their power was great, hovering upon the waters, what they met, solid or slimy, as in raging sea tossed up and down, together crowded, drove from each side, shoaling towards the mouth of hell. The aggregated soil, death with his mace petrific, cold and dry, as with a trident, smote, and fixed as firm as Delos, floating once. The rest his look bound with Gorgonian rigour not to move, and with asphaltic slime. Broad as the gate, deep to the roots of hell, the gathered beach they fastened, and a pier immense wrought on over the foaming deep high arched, a bridge of length prodigious, joining to the wall immovable of this now fenceless world, forfeit to death. From hence a passage broad, smooth, easy, inoffensive, down to hell. Now had they brought the work by wondrous art pontifical, a ridge of pendant rock over the vexed abyss, following the track of Satan to the selfsame place where he first lighted from his wing and landed safe from out of chaos to the outside bare of this round world. With pins of adamant and chains they made all fast. Too fast they made and durable, and now in little space the confines met of Empyrean heaven and of this world, and on the left hand hell with long reach interposed. Three several ways in sight to each of these three places led. And now their way to earth they had descried, to paradise first tending, when, behold, Satan, in likeness of an angel bright, betwixt the centaur and the scorpion, steering his zenith, while the sun in Ares rose. Disguised he came, but those his children dear, their parents soon discerned, though in disguise. He, after Eve seduced, 
unminded, slunk into the wood fast by, and changing shape to observe the sequel, saw his guileful act, by Eve, though all unwitting, seconded upon her husband, saw their shame that sought vain covertures. But when he saw descend the Son of God to judge them, terrified he fled, not hoping to escape, but shun the present, fearing guilty what his wrath might suddenly inflict. That past returned by night, and listening where the hapless pair sat in their sad discourse and various plaint, thence gathered his own doom, which understood not instant, but of future time. With joy and tidings fraught, to hell he now returned, and at the brink of chaos, near the foot of this new wondrous pontifice, unhoped, met who to meet him came, his offspring dear. Great joy was at their meeting, and at sight of that stupendous bridge his joy increased. Long he admiring stood, till sin, his fair enchanting daughter, Thus the silence broke. O oh, parent, these are thy magnific deeds, thy trophies which thou viewst as not thine own. Thou art their author and prime architect. For I no sooner in my heart divined, my heart which by a secret harmony still moves with thine, joined in connection sweet, that thou on earth hadst prospered, which thy looks now also evidence. But straight I felt, though distant from thee, worlds between, yet felt that I must after thee with this thy son. Such fatal consequence unites us three. Hell could no longer hold us in her bounds, nor this unvoyageable gulf obscure detain from following thy illustrious track. Thou hast achieved our liberty, confined within hell gates till now, thou us empowered to fortify thus far and overlay with this portentous bridge the dark abyss. Thy now is all this world. Thy virtue hath won what thy hands builded not. Thy wisdom gained with odds what war hath lost and fully avenged our foil in heaven. Here thou shalt, monarch, reign. Whom thus the prince of darkness answered glad. Fair daughter, and thou son, and grandchild both, high proof ye now have given to be the race of Satan. For I glory in the name, antagonist of heaven's almighty king, amply have merited of me, of all the infernal empire that so near heaven's door triumphal with triumphal act have met. Mine with this glorious work, and made one realm, hell and this world, one realm, one continent of easy thoroughfare. Therefore, while I descend through darkness on your road with ease to my associate powers, them to acquaint with these successes and with them rejoice, you too, this way, among these numerous orbs, all yours, right down to paradise, descend. There dwell and reign in bliss. Thence on the earth dominion exercise, and in the air, chiefly on man, so Lord of all declared. Him, first make sure your thrall, and lastly, kill. My substitutes I send ye, and create plenipotent on earth, of matchless might issuing from me. On your joint vigour now, my hold of this new kingdom all depends. If your joint power prevail, the affairs of hell no detriment need fear. Go and be strong. So saying, he dismissed them. They with speed their course through thickest constellations held, spreading their bane. The blasted stars looked wan, and planets, planet struck, real eclipse then suffered. The other way Satan went down the causeway to hell gate. Through the gate, wide open and unguarded, Satan passed, and all about found desolate. For those appointed to sit there had left their charge, flown to the upper world. 
the rest were all far to the inland retired, about the walls of Pandemonium, city and proud seat of Lucifer, so by allusion called of that bright star to Satan paragoned. There kept their watch the legions, while the Grand in council sat, solicitous what chance might intercept their emperor sent, so he departing gave command, and these, the late heaven-banished host, left desert, utmost hell, many a dark league, reduced in careful watch round their metropolis, and now expecting each hour their great adventurer from the search of foreign worlds. He, through the midst, unmarked, in show plebeian angel militant of lowest order, passed. And from the door of that Plutonian hall, invisible, ascended his high throne, which under state of richest texture spread, at the upper end was placed in regal luster. Down a while he sat, and round about him saw unseen, at last, as from a cloud, his fulgent head and shape star-bright appeared, or brighter, clad with what permissive glory since his fall was left him, or false glitter. All amazed at that so sudden blaze, the Stygian throng bent their aspect, and whom they wished beheld, their mighty chief returned. Loud was the acclaim. Forth rushed in haste the great consulting peers, raised from their dark divan, and with like joy congratulant approached him, who with hand silence and with these words attention won. Thrones, dominations, princedoms, virtues, powers, for in possession such not only of right, I call ye and declare ye now, return successful beyond hope, to lead ye forth triumphant out of this infernal pit, abominable, accursed, the house of woe and dungeon of our tyrant. Now possess as lords a spacious world, to our native heaven little inferior, by my adventure hard with peril great achieved. Long were to tell what I have done, what suffered, with what pain voyaged the unreal, vast, unbounded deep of horrible confusion. But I found the new created world, which fame in heaven long had foretold, a fabric wonderful of absolute perfection. Therein man, placed in a paradise, by our exile made happy. Him, by fraud, I have seduced from his creator, and the more to increase your wonder, with an apple. He, thereat offended, worth your laughter, hath given up both his beloved man and all his world to sin and death a prey, and so to use, without our hazard, labor, or alarm, to range in and to dwell, and over man to rule as over all he should have ruled. True is, me also he hath judged, or rather, me not, but the brute serpent, in whose shape man I deceived. That which to me belongs is enmity, which he will put between me and mankind. I am to bruise his heel. His seed, when is not set, shall bruise my head. A world who would not purchase with a bruise, or much more grievous pain. Ye have the account of my performance... What remains, ye gods, but up, and enter now into full bliss. So having said, a while he stood, expecting their universal shout and high applause to fill his ear, when contrary he hears on all sides from innumerable tongues a dismal universal hiss, the sound of public scorn. He wondered... But not long had leisure, wondering at himself now more. His visage drawn he felt to sharp and spare. His arms clung to his ribs, his legs entwining each other, till supplanted down he fell, a monstrous serpent on his belly prone, reluctant but in vain. A greater power now ruled him, punished in the shape he sinned, according to his doom. 
he would have spoke, but hiss for hiss returned with forked tongue to forked tongue. For now were all transformed alike to serpents, all as accessories to his bold riot. Dreadful was the din of hissing through the hall, thick swarming now with complicated monsters, head and tail, scorpion and asp, and amphisbena dire, and dipsas. But still greatest he, the midst, now dragon-grown, larger than whom the sun engendered in the Pythian Vale on slime, huge python, and his power no less he seemed above the rest still to retain. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 34, in which sin and death begin their schemes for earth. But first, the devils who have been turned into serpents taste the fruit of disobedience. Those complicated monsters followed Satan, now dragon-grown, issuing forth to the open field where all yet left of that revolted rout, heaven fallen, in station stood, or just array, sublime with expectation when to see in triumph issuing forth their glorious chief. They saw, but other sight instead, a crowd of ugly serpents. Horror on them fell, and hodded sympathy, for what they saw, they felt themselves now changing. Down their arms, down fell both spear and shield, down they as fast, and the dire hiss renewed, and the dire form catched by contagion, like in punishment as in their crime. Thus was the applause they meant turned to exploding hiss, triumph to shame cast on themselves from their own mouths. There stood a grove hard by, sprung up with this their change, his will who reigns above to aggravate their penance, laden with fair fruit, like that which grew in paradise, the bait of Eve used by the tempter. On that prospect strange, their earnest eyes they fixed, imagining for one forbidden tree a multitude now risen to work them further woe or shame. Yet parched with scalding thirst and hunger fierce, though to delude them sent, could not abstain. But on they rolled in heaps, and up the trees climbing, sat thicker than the snaky locks that curled Majira. Greedily they plucked the fruitage fair to sight, like that which grew near that bituminous lake where Sodom flamed. This more delusive, not the touch, but taste deceived. They, fondly thinking to allay their appetite with gust, instead of fruit, chewed bitter ashes, which the offended taste with spattering noise rejected. Oft they essayed, hunger and thirst constraining, drugged as oft, with hatefulest disrelish, writhed their jaws with soot and cinders filled. Meanwhile in paradise the hellish pair too soon arrived. Sin there in power before, once actual, now in body, and to dwell habitual habitant. Behind her, death, close following pace for pace, not mounted yet on his pale horse, to whom sin thus began. <laughs> Second of Satan sprung, all conquering death. What thinkst thou of our empire now? The world with travel difficult, not better far than still it held's dark threshold to have sat watch, unnamed, undreaded, and thyself half starved. Whom thus the sin-born monster answered soon. To me, who with eternal famine pine, alike is hell or paradise or heaven. Their best, where most with raven I may meet, which here, though plenteous, all too little seems to stuff this maw, this vast and hide-bound corpse. Thou therefore on these herbs and fruits and flowers feed first, on each beast next, and fish and fowl, no homely morsels, and whatever thing the scythe of time mows down, devour unspared. 
Till I, in man residing through the race, his thoughts, his looks, words, actions, all infect, and season him thy last and sweetest prey. This said, they both betook them several ways, both to destroy or unimmortal make all kinds, and for destruction to mature sooner or later, which the Almighty seeing from his transcendent seat the saints among, I called and drew them thither, my hellhounds, to lick up the draught and filth which man's polluting sin with taint hath shed on what was pure, to crammed and gorged, nigh burst with sucked and glutted offal, at one sling of thy victorious arm, well-pleasing son, both sin and death and yawning grave at last, through chaos hurled, obstruct the mouth of hell forever and seal up his ravenous jaws. Now the Creator, calling forth by name his mighty angels, gave them several charge, as sorted best with present things. The sun had first his precept, so to move, so shine, as might affect the earth with cold and heat scarce tolerable, and from the north to call decrepit winter, from the south to bring solstitial summer's heat. To the blank moon her office they prescribed, to the other five their planetary motions and aspects. To the winds they set their corners, when with bluster to confound sea, air, and shore, the thunder when to roll with terror through the dark aerial hall. Thus began outrage from lifeless things. But discord first, daughter of sin among the irrational, death introduced through fierce antipathy. Beast now with beast gan war, and fowl with fowl, and fish with fish, to graze the herb all leaving, devoured each other. Nor stood much in awe of man, but fled him, or with countenance grim glared on him passing. These were from without the growing miseries which Adam saw already in part, though hid in gloomiest shade to sorrow abandoned, but worse felt within, and in a troubled sea of passion tossed, thus to disburden sought with sad complaint. O oh, miserable of happy, is this the end of this new glorious world, and me so late the glory of that glory? who now become accursed of blessed. Hide me from the face of God, whom to behold was then my height of happiness. Yet, well, if here would end the misery, I deserved it and would bear my own deservings. But this will not serve. All that I eat or drink or shall beget is propagated curse. O oh, voice once heard delightfully, increase and multiply, now death to hear. For what can I increase or multiply but curses on my head? Who of all ages to succeed, but feeling the evil on him brought by me, will curse my head? Ill fare our ancestor impure, for this we may thank Adam. But his thanks shall be the execration. Did I request thee, Maker, from my clay to mould me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me, or here place in this delicious garden? As my will concurred not to my being, it were but right and equal to reduce me to my dust, desirous to resign, and render back all I received, unable to perform thy terms too hard, by which I was to hold the good I sought not. To the loss of that sufficient penalty, why hast thou added the sense of endless woes? Inexplicable thy justice seems, yet to say truth, too late I thus contest. God made thee of choice his own, and of his own to serve him. Thy reward was of his grace, thy punishment then justly is at his will. Be it so, for I submit his doom is fair, that dust I am and shall to dust return. O oh, welcome hour whenever! Yet one doubt pursues me still, lest all I cannot die, 
lest that pure breath of life, the spirit of man which God inspired, cannot together perish with this corporeal clod. Then, in the grave or in some other dismal place, who knows, but I shall die a living death. Oh, thought horrid if true. Yet why? It was but breath of life that sinned. What dies but what had life and sin? The body properly hath neither. All of me then shall die. Let this appease the doubt, since human reach no further knows. For though the Lord of all be infinite, is his wrath also? But if it should transpire that death be not one stroke, as I supposed, bereaving sense, but endless misery from this day onward, which I feel begun both in me and without me, and so last to perpetuity, I me, that fear comes thundering back with dreadful revolution on my defenseless head. Both death and I am found eternal and incorporate both. Nor I, on my part, single. In me all posterity stands cursed. Fair patrimony that I must leave ye, sons. Oh, were I able to waste it all myself and leave ye none? So disinherited, how would ye bless me now, your curse? Ah, oh, why should all mankind for one man's fault thus guiltless be condemned, if guiltless? But for me... What can proceed but all corrupt, both mind and will depraved, not to do only, but to will the same with me? How can they then acquitted stand in sight of God? Him, after all disputes, forced, I absolve. All my evasions vain and reasonings, though through mazes, lead me still but to my own conviction. First and last on me, me only, as the source and spring of all corruption, all the blame lights due. So might the wrath, fond wish, couldst thou support that burden heavier than the earth to bear, than all the world much heavier, though divided with that bad woman. Thus Adam to himself lamented loud through the still night. Not now, as ere man fell, wholesome and cool and mild, but with black air accompanied, with damps and dreadful gloom, which to his evil conscience represented all things with double terror. On the ground outstretched he lay, on the cold ground, and oft cursed his creation. Death as oft accused of tardy execution, since announced the day of his offence. Why comes not death? With one thrice acceptable stroke, to end me. Shall truth fail to keep her word? Justice divine not hasten to be just? But death comes not at call. Justice divine mends not her slowest pace for prayers or cries. O oh, woods, O oh, fountains, hillocks, dales, and bowers, with other echo late I taught your shades to answer and resound far other song. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 35, in which Adam urges Eve to join him in seeking peace with God by repentance. Desolate where she sat, when Eve beheld Adam afflicted and approaching nigh, soft words to his fierce passion she assayed, but her with stern regard he thus repelled. Out of my sight, thou serpent! That name best befits thee with him leagued, thyself as false and hateful. Nothing wants but that thy shape like his and colour serpentine may show thy inward fraud to warn all creatures from thee henceforth, lest that too heavenly form pretended to hellish falsehood snare them. But for thee I had persisted happy, 
had not thy pride and wandering vanity, when least was safe, rejected by forewarning, and disdained not to be trusted, longing to be seen, though by the devil himself, him overweening to overreach, but with the serpent meeting, fooled and beguiled by him, thou, I, by thee, to trust thee from my side, imagined wise, constant, mature, proof against all assaults, and understood not all was but a show rather than solid virtue, all but a rib, crooked by nature, bent, as now appears, more to the part sinister from me drawn, well if thrown out, as supernumerary to my just number found. Oh, why did God creator wise, that peopled highest heaven with spirits masculine, create at last this novelty on earth, this fair defect of nature, and not fill the world at once with men as angels without feminine, or find some other way to generate mankind. He added not, and from her turned. But Eve, not so repulsed, with tears that ceased not flowing, and tresses all disordered, at his feet fell humble and embracing them, besought his peace, and thus proceeded in her plaint. Forsake me not thus, Adam. Witness heaven what love sincere and reverent in my heart I bear thee, and unwitting have offended, unhappily deceived. Thy suppliant, I beg and clasp thy knees. Bereave me not whereon I live thy gentle looks, thy aid, I counsel in this uttermost distress my only strength and stay. Forlorn of thee, whither shall I betake me? Where subsist? While yet we live, scarce one short hour perhaps, between us two let there be peace, both joining as joined in injuries, one enmity against a foe by doom express assigned us, that cruel serpent. On me exercise not thy hatred for this misery befallen, on me already lost, me than thyself more miserable. Both have sinned, but thou against God only, I against God and thee. And the place of judgment will return, if there with my cries importune heaven, that all the sentence from thy head removed may light on me, sole cause to thee of all this woe, me. Me only, just object of his ire. She ended weeping, and her lowly plight, immovable till peace obtained from fault acknowledged and deplored, in Adam wrought commiseration. Soon his heart relented towards her, his life so late and sole delight, now at his feet submissive in distress. Creature so fair, his reconcilement seeking, his counsel whom she had displeased, his aid. As one disarmed, his anger all he lost, and thus with peaceful words upraised her soon. Unwary, and too desirous as before, so now of what thou knowest not, who desirest the punishment all on thyself. Alas, bear thine own first, ill able to sustain his full wrath, whose thou feelst as yet least part, and my displeasure bearst so ill. If prayers could alter high decrees, I to that place would speed before thee, and be louder heard that on my head all might be visited, thy frailty and infirmer sex forgiven, to me committed and by me exposed. But rise, let us no more contend, nor blame each other, blamed enough elsewhere, but strive in offices of love how we may lighten each other's burden in our share of woe. Since this day's death denounced, if aught I see will prove no sudden, but a slow-paced evil, a long day's dying to augment our pain, and to our seed, oh, hapless seed derived. Adam, by sad experiment I know how little weight my words with thee can find, found so erroneous, thence by just event found so unfortunate, Nevertheless, restored by thee, vile as I am, to place of new acceptance, hopeful to regain thy love, the sole contentment of my heart, living or dying, from thee I will not hide what thoughts in my unquiet breast are risen, tending to some relief of our extremes, 
or end, though sharp and sad, yet tolerable, as in our evils, and of easier choice. If care of our descent perplex us most, which must be born to certain woe, devoured by death at last, and miserable it is to be to others cause of misery, our own begotten, and of our loins to bring into this cursed world a woeful race that after wretched life must be at last food for so foul a monster. In thy power it lies, yet ere conception to prevent the race unblessed to being yet unbegot. Childless thou art, childless remain, so death shall be deceived his glut, and with us too be forced to satisfy his ravenous maw. But if thou judge it hard and difficult, conversing, looking, loving, to abstain from love's due rites, nuptial embraces sweet, and with desire to languish without hope, before the present object languishing with like desire, which would be misery and torment less than none of what we dread, then both ourselves and seed at once to free from what we fear for both, let us make short, let us seek death. Or he not found, supply with our own hands his office on ourselves. Why stand we longer shivering under fears that show no end but death, and have the power of many ways to die the shortest choosing, destruction with destruction to destroy? She ended here, or vehement despair broke off the rest. So much of death her thoughts had entertained as dyed her cheeks with pale. But Adam, with such counsel, nothing swayed. To better hopes his more attentive mind labouring had raised, and thus to Eve replied. Eve, thy contempt of life and pleasure seems to argue in thee something more sublime and excellent than what thy mind contemns. But self-destruction, therefore sought, refutes that excellence thought in thee, and implies not thy contempt, but anguish and regret for loss of life and pleasure over-loved. Or if thou covet death as utmost end of misery, so thinking to evade the penalty pronounced, doubt not but God hath wisely armed his vengeful ire than so to be forestalled. Much more, I fear, lest death so snatched will not exempt us from the pain we are by doom to pay. Rather, such acts of contumacy will provoke the highest to make death in us live. Then let us seek some safer resolution which methinks I have in view, calling to mind with heed part of our sentence, that thy seed shall bruise the serpent's head. Piteous amends, unless be meant, whom I conjecture, our grand foe, Satan, who in the serpent hath contrived against us this deceit. To crush his head would be revenge indeed, which will be lost by death brought on ourselves, or childless days resolved as thou proposest. So our foe shall scape his punishment ordained, and we instead shall double ours upon our heads. No more be mentioned then of violence against ourselves and willful barrenness that cuts us off from hope and savours only rancour and pride, impatience and despite, reluctance against God and his just yoke laid on our necks. Remember with what mild and gracious temper he both heard and judged without wrath or reviling. We expected immediate dissolution, which we thought was meant by death that day, when, lo, to thee pains only in childbearing were foretold, and bringing forth, soon recompensed with joy, fruit of thy womb. On me the cursor slope glanced on the ground, with labour I must earn my bread. What harm? Idleness had been worse. My labour will sustain me. And, lest cold or heat should injure us, his timely care hath unbesought provided, and his hands clothed us unworthy, pitying while he judged. How much more, if we pray him, will his ear be open, and his heart to pity incline, and teach us further by what means to shun the inclement season, rain, ice, hail, and snow, which now the sky with various face begins to show us in this mountain, while the winds blow moist and keen, shattering the graceful locks of these fair spreading trees, which bids us seek some better shroud, some better warmth to cherish our limbs benumbed, ere this diurnal star leave cold the night. 
How we his gathered beams reflected may with matter dry ignite, or by collision of two bodies grind the air attrite to fire, as late the clouds justling or pushed with winds rude, in their shock tine the slant lightning, whose thwart flame driven down kindles the gummy bark of fir or pine, and sends a comfortable heat from far, which might supply the sun. Such fire to use, and what may else be remedy or cure to evils which our own misdeeds have wrought, he will instruct us, praying, till we end in dust, our final rest and native home. What better can we do, that to the place repairing where he judged us, prostrate fall before him reverent, and there confess humbly our faults, and pardon beg, with tears watering the ground, and with our sighs the air frequenting, sent from hearts contrite, in sign of sorrow unfeigned, and humiliation meek. Undoubtedly he will relent and turn from his displeasure, in whose look serene, when angry most he seemed and most severe, what else but favour, grace, and mercy shone? So spake our father penitent, nor Eve felt less remorse. They forthwith to the place repairing where he judged them, prostrate fell before him reverent and both confessed humbly their faults, and pardon begged, with tears watering the ground, and with their sighs the air frequenting, sent from hearts contrite, in sign of sorrow unfeigned, and humiliation meek. Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 36, in which God decrees that Adam and Eve must leave paradise. To heaven their prayers flew up, nor missed the way by envious winds blown vagabond or frustrate. In they passed dimensionless through heavenly doors. Then, clad with incense, where the golden altar fumed by their great intercessor, came in sight before the Father's throne. Them the glad sun presenting, thus to intercede began. Unskillful with what words to pray, let me interpret for him, me his advocate and propitiation. All his works on me, good or not good, engraft. My merit those shall perfect, and for these my death shall pay. Accept me, and in me from these receive the smell of peace toward mankind. Let him live before thee reconciled, at least his days numbered, though sad. Till death, his doom to better life shall yield him, where with me all my redeemed may dwell in joy and bliss, made one with me, as I with thee am one. All thy requests for man, accepted son, obtain. All thy request was my decree. But longer in that paradise to dwell, the law I gave to nature, him forbids. So let us call to synod all the blessed through heaven's wide bounds. From them I will not hide my judgments, how with mankind I proceed, as how with peccant angels late they saw, and in their state, though firm, stood more confirmed. He ended. And the sun gave signal high to the bright minister that watched. He blew his trumpet, and the joyous sons of light hasted, resorting to the summons high, and took their seats. Till from his throne supreme, the Almighty thus pronounced his sovereign will. O sons, like one of us man is become to know both good and evil, since his taste of that forbidden fruit. But let him boast his knowledge of good lost, and evil got. His sorrows now repents and prays contrite. 
Lest therefore his now bolder hand reach also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, dream at least to live forever, to remove him, I decree, and send him from the garden forth to till the ground whence he was taken, fitter soil. Michael, this my behest have thou in charge. Take to thee from among the cherubim thy choice of flaming warriors, lest the fiend, either allied to man or to invade vacant possession, some new trouble raise. Haste thee, and from the paradise of God, without remorse, drive out the sinful pair from hallowed ground the unholy, and announce to them and to their progeny from thence perpetual banishment. Yet lest they faint at the sad sentence rigorously urged, dismiss them not disconsolate. Reveal to Adam what shall come in future days. So send them forth, though sorrowing, yet in peace. And on the east side of the garden place, where entrance up from Eden easiest climbs, cherubic watch, and of a sword, the flame wide waving, all approach far off to fright, and guard all passage to the tree of life. He ceased, and the archangelic power prepared for swift descent, with him the cohort bright of watchful cherubim. Meanwhile, to re-salute the world with sacred light, Leucothea waked, and with fresh dews embalmed the earth, when Adam and first matron Eve had ended now their orisons, and found strength added from above, new hope to spring out of despair, joy, but with fear yet linked, which thus to Eve his welcome words renewed. Hard to belief may seem, yet this will prayer, or one short sigh of human breath, upborne even to the seat of God, for since I sought by prayer the offended deity to appease, kneeled and before him humbled all my heart, methought I saw him placable and mild, bending his ear. Persuasion in me grew that I was heard with favour. Peace returned home to my breast, and to my memory his promise that thy seed shall bruise our foe, which then not minded in dismay, yet now assures me that the bitterness of death is past and we shall live. Whence, hail to thee, Eve rightly called, mother of all mankind, mother of all things living, since by thee man is to live, and all things live for man. Ill-worthy I such title should belong to me, transgressor, who for thee ordained a help became thy snare. To me reproach rather belongs, distrust and all dispraise. But infinite in pardon was my judge, that I, who first brought death on all, am graced the source of life. Next favourable thou, who highly thus to entitle me, vouchsafed far other name deserving. But the field to labour calls us now with sweat imposed, though after sleepless night. Let us go forth. I never from thy side henceforth to stray, where'er our day's work lies, though now enjoined laborious till day droop. While here we dwell, what can be toilsome in these pleasant walks? Here let us live, though in fallen state, content. So spake, so wished, much humbled Eve, but fate subscribed not. Nature first gave signs, Impressed on bird, beast, air, air suddenly eclipsed after short blush of morn. Nigh in her sight, the bird of Jove stooped from his airy tower, two birds of gayest plume before him drove. Down from a hill, the beast that reigns in woods, first hunter then, pursued a gentle brace, goodliest of all the forest, heart and hind. Direct to the eastern gate was bent their flight. Adam observed, and with his eye the chase pursuing, not unmoved, to Eve thus spake. O oh, Eve, some further change awaits us nigh, which heaven by these mute signs in nature shows forerunners of his purpose, or to warn us haply too secure of our discharge from penalty, because from death released some days. How long, 
and what till then our life, who knows, or more than this, that we are dust, and thither must return and be no more. Why else this double object in our sight, of flight pursued in the air, and o'er the ground, one way the selfsame hour? Why in the east, darkness, ere day's mid-course, and morning light, more orient, in yon western cloud, that draws o'er the blue firmament a radiant white, and slow descends, with something heavenly fraught? He erred not, for by this the heavenly bands down from a sky of jasper lighted now in paradise, and on a hill made halt. A glorious apparition, Michael stood. Not unperceived of Adam, who to Eve, while the great visitant approached, thus spake. Eve, now expect great tidings, which perhaps of us will soon determine, or impose new laws to be observed. For I descry from yonder blazing cloud that veils the hill, one of the heavenly host, and by his gate none of the meanest, some great potentate or of the thrones above, such majesty invests him coming. Yet not terrible that I should fear, nor sociably mild as Raphael that I should much confide, but solemn and sublime, whom not to offend with reverence I must meet, and thou retire. He ended, and the archangel soon drew nigh, not in his shape celestial, but as man clad to meek man. Over his lucid arms a military vest of purple flowed. His starry helm unbuckled showed him prime in manhood where youth ended. By his side, as in a glistering zodiac, hung the sword, Satan's dire dread, and in his hand the spear. Adam bowed low. He, kingly from his state, inclined not, but his coming thus declared. Adam, heaven's high behest no preface needs. Sufficient that thy prayers are heard, and death, then due by sentence when thou didst transgress, defeated of his seizure many days, given thee of grace. Wherein thou mayst repent, and one bad act with many deeds well done mayst cover. Well may then thy Lord, appeased, redeem thee quite from death's rapacious claim. But longer in this paradise to dwell permits not. To remove thee I am come, and send thee from the garden forth, to till the ground whence thou wast taken, fitter soil. He added not, for Adam at the news heart-struck with chilling grip of sorrow stood, that all his senses bound. Eve, who unseen yet all had heard, with audible lament, discovered soon the place of her retire. O oh, unexpected stroke, worse than of death, must I thus leave thee, paradise, thus leave thee, native soil, these happy walks and shades fit haunt of gods, where I had hope to spend quiet, though sad, the respite of that day that must be mortal to us both. O oh, flowers, that never will in other climate grow, my early visitation and my last at even, which I bred up with tender hand from the first opening bud, and gave ye names, who now shall rear ye to the sun, or rank your tribes, and water from the ambrosial fount? Thee, lastly nuptial bower, by me adorned with what to sight or smell was sweet, from thee how shall I part, and whither wander down into a lower world, to this obscure and wild? How shall we breathe in other air less pure, Accustomed to immortal fruits. Lament not, Eve, but patiently resign what justly thou hast lost. Not set thy heart thus overfond on that which is not thine. Thy going is not lonely. With thee goes thy husband, him to follow thou art bound. Where he abides, think there thy native soil. Adam, by this from the cold, sudden, damp recovering, and his scattered spirits returned, to Michael thus his humble words addressed. Celestial, whether among the thrones, or named of them the highest, for such of shape may seem prince above princes, gently hast thou told thy message, which might else in telling wound. 
and in performing, end us. This most afflicts me, that departing hence, as from his face I shall be hid, deprived his blessed countenance. Here I could frequent with worship, place by place where he vouchsafed, presence divine, and to my sons relate. On this mount he appeared, under this tree stood visible, among these pines his voice I heard. Here with him, at this fountain, talked. Paradise Lost by John Milton Episode 37 in which Michael takes Adam to the top of a hill to show him the future of his descendants. Adam, thou knowest heaven his and all the earth, not this rock only. His omnipresence fills land, sea and air, and every kind that lives fermented by his virtual power and warmed. All the earth he gave thee to possess and rule, yet doubt not, but in valley and in plain God is as here, and will be found alike present, and of his presence many a sign still following thee, still compassing thee round with goodness and paternal love, his face express, and of his steps the tract divine, which, that thou mayest believe and be confirmed, ere thou from hence depart, no, I am sent to show thee what shall come in future days to thee and to thy offspring. Good with bad expect to hear, supernal grace contending with sinfulness of men. So shalt thou lead safest thy life, and best prepared endure thy mortal passage when it comes. Ascend this hill, let Eve, for I have drenched her eyes, here sleep below, while thou to foresight wakest, as once thou slept, while she to life was formed. Ascend, I follow thee. So both ascend in the visions of God. It was a hill of paradise the highest, from whose top the hemisphere of earth in clearest ken stretched out to amplest reach of prospect lay. Not higher that hill nor wider looking round, whereon for different cause the tempter set our second Adam in the wilderness to show him all earth's kingdoms and their glory. His eye might there command wherever stood city of old or modern fame, the seat of mightiest empire, from the destined walls of Cambalu, seat of Cathayan Khan, and Samarkand by Oxus, Temir's throne, to Paquin of Sinean kings, and thence to Agra and Lahore of great Mogul, down to the golden Kersonese, or where the Persian in Akbatan sat, or since in Hispahan, or where the Russian Tsar in Moscow, or the Sultan in Byzantz, Turkestan born. Nor could his eye not ken the empire of Negus to his utmost port, Erkoko and the less maritime kings, Mombaza and Quiloa and Melind, and Sofala, thought Ophir, to the realm of Congo and Angola farthest south, or thence from Niger flood to Atlas Mount, the kingdoms of Almansor, Fez and Sous, Morocco and Algiers and Tremisen. On Europe, thence, and where Rome was to sway the world, in spirit, perhaps, he also saw rich Mexico, the seat of Montezum, and Cusco in Peru, the richer seat of Atabalipa, and yet unspoiled Guiana, whose great city Gerion's sons call El Dorado. But to nobler sights, Michael from Adam's eyes the film removed, which that false fruit that promised clearer sight had bred. Then purged with Euphrasy and rue the visual nerve, for he had much to see. And from the well of life, three drops instilled. So deep the power of these ingredients pierced, even to the inmost seat of mental sight, that Adam, now enforced to close his eyes, sunk down, and all his spirits became entranced. But him the gentle angel by the hand soon raised, and his attention thus recalled. Adam... Now ope thine eyes, 
and first behold the effects which thy original crime hath wrought in some to spring from thee, who never touched the accepted tree, nor with the snake conspired, nor sinned thy sin. Yet from that sin derive corruption to bring forth more violent deeds. His eyes he opened, and beheld a field, part arable and tilth, whereon were sheaves new reaped, and other part sheep walks and folds. In the midst an altar, as the landmark stood, rustic of grassy sward. Thither anon a sweaty reaper from his tillage brought first fruits, the green ear and the yellow sheaf, unculled, as came to hand. A shepherd next, more meek, came with the firstlings of his flock, choicest and best. Then, sacrificing, laid the inwards and their fat with incense strewed on the cleft wood, and all due rites performed. His offering, soon propitious fire from heaven, consumed with nimble glance and grateful steam. The others not, for his was not sincere. Whereat he inly raged, and as they talked, smote him into the midriff with a stone that beat out life. He fell, and deadly pale groaned out his soul with gushing blood effused. Much at that sight was Adam in his heart dismayed, and thus in haste to the angel cried, O oh, teacher, some great mischief hath befallen to that meek man who well had sacrificed. Is piety thus and pure devotion paid? These two are brethren, Adam, and to come out of thy loins. The unjust, the just hath slain, for envy that his brother's offering found from heaven acceptance. But the bloody act will be avenged, and the other's faith approved lose no reward, though here thou see him die, rolling in dust and gore. Alas, both for the deed and for the cause, but have I now seen death? Is this the way I must return to native dust? O oh, sight of terror, foul and ugly to behold, horrid to think, how horrible to feel. Death thou hast seen in his first shape on man, but many shapes of death and many are the ways that lead to his grim cave, all dismal, yet to sense more terrible at the entrance than within. Some, as thou sawest, by violent stroke shall die, by fire, flood, famine, by intemperance more in meats and drinks, which on the earth shall bring diseases dire, of which a monstrous crew before thee shall appear, that thou mayst know what misery the inabstinence of Eve shall bring on men. Immediately a place before his eyes appeared, sad, noisome, dark, a Lazar house, it seemed, wherein were laid numbers of all diseased, all maladies of ghastly spasm or racking torture, qualms of heart-sick agony, all feverous kinds, convulsions, epilepsies, fierce catars, intestine stone and ulcer, colic pangs, demoniac frenzy, moping melancholy and moonstruck madness pining atrophy, consumption and wide-wasting pestilence, dropsies and asthmas and joint-racking rooms. Dire was the tossing, deep the groans. Despair tended the sick busiest from couch to couch, and over them triumphant death his dart shook, but delayed to strike, though oft invoked with vows as their chief good and final hope. Sight so deform, what heart of rock could long dry-eyed behold? Adam could not, but wept, though not of woman born. Compassion quelled his best of man, and gave him up to tears a space, till firmer thoughts restrained excess, and scarce recovering words, his plaint renewed. O oh, miserable mankind! To what fall degraded! To what wretched state reserved? Better end here unborn. Why is life given to be thus wrested from us? Why should not man, retaining still divine similitude in part, from such deformities be free, and for his Maker's image sake exempt? Their Maker's image forsook them when themselves they vilified to serve ungoverned appetite 
and took his image whom they served, a brutish vice, inductive mainly to the sin of Eve. Therefore so abject is their punishment, disfiguring not God's likeness, but their own. I yield it justice, and I do submit. But is there yet no other way, besides these painful passages, how we may come to death and mix with our co-natural dust? There is, and will be, if thou well observe the rule of not too much, by temperance taught, in what thou eatst and drinkst, seeking from thence due nourishment, not gluttonous delight, till many years over thy head return. So mayst thou live, till like ripe fruit thou drop into thy mother's lap, or be with ease gathered, not harshly plucked, for death mature. This is old age. But then thou must outlive thy youth, thy strength, thy beauty, which will change to withered, weak, and grey. Thy senses then obtuse, all taste of pleasure must forego to what thou hast. And for the air of youth, hopeful and cheerful, in thy blood will reign a melancholy damp of cold and dry to weigh thy spirits down, and last consume the balm of life. Henceforth I fly not death, nor would prolong life much, bent rather how I may be quit, fairest and easiest of this cumbrous charge, which I must keep till my appointed day of rendering up, and patiently attend my dissolution. Nor love thy life nor hate, but what thou livest, live well. How long or short permit to heaven? And now prepare thee for another sight. He looked and saw a spacious plain, whereon were tents of various hue. By some were herds of cattle grazing, others whence the sound of instruments that made melodious chime was heard of harp and organ, and who moved their stops and cords was seen. His volant touch, instinct through all proportions, low and high, fled and pursued transverse the resonant fugue. In other part stood one who at the forge labouring two massy clods of iron and brass had melted. The liquid ore he drained into fit moulds prepared, from which he formed first his own tools, then what might else be wrought, fusil or graven in metal. After these, but on the hither side, a different sort from the high neighbouring hills which was their seat, down to the plain descended. By their guise, just men they seemed, and all their study bent to worship God aright, and know his works not hid, nor those things lost which might preserve freedom and peace to men. They on the plain long had not walked, when from the tents, Behold, a bevy of fair women, richly gay in gems and wanton dress. To the harp they sung soft amorous ditties, and in dance came on. The men, though grave, eyed them, and let their eyes rove without rain, till in the amorous net fast caught they liked, and each his liking chose. And now of love they treat till the evening star love's harbinger appeared. Then, all in heat, they light the nuptial torch and bid invoke hymen, then first of marriage rites invoked. With feast and music all the tents resound. Such happy interview and fair event of love and youth not lost, songs, garlands, flowers and charming symphonies attached the heart of Adam. Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 38, in which Michael describes to Adam the events which will lead to the flood and to God's covenant with Noah. Judge not what is best by pleasure, though to nature seeming meet, created as thou art to nobler end, holy and pure, conformity divine. Those tents thou sawest so pleasant were the tents of wickedness, wherein shall dwell his race who slew his brother. Studious they appear of arts that polish life, inventors rare, unmindful of their maker, though his spirit taught them, but they, his gifts, acknowledge none. Yet they, a beauteous offspring shall beget, 
For that fair female troop thou sawest that seemed of goddesses, so blithe, so smooth, so gay, yet empty of all good, wherein consists woman's domestic honour and chief praise, bred only and completed to the taste of lustful appetence, to sing, to dance, to dress, and troll the tongue and roll the eye. O oh, pity and shame, that they who to live well entered so fair should turn aside to tread paths indirect or in the midway faint. But still I see the tenor of man's woe holds on the same, from woman to begin. From man's effeminate slackness it begins. But now prepare thee for another scene. He looked and saw wide territory spread before him, towns and rural works between, cities of men and lofty gates and towers, Concourse in arms, fierce faces threatening war, giants of mighty bone and bold emprise. Part wield their arms, part curb the foaming steed. With cruel tournament the squadrons join, where cattle pastured late, now scattered lies with carcasses and arms the ensanguined field deserted. Others to a city strong lay siege encamped, by battery, scale and mine assaulting. Others from the wall defend with dart and javelin, stones and sulphurous fire. On each hand, slaughter and gigantic deeds. So violence, oppression and sword law ran through the plain, and refuge none was found. Adam was all in tears, and to his guide lamenting turned full sad. Oh, what are these? Death's ministers, not men who thus deal death inhumanly to men, and multiply ten thousandfold the sin of him who slew his brother. For of whom such massacre make they but of their brethren, men of men? These are the product of those ill-mated marriages thou sawest, where good with bad were matched. Such were these giants, men of high renown. For in those days, might only shall be admired, and valour and heroic virtue called, to overcome in battle and subdue nations, and bring home spoils with infinite manslaughter, shall be held the highest pitch of human glory, and for glory done of triumph, to be styled great conquerors, patrons of mankind, gods and sons of gods, destroyers rightly are called, and plagues of men. Thus, fame shall be achieved, renown on earth, and what most merits fame, in silence hid. He looked and saw the face of things quite changed. The brazen throat of war had ceased to roar. All now was turned to jollity and game, to luxury and riot, feast and dance, marrying or prostituting, as befell, rape or adultery, where passing fair allured them. Thence from cups to civil broils. At length a reverend sire among them came, and of their doings great dislike declared, and testified against their ways. He oft frequented their assemblies, where so met, triumphs or festivals, and to them preached conversion and repentance, as to souls in prison under judgments imminent, but all in vain. Which, when he saw, he ceased contending, and removed his tents far off. Then, from the mountain hewing timber tall, began to build a vessel of huge bulk, measured by cubit, length and breadth and height, smeared round with pitch, and in the side a door contrived, and of provisions laid in large for man and beast. When, lo, a wonder strange! Of every beast and bird and insect small came sevens and pairs, and entered in, as taught their order. Last the sire and his three sons with their four wives, and God made fast the door. Meanwhile the south wind rose, and with black wings wide hovering, all the clouds together drove from under heaven. The hills to their supply, vapour and exhalation, dusk and moist, sent up a main. And now the thickened sky like a dark ceiling stood. Down rushed the rain, impetuous, and continued till the earth no more was seen. The floating vessel swum uplifted, and secure with beaked prow, rode tilting o'er the waves. 
all dwellings else flood overwhelmed, and them with all their pomp deep under water rolled. Sea covered sea, sea without shore. And in their palaces, where luxury late reigned, sea monsters whelped and stabled. Of mankind, so numerous late, all left, in one small bottom swum embarked. How didst thou grieve then, Adam, to behold the end of all thy offspring, end so sad, depopulation, thee another flood, of tears and sorrow a flood thee also drowned, and sunk thee as thy sons, till gently reared by the angel, on thy feet thou stoodst at last, though comfortless, as when a father mourns his children, all in view destroyed at once, and scarce to the angel utteredst thus thy plaint. O oh, visions ill foreseen! Better had I lived ignorant of future, so had borne my part of evil only, each day's lot enough to bear. Those now, that were dispensed the burden of many ages, on me alight at once, by my knowledge gaining birth abortive, to torment me ere their being, with thought that they must be. Let no man seek henceforth to be foretold what shall befall him or his children. I had hope when violence was ceased and war on earth. All would have then gone well. Peace would have crowned with length of happy days the race of man. But I was far deceived, for now I see peace to corrupt no less than war to waste. How comes it thus? Unfold, celestial guide, and whether here the race of man will end. Those whom last thou sawest in triumph and luxurious wealth are they first seen in acts of prowess eminent and great exploits, but of true virtue void. Who, having spilt much blood and done much waste subduing nations and achieved thereby fame in a world, high titles and rich prey, shall change their course to pleasure, ease and sloth, surfeit and lust, till wantonness and pride raise out of friendship hostile deeds in peace. So all shall turn degenerate, all depraved, justice and temperance, truth and faith forgot. One man except, the only son of light, shall build a wondrous ark, as thou beheldst, to save himself and household from amidst a world devote to universal rack. No sooner he, with them of man and beast, select for life, shall in the ark be lodged and sheltered round, but all the cataracts of heaven set open on the earth shall pour rain day and night. All fountains of the deep broke up shall heave the ocean to usurp beyond all bounds, till inundation rise above the highest hills. Then shall this mount of paradise, by might of waves, be moved out of his place, pushed by the horned flood, with all his verdure spoiled and trees adrift, down the great river to the opening gulf, and there take root an island, salt and bare, the haunt of seals and orcs and sea mews clang, to teach thee that God attributes to place no sanctity if none be thither brought by men who there frequent or therein dwell. And now what further shall ensue? Behold. He looked and saw the ark hull on the flood, which now abated, for the clouds were fled, driven by a keen north wind that blowing dry wrinkled the face of deluge as decayed. And the clear sun on his wide watery glass gazed hot, and of the fresh wave largely drew as after thirst, which made their flowing shrink from standing lake to tripping ebb, that stole with soft foot toward the deep, who now had stopped his sluices as the heaven his windows shut. The ark no more now floats, but seems on ground, fast on the top of some high mountain fixed, and now the tops of hills as rocks appear. With clamour thence the rapid currents drive towards the retreating sea their furious tide. Forthwith, from out the ark, a raven flies, and after him, the surer messenger, a dove, 
sent forth once and again to spy green tree or ground whereon his foot may light. The second time returning, in his bill an olive leaf he brings, pacific sign. Anon dry ground appears, and from his ark the ancient sire descends with all his train. Then with uplifted hands and eyes devout, grateful to heaven, over his head beholds a dewy cloud, and in the cloud a bow, conspicuous with three listed colours gay, betokening peace from God and covenant new. Whereat the heart of Adam, erst so sad, greatly rejoiced, and thus his joy broke forth. O thou who future things canst represent as present, heavenly instructor, I revive at this last sight, assured that man shall live with all the creatures and their seed preserve. Far less I now lament for one whole world of wicked sons destroyed than I rejoice for one man found so perfect and so just that God vouchsafes to raise another world from him and all his anger to forget. But say, what mean those coloured streaks in heaven? Distended as the brow of God appeased? Or serve they as flowery verge to bind the fluid skirts of that same watery cloud, lest it again dissolve and shower the earth? To whom the archangel? Dexterously thou aimst. So willingly doth God remit his ire, and makes a covenant never to destroy the earth again by flood, nor let the sea surpass his bounds, nor rain to drown the world with man therein or beast. But when he brings over the earth a cloud, will therein set his triple-coloured bow, whereon to look and call to mind his covenant. Day and night, seed time and harvest, heat and hoary frost shall hold their course, till fire purge all things new, both heaven and earth, wherein the just shall dwell. Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 39, in which Michael relates to Adam the works of Abraham and how Moses will lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. As one who in his journey stops at noon, though bent on speed, so here the archangel paused betwixt the world destroyed and world restored, if Adam ought perhaps might interpose. Then, with transition sweet, new speech resumes. Thus thou hast seen one world begin and end, and man as from a second stock proceed. Much thou hast yet to see, but I perceive thy mortal sight to fail. Objects divine must needs impair and weary human sense. Henceforth, what is to come I will relate. Thou therefore give due audience and attend. This second source of men, while yet but few, and while the dread of the great flood remains fresh in their minds, fearing the deity with some regard to what is just and right, shall lead their lives, and multiply apace, labouring the soil and reaping plenteous crop, corn, wine, and oil, and from the herd or flock off sacrificing bullock, lamb, or kid, with large wine offerings poured and sacred feast, shall spend their days in joy unblamed, and dwell long time in peace by families and tribes under paternal rule. Till one shall rise of proud, ambitious heart, who, not content with fair equality, fraternal state, will arrogate dominion undeserved over his brethren, and quite dispossess concord and law of nature from the earth. Hunting and men, not beasts, shall be his game with war and hostile snare, such as refuse subjection to his empire tyrannous. A mighty hunter thence he shall be styled before the Lord, as in despite of heaven, or from heaven claiming second sovereignty. And from rebellion shall derive his name, though of rebellion others he accuse. He, with a crew, whom like ambition joins with him, or under him, to tyrannize, marching from Eden towards the west, shall find the plain, wherein a black bituminous gurge boils out from underground, the mouth of hell. 
of brick, and of that stuff they cast to build a city and tower, whose top may reach to heaven and get themselves a name, lest, far dispersed in foreign lands, their memory be lost, regardless whether good or evil fame. But God, who oft descends to visit men unseen, and through their habitations walks to mark their doings, them beholding soon, comes down to see their city, ere the tower obstruct heaven towers. And in derision sets upon their tongues a various spirit to raise quite out their native language, and instead to sow a jangling noise of words unknown. Forthwith a hideous gabble rises loud among the builders, each to the other calls not understood, till hoarse and all in rage as mocked them storm. <laughs> Great laughter was in heaven and looking down to see the hubbub strange and hear the din. Thus was the building left ridiculous, and the work confusion named. Whereto thus Adam fatherly displeased. O oh, execrable son, so to aspire above his brethren, to himself assuming authority usurped from God not given, he gave us only over beast, fish, fowl, dominion absolute. The right we hold by his donation. But man over men he made not lord. Such title to himself reserving. Human left from human free. But this usurper, his encroachment proud, stays not on man. To God his tower intends siege and defiance. Wretched man! What food will he convey up thither to sustain himself and his rash army, where thin air above the clouds will pine his entrails gross, and famish him of breath, if not of bread? Justly thou abhorst that son, who on the quiet state of men such trouble brought, affecting to subdue rational liberty. Yet know withal, since thy original lapse, true liberty is lost which always with right reason dwells twinned, and from her hath no individual being. Reason in man obscured or not obeyed. Immediately inordinate desires and upstart passions catch the government from reason, and to servitude reduce man till then free. Therefore, since he permits within himself unworthy powers to reign over free reason, God, in judgment just, subjects him from without to violent lords, who oft as undeservedly enthrall his outward freedom. Tyranny must be, though to the tyrant thereby no excuse. Yet sometimes nations will decline so low from virtue, which is reason, that no wrong but justice and some fatal curse annexed deprives them of their outward liberty, their inward lost. Witness the irreverent son of him who built the ark, who for the shame done to his father heard this heavy curse, servant of servants, on his vicious race. Thus will this latter as the former world still tend from bad to worse, till God, at last wearied from their iniquities, withdraw his presence from among them, and avert his holy eyes, resolving from thenceforth to leave them to their own polluted ways, and one peculiar nation to select from all the rest of whom to be invoked, a nation from one faithful man to spring, him on this side Euphrates yet residing, bred up in idol worship. Oh, that men, canst thou believe, should be so stupid grown, while yet the patriarch lived who scaped the flood, as to forsake the living God, and fall to worship their own work in wood and stone for gods. Yet him, God the Most High, vouchsafes to call by vision from his father's house, his kindred and false gods, into a land which he will show him, and from him will raise a mighty nation, and upon him shower his benediction so, that in his seed all nations shall be blessed. He straight obeys, not knowing to what land, yet firm believes. I see him, but thou canst not. With what faith he leaves his gods, his friends and native soil, Ur of Chaldea, passing now the ford to Heron, after him a cumbrous train of herds and flocks, and numerous servitude, not wandering poor, but rusting all his wealth with God, who called him in a land unknown. Canaan he now attains, 
I see his tents pitched about Sechem and the neighboring plain of Morah. There, by promise, he receives gift to his progeny of all that land, from Hamath northward to the desert south. Things by their names I call, though yet unnamed, from Hermon east to the great western sea, Mount Hermon, yonder sea. Each place behold in prospect as I point them. On the shore, Mount Carmel. Here, the double fountained stream, Jordan, true limit eastward. But his son shall dwell to Senar, that long ridge of hills. This ponder that all nations of the earth shall in his seed be blessed. By that seed is meant thy great deliverer who shall bruise the serpent's head, whereof to thee anon plainlier shall be revealed. This patriarch blessed, whom faithful Abraham due time shall call, a son, and of his son a grandchild leaves, like him in faith, in wisdom, and renown. The grandchild, with twelve sons increased, departs from Canaan to a land hereafter called Egypt, divided by the river Nile. See where it flows, disgorging its seven mouths into the sea. To sojourn in that land, he comes invited by a younger son in time of dearth, son whose worthy deeds raise him to be the second in that realm of Pharaoh. There he dies, and leaves his race growing into a nation, and now grown suspected to a sequent king who seeks to stop their overgrowth as inmate guests too numerous. Whence, of guests, he makes them slaves inhospitably and kills their infant males. Till, by two brethren, those two brethren call Moses and Aaron, sent from God to claim his people from enthrallment, they return with glory and spoil back to their promised land. But first, the lawless tyrant, who denies to know their God or message to regard, must be compelled by signs and judgments dire. To blood unshed the rivers must be turned, frogs, lice, and flies must all his palace fill with loathed intrusion and fill all the land. His cattle must of rot and murrain die, botches and blains must all his flesh emboss and all his people. Thunder mixed with hail, hail mixed with fire must rend the Egyptian sky and wheel on the earth, devouring where it rolls. What it devours not, herb or fruit or grain, a darksome cloud of locusts swarming down must eat and on the ground leave nothing green. Darkness must overshadow all his bounds, palpable darkness, and blot out three days. Last, with one midnight stroke, all the firstborn of Egypt must lie dead. Thus, with ten wounds, the river dragon, tamed at length, submits to let his sojourners depart and oft humbles his stubborn heart. But still, as ice more hardened after thaw, till in his rage, pursuing whom he late dismissed, the sea swallows him with his host, but lets them pass as on dry land between two crystal walls, awed by the rod of Moses so to stand divided, till his rescued gain their shore. Such wondrous power God to his saint will lend, though present in his angel, who shall go before them in a cloud and pillar of fire, by day a cloud, by night a pillar of fire, to guide them in their journey and remove behind them while the obdurate king pursues. All night he will pursue, but his approach darkness defends between till morning watch. Then, through the fiery pillar and the cloud, God, looking forth, will trouble all his host and craze their chariot wheels. When, by command, Moses once more his potent rod extends over the sea, the sea his rod obeys. On their embattled ranks the waves return and overwhelm their war. Paradise Lost by John Milton, episode 40, in which Michael tells Adam of the future reign of King David and of the nativity of Jesus Christ. The race elect, safe towards Canaan from the shore advance through the wild desert, not the readiest way, lest entering on the Canaanite alarmed, 
War terrify them inexpert, and fear return them back to Egypt. Choosing rather inglorious life with servitude. For life to noble and ignoble is more sweet untrained in arms, where rashness leads not on. This also shall they gain by their delay in the wide wilderness. There they shall found their government, and their great senate choose through the twelve tribes to rule by laws ordained. God from the Mount of Sinai, whose great top shall tremble, he descending, will himself in thunder, lightning, and loud trumpet sound ordain them laws. Part such as appertain to civil justice, part religious rites of sacrifice, informing them by types and shadows of that destined seed to bruise the serpent, by what means he shall achieve mankind's deliverance. But the voice of God to mortal ear is dreadful. They beseech that Moses might report to them his will, and terror cease. He grants what they besought, instructed that to God is no access without mediator, whose high office now Moses in figure bears, to introduce one greater, of whose day he shall foretell, and all the prophets in their age the times of great Messiah shall sing. Thus laws and rites established, such delight hath God in men obedient to his will, that he vouchsafes among them to set up his tabernacle the Holy One with mortal men to dwell. By his prescript, a sanctuary is framed of cedar, overlaid with gold, therein an ark, and in the ark his testimony, the records of his covenant, over these a mercy seat of gold, between the wings of two bright cherubim. Before him burn seven lamps, as in a zodiac, representing the heavenly fires. Over the tent, a cloud shall rest by day, a fiery gleam by nights, save when they journey. And at length they come, conducted by his angel, to the land promised to Abraham and his seed. The rest were long to tell, how many battles fought, how many kings destroyed and kingdoms won, or how the sun shall in mid-heaven stand still a day entire, and night's due course adjourn, man's voice commanding, Sun in Gibeon stand, and thou moon in the vale of Aelon, till Israel overcome. So call the third from Abraham, son of Isaac, and from him his whole descent, who thus shall Canaan win. Here Adam interposed, O sent from heaven, Enlightener of my darkness, gracious things thou hast revealed, those chiefly which concern just Abraham and his seed. Now first I find mine eyes true opening, and my heart much eased, erewhile perplexed with thoughts what would become of me and all mankind. But now I see his day, in whom all nations shall be blessed, favour unmerited by me, who sought forbidden knowledge by forbidden means. This yet I apprehend not. Why to those among whom God will deign to dwell on earth so many and so various laws are given? So many laws argue so many sins among them. How can God with such reside? Doubt not, but that sin will reign among them, as of thee begot. And therefore was law given them to evince their natural pravity by stirring up sin against law to fight that when they see law can discover sin but not remove, save by those shadowy expiations weak, the blood of bulls and goats, they may conclude some blood more precious must be paid for man, just for unjust, that in such righteousness to them by faith imputed, they may find justification towards God and peace of conscience, which the law by ceremonies cannot appease, nor man the moral part perform, and not performing, cannot live. So, law appears imperfect, and but given with purpose to resign them in full time up to a better covenant, disciplined from shadowy types to truth, from flesh to spirit, from imposition of strict laws to free acceptance of large grace, from servile fear to filial, works of law to works of faith. And therefore shall not Moses, though of God highly beloved, being but the minister of law, his people into Canaan lead. But Joshua, whom the Gentiles Jesus call, 
his name and office bearing, who shall quell the adversary serpent and bring back through the world's wilderness long-wandered man safe to eternal paradise of rest. Meanwhile, they in their earthly Canaan placed long time shall dwell and prosper. But when sins national interrupt their public peace, provoking God to raise them enemies, from whom, as oft, he saves them penitent by judges first, then under kings, of whom the second, both for piety renowned and puissant deeds, a promise shall receive, irrevocable, that his regal throne for ever shall endure. The like shall sing all prophecy, that of the royal stock of David, so I name this king, shall rise a son, the woman's seed to thee foretold, foretold to Abraham, as in whom shall trust all nations, and to kings foretold, of kings the last, for of his reign shall be no end. But first, a long succession must ensue, and his next son, for wealth and wisdom famed, the clouded ark of God, till then intense wandering, shall in a glorious temple enshrine. Such follow him as shall be registered part good, part bad, of bad the longer scroll, whose foul idolatries and other faults heaped to the people's sins will so incense God as to leave them and expose their land, their city, his temple and his holy ark with all his sacred things, a scorn and prey to that proud city, whose high walls thou sawest left in confusion, Babylon thence called. There, in captivity, he lets them swell the space of seventy years, then brings them back, remembering mercy and his covenant sworn to David, established as the days of heaven. Returned from Babylon by leave of kings, their lords whom God disposed, the house of God they first re-edify, and for a while in mean estate live moderate, till grown in wealth and multitude, factious they grow. But first... Among the priests, dissension springs, men who attend the altar and should most endeavor peace. Their strife pollution brings upon the temple itself. At last they seize the scepter and regard not David's sons, then lose it to a stranger that the true anointed King Messiah might be born barred of his right. Yet at his birth, a star, unseen before in heaven, proclaims him come and guides the eastern sages who inquire his place to offer incense, myrrh, and gold. His place of birth a solemn angel tells to simple shepherds, keeping watch by night. They gladly thither haste, and by a choir of squadroned angels hear his carol sung. A virgin is his mother, but his sire the power of the Most High. He shall ascend the throne hereditary, and bound his reign with earth's wide bounds, his glory with the heavens. He ceased, discerning Adam with such joy surcharged as had, like grief, been dewed in tears without the vent of words, which these he breathed. O prophet of glad tidings, finisher of utmost hope, now clear I understand what oft my steadiest thoughts have searched in vain, why our great expectation should be called the seed of woman. Virgin mother, hail, high in the love of heaven, yet from my loins thou shalt proceed, and from thy womb the Son of God most high. So God with man unites. Needs must the serpent now his capital bruise expect with mortal pain. Say where and when their fight, what stroke shall bruise the victor's heel? To whom thus Michael? Dream not of their fight as of a duel, or the local wounds of head or heel. Not therefore joins the sun manhood to Godhead with more strength to foil thy enemy. Nor so is overcome Satan, whose fall from heaven a deadlier bruise, disabled not to give thee thy death's wound, which he, who comes thy saviour, shall recure not by destroying Satan, but his works in thee and in thy seed. Nor can this be but by fulfilling that which thou didst want, obedience to the law of God, imposed on penalty of death, and suffering death, the penalty to thy transgression due, and due to theirs which out of thine will grow. 
so only can high justice rest apaid. The law of God exact he shall fulfill, both of obedience and by love, though love alone fulfill the law. Thy punishment he shall endure by coming in the flesh to a reproachful life and cursed death, proclaiming life to all who shall believe in his redemption, and that his obedience imputed becomes theirs by faith, his merits to save them not their own, though legal works. For this he shall live hated, be blasphemed, seized on by force, judged, and to death condemned a shameful and accursed, nailed to the cross by his own nation, slain for bringing life. But to the cross he nails his enemies, the law that is against thee, and the sins of all mankind, with him there crucified, never to hurt them more who rightly trust in this his satisfaction. So he dies, but soon revives. Death over him no power shall long usurp. Ere the third dawning light return, the stars of morn shall see him rise out of his grave, fresh as the dawning light, thy ransom paid, which man from death redeems, his death for man, as many as offered life neglect not, and benefit embraced by faith, not void of works. This godlike act annuls thy doom. The death thou shouldst have died in sin, forever lost from life. This act shall bruise the head of Satan, crush his strength, defeating sin and death, his two main arms, and fix far deeper in his head their stings than temporal death shall bruise the victor's heel or theirs whom he redeems. A death like sleep, a gentle wafting to immortal life. Paradise Lost by John Milton, the concluding episode in which Michael comforts Adam and leads him together with Eve out of paradise. After Christ's resurrection, he'll not stay longer on earth than certain times to appear to his disciples, men who in his life still followed him. To them shall leave in charge to teach all nations what of him they learned and his salvation. Them who shall believe, baptizing in the profluent stream, the sign of washing them from guilt of sin to life pure, and in mind prepared, if so befall, for death, like that which the Redeemer died. All nations shall they teach, for from that day not only to the sons of Abraham's loins salvation shall be preached, but to the sons of Abraham's faith wherever through the world. So, in his seed all nations shall be blessed. Then to the heaven of heavens he shall ascend with victory, triumphing through the air over his foes and thine. There shall surprise the serpent, prince of air, and drag in chains through all his realm, and there confounded leave. Then enter into glory, and resume his seat at God's right hand, exalted high above all names in heaven. And then shall come, when this world's dissolution shall be ripe, with glory and power, to judge both quick and dead, to judge the unfaithful dead, but to reward his faithful, and receive them into bliss, whether in heaven or earth. For then the earth shall all be paradise, far happier place than this of Eden, and far happier days. So spake the archangel Michael, then paused as at the world's great period, and our sire, replete with joy and wonder, thus replied, O oh, goodness infinite, goodness immense, that all this good of evil shall produce, and evil turn to good, more wonderful than that which by creation first brought forth light out of darkness. Full of doubt I stand, whether I should repent me now of sin by me done and occasioned, or rejoice much more, that much more good thereof shall spring. To God more glory, more good will to men from God, and over wrath grace shall abound. But say, if our deliverer up to heaven must reascend, what will betide the few, his faithful, left among the unfaithful herd, 
the enemies of truth. Who then shall guide his people? Who defend? Will they not deal worse with his followers than with him they dealt? Be sure, they will deal badly. But from heaven, he to his own a comforter will send, the promise of the Father, who shall dwell his spirit within them. And the law of faith, working through love, upon their heart shall write to guide them in all truth, and also arm with spiritual armor, able to resist Satan's assaults and quench his fiery darts. What man can do against them, not afraid, though to the death, against such cruelties with inward consolations recompensed and oft supported, so as shall amaze their proudest persecutors. For the Spirit poured first on his apostles, whom he sends to evangelize the nations, then on all baptized, shall them with wondrous gifts endue to speak all tongues and do all miracles, as did their Lord before them. Thus, they win great numbers of each nation to receive with joy the tidings brought from heaven. At length, their ministry performed and race well run, their doctrine and their story written left, they die. But in their room, as they forewarn, wolves shall succeed for teachers, grievous wolves, who all the sacred mysteries of heaven to their own vile advantages shall turn off lucre and ambition, and the truth with superstitions and traditions taint, left only in those written records pure, though not but by the Spirit understood. Then shall they seek to avail themselves of names, places, and titles, and with these to join secular power, though feigning still to act by spiritual, to themselves appropriating the Spirit of God, promised alike and given to all believers. And from that pretense, spiritual laws by carnal power shall force on every conscience, laws which none shall find left them enrolled, or what the Spirit within shall on the heart engrave. What will they then but force the spirit of grace itself and bind his consort liberty? What, but unbuild his living temples, built by faith to stand, their own faith, not another's? For on earth, who gainst faith and conscience can be heard infallible? Yet many will presume. Whence, heavy persecution shall arise on all who in the worship persevere of spirit and truth. The rest far greater part, well deem in outward rites and specious forms religion satisfied. Truth shall retire bestuck with slanderous darts, and works of faith rarely be found. So shall the world go on, to good malignant, to bad men benign, under her own weight groaning, till the day appear of respiration to the just and vengeance to the wicked, at return of him so lately promised to thy aid, the woman's seed, obscurely then foretold, now amplier known, the Saviour and thy Lord, last in the clouds from heaven to be revealed in glory of the Father, to dissolve Satan with his perverted world, then raised from the conflagrant mass, purged and refined, new heavens, new earth, ages of endless date, founded in righteousness and peace and love, to bring forth fruits, joy, and eternal bliss. He ended, and thus Adam last replied, How soon hath thy prediction, seer blessed, measured this transient world, the race of time, till time stand fixed. Beyond is all abyss, Eternity, whose end no eye can reach. Greatly instructed, I shall hence depart, greatly in peace of thought, and have my fill of knowledge what this vessel can contain, beyond which was my folly to aspire. Henceforth I learn that to obey is best, and love with fear the only God, to walk as in his presence, ever to observe his providence, and on him soul depend, merciful over all his works, with good still overcoming evil, and by small accomplishing great things, by things deemed weak subverting worldly strong, and worldly wise by simply meek, 
that suffering for truth's sake is fortitude to highest victory and to the faithful, death, the gate of life. Taught this by his example whom I now acknowledge, my Redeemer, ever blessed. To whom thus also the angel last replied, This having learned, thou hast attained the sum of wisdom. Hope no higher, though all the stars thou knewest by name, and all the ethereal powers, all secrets of the deep, all nature's works, or works of God in heaven, air, earth, or sea, and all the riches of this world enjoyst, and all the rule, one empire. Only add deeds to thy knowledge answerable. Add faith, add virtue, patience, temperance. Add love, by name to come called charity, the soul of all the rest. Then wilt thou not be loath to leave this paradise, but shall possess a paradise within thee, happier far. Let us descend now, therefore, from this top of speculation. For the hour precise exacts our parting hence, and see, the guards by me encamped on yonder hill expect their motion, at whose front a flaming sword in signal of remove waves fiercely round. We may no longer stay. Go, waken Eve. Her also I with gentle dreams have calmed portending good, and all her spirits composed to meek submission. Thou at season fit, let her with thee partake what thou hast heard, chiefly what may concern her faith to know, the great deliverance by her seed to come, for by the woman's seed on all mankind, that ye may live, which will be many days, both in one faith unanimous, though sad with cause for evils past, yet much more cheered with meditation on the happy end. He ended and they both descend the hill. Descended, Adam to the bower where Eve lay sleeping ran before, but found her waked, and thus, with words not sad, she him received. Whence thou returnst, and whither whence I know, for God is also in sleep, and dreams advise, which he hath sent propitious, some great good presaging. Since with sorrow and heart's distress, wearied I fell asleep. But now lead on. In me is no delay. With thee to go is to stay here. Without thee here to stay is to go hence unwilling. Thou to me art all things under heaven. All places thou, who for my willful crime art banished hence. This further consolation yet secure I carry hence. Though all by me is lost, such favour I unworthy am vouchsafed. By me the promised seed shall all restore. So spake our mother Eve, and Adam heard well pleased, but answered not. For now too nigh the archangel stood, and from the other hill to their fixed station, all in bright array, the cherubim descended. On the ground gliding meteorous, as evening mist risen from a river o'er the marish glides, and gathers ground fast at the labourer's heel homeward returning. High in front advanced, the brandished sword of God before them blazed fierce as a comet, which with torrid heat and vapour as a Libyan air a dust began to parch that temperate clime, whereat in either hand the hastening angel caught our lingering parents, and to the eastern gate led them direct, and down the cliff as fast to the subjected plain, then disappeared. They, looking back, all the eastern side beheld of paradise, so late their happy seat, waved over by that flaming brand. The gate with dreadful faces thronged and fiery arms. Some natural tears they dropped, but wiped them soon. The world was all before them, where to choose their place of rest, and providence their guide. They, hand in hand, with wandering steps and slow, through Eden, took their solitary way. 
In the concluding episode of Paradise Lost, Dennis Quilly was the narrator, Mark Straker, the Archangel Michael, Linus Roach, Adam, and Federe Holmes, Eve. John Milton's epic poem was abridged by Adrian Mitchell with music by Elizabeth Parker of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The production assistant was Katrina Wade. Paradise Lost was directed by John Theocaris.